ladies and gentlemen uh, uh, thank you so much for your presence and your patience uh, we have been uh, we are starting at uh, maybe 15 minutes late uh, to 20 minutes late but uh, it's always a pleasure to have uh, you know a, a, a strong dignitary of uh, a, a body of dignitaries from aerospace and defense all come together on a single panel uh, uh, let me introduce you to ourselves uh, we are actually a, a, a media company our company is trinity media and marketing solutions and we've been promoting uh, 3d printing technology and ai Uh, in india for the last 7 years uh, and it was a great journey it was a wonderful journey it's been an opportunity to understand and know uh, how these technologies can really help industries and sectors across domain uh, 3d graphy was something that we initiated uh, in the year 2015 uh, and we had the 3d graphy formulated for a clear intention that anything to do with 3d technology uh, 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 should be actually uh, a value proposition for the end users coming from various sectors and industries Uh, and 3D graphy. The prima facie, the intention was uh, to uh, educate uh, respondents from each sector, maybe dental, medical, uh, healthcare, uh, orthotics, and prosthetics. Uh, some fantastic responses that we have been seeing in the last uh, uh, seven years. Aerospace and defense, of course, automotive, tooling, marine, uh, also shipbuilding. Uh, gentlemen, it's been a fantastic uh, uh, technology to offer these. Uh, solutions there too because sometimes you know the molds can always be a challenge in terms of time and efficiency and cost but efficiency is always there but i'm saying in terms of time and del- deliveries this becomes a convenient method 3d printing is also been looked at uh, as an option mass customization is also going to be the future because uh, when we talk about uh, less inventory uh, this technology can gain a lot of traction so 3d graphy as a consortium uh, we have been privileged to be associated and have Uh, got the opportunity to connect with some senior leaders uh, from each of these sectors from aerospace from dental from medical uh, uh, and then we have been able to formulate this so 3d graphy medical and dental is a separate uh, uh, functionary with a separate team of doctors surgeons researchers and material scientists and also uh, specialists from each specialization we also we also know that bioprinting is gaining a lot of traction with artificial organs being now printed so we have a team of respondents also working on those lines uh and also in dental when it comes to dentures and uh, a lot of stuff having uh, gained that kind of uh, importance with the customized manufacturing with 3d technology aerospace and defense is also a, an area that we see that there's a lot of prospects uh, because again to do with uh, uh, certain components uh, 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 you know uh, 3d technology is gaining that importance in terms of making it possible and today we have some great luminaries here who will actually share their insights also on the subject Uh, may i first introduce you to uh, uh wing commander raman surupi ji who is the founder president of uh, aerospace defense consultants association of india uh, who is actually our 3d graphy advisory uh, member and also the other gentleman but i will take the opportunity to introduce uh, uh, him to you and then for him to introduce the other gentleman thank you so much sir uh, uh, you can carry on the stage sir please um, thank you dr john thank you all our senior guests and uh, panelists uh, uh, you know due to the delay in uh, the inaugural timing we'll try to cut down on the uh, introductory part or introduction part but i would like to still do the honor of introducing first uh, dr vasudeva distinguished scientist of drdo and also currently advisor to the prime minister's office uh, as a consultant dr vasudeva is uh, also the distinguished fellow of Aerospace Defence Consultants Association of India. He is a man who has got many hats to his credit, and uh, he has been doing a lot of work, uh, and which has got a lot of you know patented also technologies. He has been guiding us for the last so many years, both when he was in the DRDO and now in the Echelons of Power. Dr. Vasudeva, we are welcome to have you here, and uh, Dr. Vasudeva has been pushing us to get some new technologies under the Atmanirbhar Bharat, Bharat also. which is as diverse as the drone technologies using drones for many applications also and then he was part of the indo pacific webinar during the covid time and uh, the span of his association from australia to america has been very very high dr vasudeva thank you so much for joining us as a chief guest i would also like to welcome shri hari mohan ji a person who has been pioneer in doing what the government has been trying to do restructuring the ordnance factories 
pan india which is something revolutionary nobody thought it will happen and i have myself visited some of these ordnance factories uh, right from dehradun to other places also now as you know uh, gentlemen and the audience people all the different ordnance factories where across are now into the seven ordnance defense public sector undertakings and uh, i can only say with my confidence of 3d printing during the covid time we had a indo pacific webinar where we had uh, australian army sharing their uh, experience and then uh, about 3 years back when i was talking to the head of the indigenization in air force headquarters where they're trying to indigenize the local parts of uh, various russian fleet so i told the air marshal there in the pre bid meeting what in case some company wants to produce the parts by 3d printing so the answer i got in the pre bid meeting was our dgqa or dgaqa is not qualified to assess the parts made by 3d printing so i was totally disheartened but uh, last aero india show in bangalore i am happy to share that air force released the first request for information for 140 items so one has to interact with the stakeholders to see things doing my current uh, issue of concern is the gst of 18% on 3d printing parts if india has to move very fast pace and dr colonel kubair would bear me out government has issued the productivity linked bonus also pli scheme we have to do two things in this number one the gst of parts introduced by the 3d printing must be reduced from 18 to 5% because we have the same incentive given to the mro sector 3d printing will do lot of uh, push into the mro sector and uh, in the next 3 to 5 years i am sure there will be at least 3 to 5 unicorns in india growing out of uh, 3d printing space with this back to dr shibuja thank you so much sir i think it was very insightful and for the experience that you have and we we will definitely want to see you know how we can nip that uh, in terms of taking this uh, course forward uh, and thank you so much uh, gentlemen now let me introduce you to dr uh, surinder pal sir actually he's been a key veteran in the the aerospace for many years uh, and uh, also uh, been a key respondent for gaganyaan as as his project with isro he's also been working Uh, with eki uh, uh, ap uh, uh, kalam also in this previous stint uh, 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 so that such a privilege to have him on board uh, and also as a key 3d graphy advisor to also guide us as we progress uh, thank you so much doctor and also doctor is an ne- ex uh, uh, vice chancellor with uh, defense institute of advanced technology so uh, i think the aspirants needs to know how this technology can get more traction uh, to make it more beneficial for the the future thank you so much for your presence sir and uh, then also to introduce you to colonel kb kubair uh, who is a, a senior respondent in uh, the aero aerospace and defense and also the the advisory for ernst and young for aerospace and defense and he is also the advisor for 3d graphy engineering thank you so much sir for your presence too uh, it's a privilege to have your presence and i'm sure your inputs from each of these presentations as we progress will be of great insight for everybody to know what is the end users response coming from Uh, also dr anil kumar who is also the the key respondent also the guest of honor today uh, somebody who's really worked really hard in his in his area of expertise in isro uh, also an engineer and also a material scientist uh, also done his uh, phd from uh, on metal uh, on metallurgist uh, as, uh, from uh, iit bombay and also iit uh, kharagpur uh, i'm sure uh, dr your uh, uh, you know efforts been made in isro will also be taken to I can't for many of them to know and learn and what is the exercise that you've been doing so thank you so much dr anil for your time and also manjunath uh, uh, mr manjunath also for your presence he has also been an a key respondent and group director with uh, drdo uh, obviously as one of the institution by itself in terms of offering solutions for defense uh, 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 and uh, and that proliferation goes there in terms of for his kind of an effort made also i'm sure uh, mr manjunath your uh area of expertise and your presentation will actually also give some insight to all of us to know you know what is the extent of work that is also been achieved thank you so much gentlemen uh so uh, quickly we will now start with our technical sessions and it's been a pleasure to have you all uh, and ladies and gentlemen we are all waiting for the first session to start uh, we will have uh, dr uh, v anil kumar to uh, make his presentation and then we will follow with the other gentlemen uh, uh, mr manjunath and then uh, uh, 
a respondent joining from uh, LNG Defense to also share his uh, amount of exercise that, and the efforts being made in this space. Thank you so much. And uh, may all have your attention on the presentation and we will actually go with the presentation live. Thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Dr. Anil, please. Yeah. Uh, and uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity given to me to talk on uh, our experience in additive manufacturing and the initiatives we have taken in this row. No issues, no issues, yeah. So, uh, yeah, this would be the outline of my talk. I'd be uh, giving a brief introduction into metal additive manufacturing and uh, the real potential of metal additive manufacturing for our space applications. And uh, what are the quality quality control uh, uh, measures we are taking in uh, metal additive manufacturing, especially for our space application. And I'll be covering a few case studies of our own uh, arena. And of course, uh, some future trends in uh, additive manufacturing and the conclusion. So just uh, as an introduction, I would like to just show this slide, uh, although it is uh, very familiar to this uh, community. Uh, additive manufacturing is the process of joining materials to make objects from 3D model data. Uh, usually it is layer upon layer manufacturing as opposed to subtractive manufacturing methodology. So this is a standard definition what we find in this uh, ASTM uh, standard. And there are many synonyms, of course, uh, you all may be hearing into this, uh, that is rapid prototyping, 3D printing direct digital manufacturing, layered manufacturing, and additive manufacturing. So here, uh, the steps involved are, uh, although they look very simple, they are uh, really have uh, so much technology involved behind it. So the input uh, would be the STL file, uh, which is uh, uh, taken from this uh, CAD software, and this is fed into the CAM software to generate the tool parts for making this uh, object uh, layer by layer using a 3D printer with uh, material, uh, which is either in the form of a powder or in the form of a wire as the input to get the completed part. And of course, when this part is uh, subjected to uh, various inspection and uh, quality control, it will be fit for use, uh, deemed fit for use if it meets all the specification requirements. So what are the uh, capabilities of additive manufacturing? It enables us to create parts and structures that are uh, really impossible or uh, very difficult to manufacture with uh, traditional methods uh, such as forging or casting uh, techniques. Of course, the parts with uh, intricate internal structures or uh, really complex shapes, uh, these uh, can be made uh, easily through additive manufacturing group. And uh, it can also replace an entire multi-part assembly. Like uh, if there are some 30 parts in an assembly, it can be uh, replaced with a single part, uh, which is done through additive manufacturing group. And also we can uh, do this uh, manufacturing of parts on demand uh, without the need for entire factory or some multiple machine setup uh, in a common industry of uh, manufacturing. The next area would be the production of novel materials with uh, unique properties. And of course, uh, repair uh, is one uh, area in which additive manufacturing has uh, scored tremendously. That is, uh, it can be used for replacing worn out or broken parts. And also, uh, some new feature can be added onto existing parts uh, without much uh, uh, involvement in this uh, other manufacturing techniques. So coming to the product development cycle, uh, these are the basic uh, steps involved in uh, uh, any additive manufactured product development. That is the uh, first is the 3D modeling uh, to make the uh, STL file. And next is the data preparation to make it ready for uh, doing this 3D printing. And of course, uh, next step would be the manufacturing on any additive manufacturing machine. And there are some post-processing uh, steps involved, uh, such as removal of supports or removal of powder and also uh, something like short blasting to improve the surface finish or heat treatment to improve or achieve the required mechanical properties. And of course, uh, when all these uh, steps are completed, the part needs to undergo uh, non-destructive testing and evaluation to qualify it uh, for the intended use. And uh, to qualify it, of course, we need to demonstrate that uh, this uh, parts which are printed or the coupons which are printed along with the part, they meet the mechanical, specified mechanical properties, microstructure and chemical composition requirements. And coming to mechanical properties, some applications may demand uh, very critical uh, testing such as fatigue or fracture toughness or impact testing. And of course, the last step would be the qualification and induction of this uh, normally, which is done uh, uh, by doing employing a functional testing either of the component or at a system level functional testing. So coming to the potential, uh, like as I mentioned, uh, one, one of the great potentials of additive manufacturing would be the part count reduction. Uh, so this is a classic example which uh, many uh, speakers would be showing in their presentation. This is a G leap uh, engine uh, fuel nozzle, uh, which is nothing but uh, it was initially 15 individual parts uh, when it was conventionally manufactured. 
and this uh, has been made as a single part uh, through ADT manufacturing route. And of course, it is 30% lighter than the conventional route and also it has shown better performance. And the example on the right is uh, when we go for the design for additive manufacturing, uh, we can achieve tremendous weight savings. This is a control manifold for one of our control system components, wherein the initial weight of the component was around uh, 21 kg. And uh, after doing a DFAM, we could see that uh, we could achieve a 30% weight reduction. So this is one of the examples. So there are many classic examples where weight savings uh, to the tune of 60 to 70 percent also have been achieved. And of course, uh, this is one of the examples from uh, International Fraternity. This is an ESA satellite, Sentinel-1, and uh, wherein weight reduction uh, of around uh, 43 percent could be achieved. So this has been done uh, through DFAM. Of course, uh, when we talk about weight reduction to this tune in a satellite, it uh, results in equal uh, loading of propellant, which prolongs the life of the satellite. So Accordingly, the financial savings what we get from this uh, weight saving in upper stage of a launch vehicle or a satellite is tremendous. So coming to the different metal additive manufacturing uh, technologies uh, which are really useful for our space applications can be classified into uh, powder bed fusion and directed energy deposition. Powder bed fusion I, I can again uh, make use of electron beam as the heating source or uh, using a laser it can be used to sinter or to the melting. And coming to directed energy deposition, it can be either powder or wire fed uh, deposition and with uh, heat source either as a laser or electron beam or a plasma arc. So this slide just shows the comparison of different uh, techniques what is shown in the previous slide. Uh, like uh, with respect to the complexity of the part, accuracy and surface finish, if you want to have the best uh, uh, in these three attributes, laser powder bed fusion is the technique. Of course, uh, I'll come to the limitations and also advantages of this process uh, in the subsequent slides. And coming to very high build rates, uh, productivity and uh, uh, material utilization and overall cost savings, why are creative manufacturing scores over the other, all other techniques? And of course, uh, electron beam powder bed fusion and uh, laser metal deposition are uh, having uh, some advantages compared to one of these processes, but uh, they do fall in the intermediate category. So this slide again shows uh, the uh, uh, resolution or the complexity of the parts that can be printed through various techniques. So this axis shows the uh, resolution or the complex geometry. So it can be seen from this slide that very complex uh, parts can be done through either binder jetting or powder bed fusion. Binder jetting of course uh, has found uh, tremendous applications in automobile but not in aerospace because of the porosities uh, that is found in the products made through this route. But uh, powder bed fusion has definitely scored in this area, especially for aerospace applications, uh, for especially for manufacturing parts with very, very large complexities and in intricate features. And of course, going to larger size, uh, we know that uh, once we go for larger uh, 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 size uh, parts, the resolution and part complexity cannot be the same as what we do in case of powder bed fusion. So powder DED and wire DED are the techniques, uh, in fact, even electron beam uh, LT manufacturing falls in the same category. And also the colors indicate the cost of the process. So it can be seen from this slide that wire DED or powder DED are uh, less expensive compared to the powder bed fusion technique. Of course, uh, uh, when we need to go for increased uh, part sizes, we need to go for these techniques with a slight compromise in uh, resolution or the part complexity. And uh, there are many laser powder bed fusion machines uh, available with various service providers in the country. And of course, a few lab scale machines are there in powder DED. And uh, uh, of course, going further, uh, maybe up to 2025, we may find all of these machines with some service provider or some uh, lab in the country. This slide again shows the uh, capabilities of each of these pro, uh, like uh, techniques. Uh, as I mentioned, laser powder bed fusion, you can have very good surface finish, dimensional tolerance. Positional tolerance. I have highlighted in bold why it is advantageous. And uh, coming to this uh, large sizes of uh, products that can be printed, uh, it can be either wire arc electron beam additive, wire arc or electron beam additive manufacturing techniques, wherein uh, parts uh, with very large sizes. In fact, uh, this is a, a old figure, I should say. Now with the uh, invent of uh, robotics and all this sizes, there is no limitation. I should say with uh, use of gantry, the sizes there is no limitation as such. And of course, uh, these, uh, this process is uh, mainly having, I mean, going for higher layer thickness, so which leads to very high build rates. And of course, the powder or the wire are also coarser compared to this, uh, what is used in powder bed fusion technique. 
So that leads to reduction in the cost because of higher build productivity and also the input material. So I'll not go into much details into each of this process, but just to give a glimpse of a uh, different process, what we are going to use for uh, aerospace applications. Uh, I'm just showing these slides. So this is a typical uh, schematic of a powder bed fusion uh, technique, uh, wherein this is the build platform, wherein the part is being built. And this is the uh, 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 powder uh, bin, which is having uh, a recoater on top of it to spread the powder layer by layer. And uh, laser is used to scan uh, in the selective areas to make the part as per the HTL uh, file, which is fed to the uh, 3D printer. So coming to directed energy deposition, uh, we know that this uh, technique has uh, uh, tremendous potential either for manufacturing of parts or printing of multi-materials or even a part modification or if a special coating is required as in case of uh, medical applications uh, or repair and remodeling. This is the technique. And in fact, there are variants in this. Either you can use a powder feed or a wire feed and uh, laser can be used and uh, electron beam ca can be used to melt the wire and also uh, wire arc is a process in which uh, uh, welding welding uh, techniques such as uh, either GTAW or TIG or plasma are used uh, and uh, arc is the source for the heating the wire and melting it and depositing layer by layer. So coming to directed energy deposition, it is uh, what is shown here is a powder fed and a coaxial laser beam uh, machine and uh, parts uh, as large as 2 meter by 2 meter by 2 meter can be made through this route and uh, of course uh, the parts uh, weighing as large as 300 to 1000 kg also can be made through this route and this uh, these machines uh, make use of uh, very high power lasers either a 2 kilowatt or a 3 kilowatt or up to 5 kilowatt lasers are used and uh, when it comes to printing of uh, uh, res higher resolutions uh, we can make use of low power lasers uh, of uh, about 200 to 500 watt and the typical components what we envisage for printing through this uh, technique are uh, impellers for our uh, engines, exhaust casings, ducts, uh, propellant tank components and also gas bottles. And also this is one uh, useful technique for uh, development of functionally graded materials or multi-material products and also repair of components. So coming to the electron beam additive, this uh, technique uh, employs electron beam gun. Uh, which provides the required energy for melting the metallic feedstock which is uh, normally a less expensive wire as shown here in the schematic and uh, as uh, the technique is involving a very high vacuum uh, it needs to be done in vacuum so it provides an inert atmosphere and it is very suitable for uh, mainly refractive and uh, refractory and uh, reactive alloys such as uh, titanium uh, also super alloys and also refractory alloys such as uh, niobium or tantalum alloys and very large uh, parts can be made uh, and all the alloys which are weldable can be made through this electron beam additive route. And uh, the parts what we envisage for doing through this route are uh, propellant tanks for our uh, both for our launch vehicles and satellites, thrust chambers, gas bottles and grid fins for our uh, crew escape systems for our Gaganyaan mission and also typical materials as I mentioned involve titanium and niobium alloys. So this is one of the largest part uh, uh, which uh, we envisage uh, to print through this additive manufacturing route. So the size uh, you can see here is about uh, 325 mm in height, uh, 1.5 meter in width and about 2 meter in length. So you can uh, just assume what is the uh, potential of this technique. So coming to wire arc uh, additive manufacturing, it combines uh, both uh, automated MIG as well as laser hot wire welding uh, techniques uh, in some cases. Uh, there are different uh, machines available uh, such as Fronius uh, CMT or uh, Gaffer Tech machine uh, which are uh, using the employing this uh, technique and it makes use of a robotic uh, 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 arm with a wire feeder. So when this uh, robotic arm is mounted on a rail system or a gantry, uh, there is uh, no limit for making the part. So very large parts can be ma made through this route and of course again all weldable alloys can be made through this route. So the components what we envisage for printing through this route are uh, propellant tanks, interstages, seamless rings. And typical alloys include all the weldable alloys such as aluminium. Titanium of course uh, needs to uh, be done with uh, very good care because uh, it, as it is done in open atmosphere, the weld needs to be shielded using a inert uh, gas up to uh, till the time the weld cools to below 500 degrees Celsius. Otherwise there is a chance of contamination of the welds. So uh, these are all the techniques what I had covered. So coming to the quality control aspects uh, for metal additive manufacturing. 
So what are the challenges? So the main challenges involve uh, ensuring the quality and reliability of the components that are printed through these routes. So there are very few established standards for qualification and certification. So we need to evolve our own standards. And of course, reliability of the parts made through uh, AM, this needs to be established. So until you have the confidence on the process, uh, reliability always remains a question mark. So we have to consider some techniques such as the computed tomography scanning or uh, uh, it can be done through process control uh, by reducing the defects such as porosity. So we have to choose the right parameters and the processing window. So this involves a lot of R&D for each material to be developed. And of course, uh, establishing proper process control. Uh, so there are uh, not many uh, AM databases available. So we need to establish uh, our own process window and the parameters and also we need to have a proper process control to get a reliable part. So of course, uh, we need to have a closed loop control uh, uh, quality control system and uh, we need to do uh, simulation and uh, build monitoring uh, also during the printing. And of course, uh, one important aspect is, uh, is to reduce the human error. So for this, uh, we will be able to overcome human errors by implementing workflow software for editing and packaging. So coming to the available standards and references, as I mentioned, uh, like uh, this being a relatively newer technique, uh, ASTM and AMS are coming out with uh, standards and as of now, the number of standards in uh, AT manufacturing are very limited, but uh, uh, since uh, they are evolving and uh, this committee is coming out with many standards over the last year also, one year also they have come out with many standards. And of course, there are many pow uh, standards available for uh, powders, uh, either in ASTM or in AMS. And also for the mechanical properties of different uh, alloys, either through ROT or uh, ADT manufacturing route, so there are different standards available in ASTM and uh, AMS, especially for powder bed fusion technique. And of course, for different materials, uh, AMS standards are available for uh, uh, choosing the right heat treatment cycles for those materials. And uh, there are data sheets available with the machines, uh, what is being supplied. And there are different uh, data sheets available for different AM alloys. And one comprehensive standard which we came across and uh, found very useful for qualification of AM components for our applications is uh, uh, American Welding Society AWSD 20.1 standard. So this is also a relatively new standard which has come out in 2019, which is useful for both uh, powder bed fusion as well as directed energy deposition techniques. And of course, uh, we have been uh, uh, referring these ASTM and AMS standards for uh, different alloys. And again, for non-destructive testing also, this is one uh, standard uh, which has looked into it and gives uh, tremendous, I mean, uh, detailed inputs for uh, selecting our acceptance criteria and the guidelines for it. So yeah, this slide, I will not dwell much into it as like these are different ASTM standards available for the common alloys that are being 3D printed and different conditions in which these alloys can be used and the properties in different directions. And of course, uh, these are the different standards uh, which are into each of these areas. And uh, depending on our application, we can use the suitable uh, heat treatment condition. So coming to the uh, qualification methodology that we have employed in uh, uh, VSSC, that is uh, in our area, mainly for qualifying this uh, editively manufactured components uh, involve powder stage qualification. Powder stage qualification uh, wherein uh, uh, there are uh, standards available for the powder specification, the chemical composition, the AM, ASTM standards are available. For the shape, size and distribution, there is the ASTM F3049 standard. And uh, of course, when these uh, powders need to be in spherical form, a flowability test is one which determines the shape and distribution of the powders. Uh, so this test is uh, defined in this ASTM standard. And apparent density is also critical for our uh, uh, determining the flowability of the powder and also the printability of the component using that uh, particular powder. And uh, for sieving also there is a standard ASTM B214. So we make use of all these standards uh, for doing this powder stage qualification. And of course when we are doing this uh, printing of parts, we need to qualify the equipments which are used for printing of these uh, components. Uh, of course the machine, the 3D printing machine, there is a standard available. The heat treatment uh, furnaces, uh, there is a uh, standard for uh, calibration and also uh, <coughs> standards for this uh, referring the uh, pyrometry of uh, those heat treatment furnaces and also different uh, measurement tools are used for uh, doing the inspection and also the vibration seal setup.
next is the first article inspection when we try to make parts through this route this uh, first part that is made through this route uh, needs to be uh, extensively qualified so for doing that what we are doing is uh, uh, this particular stage qualification it qualifies the material the uh, machine and also the parameters that we are using for printing the components and uh, like uh, we uh, do inspection of all these things we do print uh, 10 by 10 by 10 mm cubes along with the part at different location in the build and also that we evaluate the chemical composition the density the microstructure and the hardness from these cubes and for evaluating the physical properties of course uh, we do print uh, coupons in different orientations for evaluating the thermal conductivity the coefficient of thermal expansion the young young modulus and also the specific heat of those uh, uh, alloys uh, which go into different applications in our space systems so coming to the uh, testing on the uh, coupons printed along with the part uh, we do carry out non destructive testing either in the form of radiography or computer tomography and uh, we do carry out tensile testing and hardness on uh, uh, samples printed in different orientation orientations such as x z and 45 and also impact and fracture toughness on the hardware uh, we do carry out uh, visual inspection dimensional inspection the hardness and also the functional uh, testing because uh, when we uh, uh, make a part for the first time through this route uh, we have to be sure that it is uh, it is suitable for the intended end use so we have to carry out a functional test for uh, qualifying this part <coughs> sorry coming to the production stage uh, uh, qualification uh, we do carry out 100% ndt and dimensional inspection on all the hardware and uh, since uh, first article inspection uh, involves uh, extensive testing we try to reduce the sampling here but uh, again we do print coupons in both x and z orientations that is along the build plate and also perpendicular to the build uh, we have to print the uh, coupons and carry out tensile testing along uh, which are printed along with the uh, part and uh, of course these uh, samples are again representative of thin and thick sections of the uh, coup, uh, of the parts that are that are being printed and coming to the production stage hardware uh, we do have a, a, a process of uh, carrying out randomly uh, one hardware for functional testing so that uh, it it uh, forms a batch qualification kind of criteria and coming to the post processing uh, uh, as i mentioned to achieve the required properties heat treatment and to achieve the required surface uh, finish short blasting is done and uh, in some cases surface treatment may be essential and wherever very critical uh, dimensional tolerances or accuracies are required the part needs to be cnc machine so coming to the metal additive manufacturing uh, scenario in the world uh, we have seen that uh, uh, different uh, space agencies have been uh, trying to exploit the full potential of uh, additive manufacturing in their arena so here one uh, 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 like common example what is shown is the propulsion module for uh, ariane 6 which involves so many injector elements uh, which are normally earlier used to be done by conventional techniques such as uh, brazing of all these uh, elements to the uh, base plate so right now uh, through edit manufacturing this is being printed entirely as a single component and of course uh, uh, isro has uh, done 3d printing of feed, feed cluster for our gsat satellite and uh, lockheed martin has developed uh, satellite propellant tank uh, tank domes uh, through electron beam edit manufacturing route and this is one typical example which we uh, come across uh, in many uh, uh, like uh, discussions uh, this is a fuel tank that has been done by relativity space using two robotic uh, wire arc uh, feeders and uh, our own uh, space startup uh, skyroot they have uh, printed and recently tested and qualified this uh, dawan one engine which is a cryogenic engine uh, this has been done through laser powder bed fusion and of course uh, this is one aerospike nozzle uh, which has been done by von hofer and uh, engine uh, chamber cell core uh, which has been done by cell core which are having conformal cooling channels and uh, of course uh, when we talk about space applications uh, titanium is one workhorse alloy so we need to look at uh, it manufacturing routes for making uh, different uh, titanium alloy products uh, so that we can again exploit the potential of it manufacturing and also it can result in uh, cost savings because uh, titanium is an expensive material and conventional techniques uh, there is lot of material wastage and lot of lead time involved so when we go for additive manufacturing route we can save both the material as well as uh, lead time 
for realizing all these components. So these are typical components such as gas bottles, propellant tanks, and uh, like uh, repair is one area uh, because these are expensive alloys. Uh, to salvage some components, it is uh, like advisable to go for repair. And of course, uh, we have done few components through laser powder pet fusion for our own applications. So uh, in VSSC, we have uh, evolved uh, a vision, I should say, uh, for the NAE. I mean, uh, we have evolved this vision in uh, 2020, and uh, over the next five years, we plan to establish ourselves as a center of excellence in metal additive manufacturing. So mainly, our focus is into the research and development in different areas, such as the design part, uh, design for additive manufacturing, the materials uh, required for additive manufacturing, and of course, the qualification uh, for uh, inducting those components into our program. And of course, we are also looking into the process, the post-processing and qualification and testing and induction of components into our program is the area. So we initially started with the uh, development of uh, passive launch vehicle com components using laser powder pit fusion facilities, mainly through uh, various service providers in the country. And uh, going further, uh, we are into, uh, we have done detailed characterization of uh, almost some 40 to 50 parts, uh, what we have done in 10 different alloys in powder pit fusion. And uh, we'll be generating our own qualification plans instead of depending on some standards. And also we'll be inducting all these uh, components into our program. And going further, uh, during 2021-22, we are uh, focusing on uh, having our hands-on experience in uh, directed energy deposition, electron beam additive, wire arc additive. And also we'll be studying uh, the metallurgy, NDT, and the post-processing aspects of various components being done through these rooms. And of course, uh, we need to have a thorough understanding of the process design. So we do uh, plan to carry out simulation studies in each of these areas. And uh, with all this understanding, uh, maybe by 2024, we will be looking at developing uh, active launch vehicle components and again consolidating multiple parts into a single component and going for optimal designs, whereby we can uh, uh, go for weight savings as well as uh, uh, cost reduction. And of course, when we go further, uh, we'll be able to look at developing novel designs, functionally graded materials for our futuristic missions. And also, uh, we'll be looking at developing new and futuristic alloys for our applications and uh, 3D printing of complex space systems. In fact, uh, we, we even look forward to printing this entire launch vehicle structure, maybe by the end of 2025. So, uh, like as I mentioned, uh, these are the different, uh, these are just a glimpse of uh, different alloy components, what we have uh, tried to develop and uh, carry out functional qualification and induct those components into our program. And of course, I have a few case studies on this. So, this particular uh, thing shown here is uh, two different types of brackets, uh, uh, which are going to find place in our newest uh, or a small satellite launch vehicle, what is called as a small satellite launch vehicle, the SLV is going to be launched in uh, the beginning of 2022 and uh, we have done all uh, qualification including this exclusive build of coupons and uh, we have done different stages of qualification as i showed uh, during quality control of uh, components for our applications and uh, we have done detailed qualification as per this uh, dw uh, astm d20.1 standard and also we have uh, successfully completed the structural testing and acoustic testing and it has been uh, found to be suitable for this application so this would be the first 3D printed component to fly in a launch vehicle of our ISRO uh, system. So if you see the pro properties, uh, these are the typical properties in a rot alloy, SS316L. And uh, what we could uh, get in 3D printed route uh, is having uh, uh, very high uh, values compared to the rot route. So that way we uh, do have uh, more uh, margins available uh, for uh, these components. And here, this is another typical example of a fuel injection uh, component that we have done in Inconel 718 through laser powder bed fusion uh, technique. And uh, here you can see there are a lot of interconnected channels uh, in this component, uh, which are uh, of the order of uh, 0.8 mm to 3 mm uh, dimensions. And uh, we know that Inconel 718 is a very difficult to manufacture uh, alloy through conventional route. So, uh, 3D printing of this uh, component has given us tremendous advantage and in fact uh, uh, this uh, particular component is uh, definitely not uh, uh, possible to make through conventional manufacturing technique. And here again we could get uh, comparable mechanical properties. And uh, these are some components uh, we have developed in uh, titanium alloy ta 6 for initially, uh, mainly for our cryogenic applications. Here also we have done detailed material uh, characterization. We have done computer tomography for both uh, dimensional inspection as well as uh, 
uh, NDT part of it to detect the presence of any defects. Here we find that uh, there is a cost advantage of almost 20% compared to the conventional route. And also if you see the mechanical properties against the specified values, you can see the values are uh, uh, very high and there is sufficient margin available over the minimum guaranteed mechanical properties that are specified. And uh, this is one uh, particular component what we have done in uh, aluminium ignition scandium alloy. This is an advanced uh, uh, 3D printing, uh, I mean 3D printed uh, aluminium alloy. And uh, we have used for uh, developing this, uh, replacing this component what we conventionally make through A2014 in T652 condition. Here again, uh, we have targeted this properties and we find that uh, this uh, material and the coupons printed along with this component are meeting all the specified property requirements and here again we do have enough margins available. This particular component also uh, we have done all qualification and it is uh, shortly uh, planned to be taken up for a functional testing. So coming to the uh, uh, potential of LT manufacturing, uh, here you can see that uh, the bracket what I had shown initially what is going to fly in our uh, small satellite launch vehicle. Uh, if it is made through conventional uh, manufacturing route, you need to make a block of around 100, kg, uh, 100 kilograms. And a 3D printed component weighs only about uh, 3.6 kilograms. That is, uh, we have done printing of this component in uh, uh, as it is conditioned without doing any uh, design for additive. And suppose we go for a design for additive manufacturing. This component uh, uh, would be weighing only 2.4 kilograms. So this particular uh, Design also we are verifying and uh, we, uh, we are very confident that we can go for this uh, uh, defamed uh, uh, component and uh, it can give us again further weight saving and of course the mechanical properties here uh, as I mentioned uh, are uh, we are having enough margins and uh, if you see the cycle time uh, the conventional uh, route uh, the cycle time involved is more than almost two months and through the 3D printed route we can uh, get a component in five days. And this is one uh, particular uh, program which we talk of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, going further, uh, we may find potential of uh, flying uh, one launch vehicle every month. So that way, uh, we'll be able to meet the uh, demand of this through AT manufacturing route. And of course, by going for this DFAM, we can achieve a 35% weight saving. And this is another uh, case study which we have found, uh, like it is a very suitable business case, I should say. Uh, we are going to do this through electron beam additive manufacturing route. For making this uh, component which weighs only about 120 kilograms, uh, what we make to conventional uh, route, uh, the forging weighs around 2.5 tons. So there is tremendous uh, material wastage here. In fact, all these pockets are uh, uh, cut out using uh, abrasive water jet machining and then we need to do milling uh, to realize this component and there is a lot of stress relieving, intermittent stress relieving involved which involves a lot of cycle time. So to make a typical component uh, like this uh, through conventional route, it involves uh, more than three and a half months. And uh, through AT manufacturing route, uh, we will be able to make this uh, in about 12 days time. And of course, uh, uh, this also gives us advantage of uh, printing integral uh, brackets along with this, uh, in which in conventional route, we need to fabricate separately and uh, we need to join them mechanically to this main grid thin component. So here again, we find that there, there will be a tremendous uh, cost savings once uh, we print this component in uh, more numbers. So this is another example uh, wherein uh, we have been doing this uh, 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 closed die forged domes for our gas bottle applications in titanium alloy through conventional uh, forged route that is uh, we go for closed die forging uh, uh, then machining and also uh, electron beam welding. So this uh, when we make this through this uh, editing manufacturing uh, electron beam editing manufacturing route the input material required would be only about 18 kilograms. So there would be only material wastage of about 6 kilograms compared to the conventional route. And uh, these are the operations involved. Uh, so in uh, this AET manufacturing route only the operations would be involved would be annealing and machining. And the typical uh, cycle time would be about 4 days compared to about uh, 2 months in this case. Here again uh, we find that the cost advantage of uh, 0.7, I mean 25% cost savings. And coming to R&D in uh, this area of AT manufacturing, uh, uh, we have collaborated with uh, different uh, labs in the country and uh, this particular coupons, uh, we have collaborated with uh, RRCAT Indoor and uh, we got the uh, coupons printed uh, through their facility, uh, which is a machine made by uh, their own lab. And uh, we find that uh, Inconel 718, uh, it is a heat treatable alloy. 
so we have done different heat treatment studies and we find that by just by going for a direct double aging instead of doing a solutionizing or a homogenizing and then going for a double aging treatment by going for a direct aging in uh, uh, by taking the coupons in as printed condition we'll be able to achieve the required mechanical properties like this h3 l3 and d3 are the mechanical properties in horizontal vertical and diagonal uh, uh, orientations and we find that it meets the minimum uh, uh, required uh, material property requirements uh, 1041 is the spec and uh, we see that values are well above this and these are the typical microstructures in different heated conditions shown here so, and uh, we find that uh, by going for this uh, uh, direct aging we will be able to get uh, I mean meet the required hardness and also the tensile strength so that gives us a tremendous uh, cost savings and uh, this is another uh, example of uh, optimization of uh, heat treatment cycle this particular alloy has been developed by M4P Austria and uh, we have collaborated with them as well as Objectify Technologies Delhi and uh, we have done some uh, preliminary uh, studies on this alloy and we find that uh, uh, 375 degree uh, would be a very uh, optimum heat treatment cycle for achieving the uh, maximum mechanical properties in this alloy. So we find that against this uh, as built uh, properties of 290 and 368 MPa in heated condition we would be able to get uh, values such as 443 MPa yield and 473 MPa UTS with uh, uh, almost very good elongation of 16%. So this uh, particular uh, uh, heat treatment cycle we have optimized for this alloy and again uh, we have uh, done some simulation uh, uh, through uh, NIT Suratkal uh, wherein uh, the bracket what I had shown here we try to predict what would be the distortion in this component and we find that uh, 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 we are able to catch uh, uh, this uh, area of maximum distortion uh, in the bracket and when we printed this we found that uh, the bracket in fact warped at the same location and the distortion was found to be about uh, 2 mm in this case and uh, we could simulate and find that it was about 1.84 and here we try to uh, try to see uh, with scale how the distortion varies so uh, for different uh, scaling this would be the amount of distortion it is almost linear and these are the parameters uh, what we use for printing this component which we have taken as the input for this uh, uh, simulation. So coming to the challenges uh, what we face in aerospace sector it is uh, uh, first one I should say uh, used to be an organizational barrier or culture now once more and more awareness is uh, developed by doing more components uh, this organizational barrier I should say uh, would be uh, removed shortly and of course uh, knowledge and education in this area is very important uh, so we need to update ourselves and upskill ourselves uh, to have more understanding into this uh, area and of course when we try to uh, print uh, parts through various service providers in the country and uh, going further uh, we'll be looking at uh, cyber security and also for uh, different parts uh, what we try to print uh, through I mean what we try to make through AT manufacturing uh, we should have a proper business case to justify the cost savings to our managements and of course a uh, uh, very important thing would be uh, this OEM and service provider partnership unless there is a uh, like really good partnership between the OEM and service provider uh, we will be having uh, problems in uh, doing different components and of course uh, the certification challenges the main thing as I mentioned is lack of standards so we need to evolve our own standards for different uh, materials and different uh, uh, techniques uh, and also the lack of data as uh, data in this area is uh, mainly uh, proprietary or limited data is available in open literature we need to have our own data so that requires extensive studies uh, our own studies and also the certified part is normally attached to a particular process or a machine or a material so uh, we need to diversify that and of course the time involved for certification yes uh, some may argue that the time involved here is less uh, compared to a uh, conventional thing but uh, again uh, since being a new technique uh, we need to uh, have a very robust uh, qualification to say that uh, yes this part uh, is fit for the use so coming to the future trends uh, of course uh, when we are looking at different alloys uh, the piece stock needs to be diversified we need to have powders and wires in different alloys and uh, when we are looking at exploiting the potential of AM we need to go for design for additive and of course uh, it uh, enables us to go for custom product design and also post processing and post process automation this this would again uh, bring down the cycle time involved presently uh, in this editing and fixing routes and of course when we go for uh, hybrid machines uh, which can do printing as well as machining in the same uh, setup 
it can again further reduce the cycle time and uh, the future would be investment in parts and not in technologies and of course uh, when we need to widen uh, the scope in this uh, we need to focus on education and training in this uh, area and going further maybe 4 to 5 years down the line we'll be finding many corporate centers of excellence in the country and of course uh, uh, due to its tremendous potential and uh, business involved uh, there would be emergence of uh, countless startups in this area also so to conclude uh, at manufacturing is a disruptive technology which has been growing ex uh, exponentially worldwide and has been gaining more popularity in both aerospace and space sectors and am parts are improving or uh, having better mechanical properties compared to the rod products and uh, reliable inspection techniques uh, are needed for the inspection and quality control of am components to induct them into our program and there's tremendous potential for replacement of conventional parts uh, in aerospace by am parts as i have shown in different case studies of course these are uh, not exhaustive uh, so there are other case studies uh, which we have done and found tremendous potential and uh, of course as i am shown uh, like there is again tremendous scope for r and d in this uh, area and different alloys different routes we are uh, trying to do some studies and uh, when we look into literature not uh, every area in those areas i mean in additive manufacturing is addressed so we can take up r and d in that area and of course coming to the future trends uh, it would be tailoring alloy of alloys microstructure and development of functionally graded materials and uh, multi materials uh, considering our uh, futuristic missions a gaganyaan human in space program and also interplanetary missions so uh, that's all from my side uh, so i would like to acknowledge our management for giving me this opportunity to share my experiences in this area and also organizers of 3d graphy engineering event uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity to share my experience in this uh, august gathering so thank you very much Dr. Anil, thank you so much for an exhaustive presentation. And uh, I have two, three challenges uh, for you and for the other partners in the industry. Number one, going forward, the expansion of the 3D printing industry, uh, we feel there will be a shortage of human resource in the 3D printing industry. I am not sure if we have a diploma course in 3D printing. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, because we came from the five year course of electrical engineering which is now a four year course uh, do you think there is a scope for creating iti kind of a certificate for three years to start with till we have a four year engineering course for 3d printing number one number two question defense acquisition process follows the l1 criteria uh, now when it comes to a vintage aircraft or from the russian mro industry where they want replacement of old parts under the make in india scheme uh, currently the tenders are coming under the l1 category i am i am not comparing the space industry where uh, you people are doing great work to uh, you know favor the indian industry giving them a lot of opportunity and uh, guiding them also but in the uh, obsolescence management of the uh, you know um, uh, air force army navy air force the difficulties on the costing part so if you can share with us and then thirdly we are coming out with a directory of uh, the 3d printing industry in india we will need your support to compile the compendium of which are the uh, msme and other industries who are connected with you we want to connect them to the defense industry also so number one on the human resource part second on the costing third is compiling the industry to put all the stakeholders together over to you sir Yes, sir. Uh, in fact, uh, you have hit the bull's eye. I should say, uh, like education, as I mentioned, uh, we are lacking. There is no professional course, even if, uh, as far as my knowledge goes, so there is no professional course either in the form of a diploma or uh, now. Uh, I should say, in postgraduate uh, in uh, material science and all, uh, IT manufacturing finds place, but definitely like uh, ITI course, uh, there is no uh, course in that area. And uh, now, since uh, we are expanding. and we we would be falling short of human resource in this area definitely that is the need of the hour and uh, i think uh, uh, the dignitaries here today in this uh, forum uh, i know uh, will be taking up this uh, with the uh, higher ups and uh, looking into this area so definitely that is uh, one area which is required and uh, uh, coming to your second question sir about the cost yes uh, we do uh, follow that l1 criteria but again uh, what we try to do is uh, we try to have a, uh, something like a two part bidding wherein uh, we define the technical uh, specification in the first part 
and only when uh, this uh, technical specification requirements are met in toto we try to open their price bid so that way uh, only when we are sure that uh, some party is capable of doing uh, all the things which we intend to do through them uh, we try to open their price bid and accordingly uh, within them again there is again a competition which is a hell- very healthy i should say so that way we do ensure that uh, they meet our uh, technical requirements so uh, through this process in fact i should say at least uh, uh, we have uh, now at least uh, some seven to eight different service providers who have been supporting us uh, in our uh, work uh, which we have done all, all through this last two three years so that way uh, we are sure that uh, there will be many coming forward uh, uh, going further and uh, they will be able to support our requirements and i think same would be the practice what is being followed in defense uh, in this area and uh, coming to your third question sir yes uh, like uh, we can support in uh, the initiative what you are trying to take up in this area so that would be really good i should say and of course uh, again now uh, i think there are uh, large corporates also entering this area so which i think uh, would be beneficial and also next thing i would uh, like to mention here is another thing is uh, we should try to encourage lot of startups uh, in this uh, edit manufacturing especially uh, with focus on defense and aerospace because these are the areas uh, which we find tremendous potential and uh, which would be win win for both the startup as well as for the defense and aerospace companies in the country so hope uh, i could answer your question sir thank you sir my question was uh, some tenders which are coming in the military okay there is no there is no you know requirement of producing the parts only by 3d they say i want indigenous production of this okay. part okay yeah so where does this level playing field come in between the 3d printing industry and the non 3d printing because the guys who are going to just import and supply and the guy who is doing 3d printing there is a non level playing field so just want your thoughts on this how do we boost this uh, 3d printing uh yes sir uh, or so i would say you many, mentioned very very the made in ludhiana industry and the 3d printing industry <laughs> okay yeah uh, actually you have made a right point sir uh, like we should provide a, a really a level playing field for uh, uh, encouraging all this uh, 3d printing industries to come in so for that uh, actually uh, first thing as i mentioned is an organizational barrier so uh, when we uh, we try to bring in a new technology there is always some resistance because uh, there is no confidence in that technology so like uh, what we have been trying to do is uh, we have been trying to do extensive studies in different alloys techniques and trying to prove that yes uh, these uh, particular uh, things through edit manufacturing i mean uh, roots uh, work for us so that way we are we are also trying to build that confidence by uh, doing different studies so i think uh, that similar approach would be required uh, uh, in uh, air force also but uh, there again uh, like uh, as you mentioned uh, like uh, that mindset has to change thank you sir i request yes. others please ask questions if any thank you anybody else wanting to ask a question to dr anil to ask anil in this cryo engines etc what is your opinion when you use the cryo engines although agni you know the sky route has done something but uh, when you go to the hydrogen temperature can these uh, i mean uh, you know devices manufactured can withstand that temperature of hydro liquid hydrogen yes sir it's a very valid question and in fact uh, like uh, as you know and uh, you are aware that in isro uh, we have specific alloys uh, suitable for ls2 and uh, lox applications so we would be going for uh, titanium alloy 5al 2.5 eli or uh, something like uh, ta6l for eli and uh, of course uh, we need to print uh, coupons in different orientations and uh, uh, do tensile testing at those temperatures in fact the application temperatures and we need to have lot of data and then establish reliability and of course carry out uh, different tests such as fracture toughness testing impact testing uh, notch tensile testing at those temperatures uh, to build enough data and then uh, uh, then only we will be able to induct those uh, alloys uh, into our systems so it requires lot of testing to and qualification to be done and of course as i mentioned many of the alloys or components what we are trying to induct into our uh, uh, program Uh, we, uh, we have plans of uh, carrying out functional testing of each and every component before it finds place in our system. Thank you. Yes. Uh, 
Pranil Kumar, I have a question. Uh, yes. Sir. How many start uh, startup are uh, uh, supporting you for this? Sir, right now, uh, like I should say, uh, uh, whatever uh, service providers are there, either uh, two or three of them only are startups. Whereas the other uh, companies, uh, what is there, which are uh, there in the form of service providers, have uh, uh, evolved from uh, earlier uh, conventional industries. So I should say only uh, limited startups are there in this area. So going forward, uh, we should encourage a lot of startups uh, and uh, maybe government of India should take initiatives uh, to incentivize uh, startups who are uh, coming into this area, especially uh, those who will be able to support uh, our aerospace and uh, defense arena. Sorry. There are uh, hardly a couple of uh, startups currently, I should say, as far as my knowledge goes. Uh, Wing Commander uh, Ramanji, now I would uh, request you to introduce uh, our chief guest and uh, for his uh, inputs, please. Thank you. Uh, uh, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I now request our chief guest of the day and this session, Dr. Vasudeva, to take over and uh, give us the words of wisdom and his keynote address, please. Over to you, Dr. Vasudeva, sir. Sir, you are on mute. So, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sapuri and uh, Shibu John, for inviting me to this uh, excellent uh, forum. Uh, and uh, thank you, Anil Kumar, for the nice presentation, which has uh, given insight into what is happening in ISRO. Uh, we are not aware about the total picture in India, as far as I am concerned. But how many startups are there, or uh, how many uh, companies are there? But uh, I was associated with one of the startup here for making the drones. It is uh, Rep for Fiber. So they put number of uh, 3D printers and all the parts for the drones which are being made are by the 3D printing. Uh, as far as uh, this uh, 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 total market uh, worldwide is concerned, it's not a very big market. I think it's around uh, expected to be around 6 billion by 2026, 6 billion dollars. So it's not a very big market and for India also, it's not a, a very big market. It's only we are uh, beginning. And uh, uh, the uh, you see, uh, this has got a very, uh, uh, we can uh, 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 make different type of parts by 3D, which are exotic. And uh, it started with, uh, especially in the US, uh, 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 the Rambo. Rambo was the name given, which was the manufactured by the ballistic uh, ordinance, rapidly, additively manufactured ballistic ordinance, Rambo. So the uh, Army M203 grenade launcher was made by this technique. And uh, it took around 70 hours to print the grenade launcher to barrel and receiver. And another five hours for the post print for finishing. So uh, many uh, uh, design problems to start with, we can, uh, uh, we can uh, solve by the 3D printing. And uh, of course, 3D printing is going to be the future where we can reduce the cost, we can reduce the uh, cost of manufacturing, but it has to be uh, popularized in India. In India, I think uh, the institution like ISRO and uh, uh, the IITs, they have started it. But, uh, uh, and Dr. Jitinder Sharma, he is for the uh, bio, bio this thing, he has uh, uh, put the uh, 3D printers and uh, are being used. So uh, from the office of the principal uh, scientific advisor, what our initiative will be to create different uh, zones where we can uh, put the 3D printers and uh, which could be utilized by various industries because I, I know it's not a, uh, for the investment point of view, uh, people may not be able to invest where government has to participate and create the centers uh, where people can come, they can learn, they are trained, so this will be the initiative. I will be discussing this thing with our uh, uh, partner, Invest India Limited. So I already discussed with them. So I think we will come out with some policy and uh, regarding uh, the uh, the uh, this uh, as uh, uh, Raman Sapuri has told about the uh, this uh, uh, taxation is there. This also probably we will see that uh, it, we will be able to reduce from I think 18 percent to 5 percent so that uh, this field is encouraged. So 
thank you very much uh, raman and uh, shubhu john i think we need more data to compile uh, for the industries which are there already in the country so thank you very much so i wish uh, all the best to the participant uh, for this uh, seminar thank you uh, thank you sir may i request dr surinder paul to share his uh, words of wisdom please yeah it was a, an excellent presentation by anil and uh, first hand presentation i find there is an enough opportunities for uh, 3d printing or additive manufacturing also i mean he talk, mostly called it as a additive manufacturing for uh, aerospace not only aerospace automobile sector which is quite a big sector in the country and also added to that one um, you know i agree with the dr vasudev that uh, market uh, is low but market will increase if the industries come up in this di uh, direction if you go for uh, multi materials uh, additive manufacturing then many things in electronic era also can come you know like uh, you know manufacturing of uh, devices in millimeter waves because we are going into 6 hertz you know 6g when you go for 6g the phase errors extra all will be there there will be small phase errors will be there which will be uh i know put in the across uh, whole space and in that case millimeter waves comes into the picture if allowed in the country then the, this uh, additive manufacturing will be very good for manufacturing the, the uh, you know uh, phase array items and uh, uh, it's also possible that in the future uh, asics can be made using the 3d printing if uh, some A sufficient uh, knowledge gets uh, accumulated where devi uh, semiconductor devices can be put in that direction but i am sure hmc which is a, uh, already some sort of 3d printing it can be done it can be automobiles and that also come in the same arena then also i feel that uh, when we go into terahertz lot of work is being going on in terahertz region and that's the reason where manufacturing by conventional means is difficult so uh 3d or additive manufacturing will add to it uh, i personally feel that uh, there is a lot of things have to be done in the country and country is going in the right direction i am sure uh, drdo because i had a association with drdo also drdo i know they are also in this era man maybe mr manjunath will be talking it but uh, isro is going in a big way uh, and you know if we as uh, anil kumar pointed out if we go for the additive manufacturing we save the weight we save the um, cost I mean, there is a tremendous advantage in cost and more than that i was finding from his uh, talk that uh, from you know from 60 days if something can come to 12 days what's an advantage in the time scale so that sort of thing i find it's a good uh, 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 i mean there is a good scope for the additive manufacturing in the country and not only this this will spread in so many other areas once it picks up of course the startups have to come and um, i as anil kumar said there are startups i know about wipro thing wipro is doing very well in this direction many things are being manufactured in the, for the industry others will also come up so i wish uh, the seminar quite uh, i mean good luck and uh, the presentation has been very good that much only i can say keep it up anil thank you uh thank you sir uh i would request colonel kubey to unmute and uh, share his experience both from his previous army experience and uh, ernest young colonel kubey if you can unmute yourself thank you sir thank you for that uh, uh for calling me on stage so uh, i think uh, after hearing dr anil kumar i am sort of motivated to go and set up a, a 3d printing uh, manufacturing facility pretty soon because he talked about um, when he talked about the advantages i mean i am i'm seeing that we are talking about material advant material wastage advantages about 90% um, yield strength is increasing um, enormously we talked about um, a uh, cycle times which are reducing more than uh, 10 to 12 times and uh, uh, the turnaround time for a product 
is is probably reducing to uh, a, a small fraction. I think it's one by ten or one by fifteen, as I saw in in many cases, is reducing by more than ten to fifteen times. And uh, the part count, like he he brought out uh, from from, I mean, fifteen to twenty parts into one, and I, I think that's a very major breakthrough. And uh, overall, also he talked about a cost reduction about point seven five percent. That probably answers one of your questions which we're raising to him. That uh, is there a level playing field? I think it's more than a level playing field. If you are going to reduce the cost, you are straight away L one. And uh, L1 is going to be the de determinant in major democracies, and especially democracies like us, which are uh, probably still struggling to find the budget for for various things. Uh, but uh, the only thing which I would like to ask Dr. Anil Kumar, maybe he can he can clarify at some point in time, is that um, uh, whether uh, this 0.75% or 0.8% uh, uh, 0.8 of the of the cost of the manufacturing cost is it uh, including all the above that is the material based stage and the yield the cycle times and if it includes all of them then i think uh, there is an issue if it is in addition to all the other savings that we have got then there is a terrific advantage and uh, as i see the major disadvantage for 3d printing is uh, actually in terms of certifications and uh, and qualification so if i were to put a dgq a guy onto uh, a 3d printing um, uh, facility uh, i mean i can tell you that it will take uh, probably years for them to uh, to i mean the the time saving that he has uh, he has saved in terms of bringing the product in a, in a turnaround time would be lost in terms of certifications and qualifications because i think even as we talk isro is struggling to find those standards in uh, in in qualifying a product and therefore uh, when we talk of center of excellences in additive manufacturing technology i think we should probably focus more on uh, on material research like he brought out because at the end of the day it's all about materials the strength of materials and how we are going to handle materials and the second is the whole process of testing and uh, and qualification and as we all are aware that uh, as far as the defense is concerned aerospace defense uh, this is going to be pretty crucial as is with i i'm not saying isro it is not but then uh, here you know we have the, we, we have independent agencies which do the qualifications unlike isro which is the manufacturer which is the consumer which is the tester which is the researcher i mean isro does everything in house whereas uh, in the in the in the aerospace and defense in the in the defense uh, parlor uh, the user is somebody else the uh, the procurement agency is different the qualification agency is different the design agency is absolutely different and therefore you know we have adequate uh, uh, a confusion in terms of agencies and bringing them all onto one platform to qualify a product would be uh, would be pretty uh, pretty difficult. So I think um, uh, what we need to do is. Uh, in terms of you know uh, this being a contemporary technology, uh, we still need uh, you know we still would need castings and forgings. Uh, I think um, the willingness to adapt uh, will depend upon the factors in terms of testing, uh, qualifications, and uh, uh, you know the the metal to non-metal and things like that, and how we are able to uh, uh, to find these alloys. Uh, like ISRO has gone and uh, and done a, a collaborative uh, arrangement with Austria like that, you know. If somebody else finds a particular alloy, can we go and do the same thing with them? Can we can we collaborate? Uh, because if we can create that uh, that collaboration in terms of uh, uh, material strength and material, then I think uh, because any aerospace and defense systems can be actually 3d printed uh, there is uh, you know uh, the materials uh, for them for materials to reach a trl9 stage would be pretty uh, uh, would take a long time so i think um, i think uh, therefore uh, when we see all this it will be important for us to understand that um, in terms of technology ha hardware sand printing metal single alloys and uh, the washout in terms of sacrificial tooling complicated geometry and you know uh, the supply chain i think to get it uh, uh, at, at the end of the day we are looking at, at 3d as uh, you know to get it first time right and and i think that is that is something that we have got to look uh, more more uh, 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 closely and um, 
in terms of lead time, weight reduction, uh, simulations and real design, I think we are doing pretty well. And I think uh, in terms of reliability and durability, again, we come back to the, uh, the qualifications and testing and uh, uh, traceability, data management, data capture, etc. I think is faster. It's much better. I think we can have uh, we can have uh, standards which can which can include all this and therefore an integrated approach like uh, like uh, like wing commander uh, raman sapori was bringing out in terms of bringing the academia and uh, an integrated approach where you bring the academia the tooling the uh, you know we have these industrial corridors dr wasdev was talking about uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, the collaboration they have with invest india there is uh, a defense industry corridors there are these defense testing industry uh, testing infrastructure schemes this is the time to integrate and in the common facility centers we should bring about these uh, these you know the toolings and the uh, the the uh, the type of facilities for 3d printing so that uh, in general people can take uh, advantage of this whole thing um, the global market is pegged around uh, 1.9 US billion dollars in, in 2021 itself and it's projected to reach something like 4.7 billion by 2026 uh, it's it's growing at a range of uh, at, at a at a CAGR of 19.4 percent, and and I can tell you here that when when somebody says you know uh, the the number of startups are going to come by the dozens, I think it's going to be by the hundreds. So we are going to see a raise in the number of startups, and we are going to see fused filament fabrication, uh, stereolithography, and selective laser uh, stintering in our uh, in. In, in, in 3D printing because these are the most common methods and uh, uh, we, we, uh, we, we did see some of the, the techniques that Dr. Anil was talking about and then uh, the key element of course all of us know is the carbon fiber amongst others uh, and therefore again uh, we'll have to get back to the raw material and you know we uh, I think right now we are almost 100% dependent upon uh, uh, a, a foreign uh, foreign agency for, for import of raw materials I think this we have to try and address in house. Um, uh, GE is today looking for you know the manufacture of the fuel nozzle from uh, for various jet engines using the the 3D printing uh, GE additive uh, you know a subsidiary of GE. Uh, it has already installed a, a, a laser powered 3D printer at IIT Kanpur uh, since 2019. Uh, Bemel uh, assigned an MOU with Wipro uh, for 3D printing amongst other technologies. Acus is using 3D printing for manufacturing some of the aerospace components. Skyroot, uh, I think we talked about the Hyderabad based uh, startup space, um, which is um, uh, which is uh, which has built the uh, which has fired the first uh, privately developed uh, fully cryogenic engine is also demonstrating a technology that will power the upper stages uh, in the upcoming Vikram 2 and we are going to see uh, you know in January 2020 HAL and Wipro 3D um, the metal additive manufacturing business of Wipro uh, signed an MOU for uh, design, develop, test, manufacture, repair of components, uh, aerospace components using metal additive technology. HL is primarily using 3D printing to make engine components, uh, though its applications are also found in dedicated helicopter MRO division, uh, which is operational since 2006 and also providing some lifetime support. In, um, uh, so we've got we've got a number of these uh, things which are happening in the in the private sector. Uh, Think 3D, for example, is partnering with the Indian Navy uh, to to help produce some spares on demand. So when I when I see some of these things like uh, you know the uh, the Make 3 in the in the in the DAP, which is the Defense Acquisition Procedure, which is mostly going to talk about spares and small little things. I think there, uh, uh, you know, even if you set up a small 3D printing shop, you'll be able to uh, uh, supply to uh, to most of the requirements of spares uh, which are from outside because the designers in house the uh, you know we can we can always use the uh, uh, the uh, the technology and the uh, the knowledge gained by isro on this and therefore i think we can we can do a very good job as we go forward uh, the future looks looks pretty promising for uh, for 3d and i think this is the time we have to uh, get back and say yes uh, we will get into 3D and uh, this has uh, definitive advantages. Put the testing and qualification together. We are there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Colonel Kubair. Um, uh, one cannot uh, agree with what you're talking. Uh, I have two, three bullet points to share with the audience. In the last Aero India show, we had conducted all India, various state uh, governments in India 
who are uh, pioneering in the age of 3D printing. So we realize that the Karnataka state has got many startups into this industry. We have got the list. We'll share with the audience. The second good news is that we have received a invite from the U.S. Embassy in India. Boeing is going to conduct a supplier conference on 11th to 13th April in Seattle. Uh, any Indian company who's wanting to uh, push and get into the supply chain of uh, Boeing, including 3D printing, is welcome to contact us. And on 14th, 15th, 16th, there is a U.S. Asia Business Forum in Los Angeles where the large business investors from USA are looking for investing in India. So anyone who's running short of funds wants to set up a factory, message for Colonel Kubair also. The funds are available. We have to just prepare a project report and uh, they will invite you only when the project is, uh, you know, cleared by us. So with that, I uh, would request to uh, Dr. John to take over the mic, please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... Wing Commander uh, Raman Surupiji for your uh, inputs and also the other dignitaries, uh, starting from uh, Dr. S. K. Vasudevan sir and Dr. Surinder Pal sir, and also uh, and also uh, Colonel uh, K. V. Kubair sir. Thank you so much for your inputs, and uh, I'm sure as a as a joint uh, effort, uh, since you are all a key respondent of uh, the 3D Graphy Advisory, I'm sure it will be an opportunity for us to set the the pathway going forward. Uh, from this event and also the inputs that we have been able to receive. From Just to interrupt you, Dr. John, Dr. Yes. Mr. Hari Kumar uh, had to leave. He was traveling. Yes. So he's not able to join from his mobile phone. So he just sent a message of inconvenience to us. He was supposed to speak, but he had to leave and he's traveling somewhere. So he sent a message of, you know, apologies to us. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so so much, sir. In gratitude. Thank you so much for his time and effort of being there and also being a part of this session. Thank you so much, sir, for your for your inputs and your information. Uh, so uh, there is one question which was posted by uh, Mr. Chandan Mishra, uh, Anil, uh, Dr. Anil, for you, and then we will take uh, we will go to the next speaker. I would request uh, Mr. Anthony uh, 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 Paul from uh, LNT De Defense to be ready with his presentation, so so that we can upload his uh, uh, and then he can start this presentation. So before that, uh, one question from Chandan, uh, uh, Dr. Anand, if you can just go to the q and area and there is the question posted there. Yeah, uh, I think the question is, uh, if you consider EBM, uh, which uses hot and vacuum process, is more closer to already proven uh, process. What prevents you from using? Uh, sir, uh, I think uh, EBM, uh, what is being referred is uh, electron beam uh, powder bed fusion process, I suppose. So I think uh, the machines available in India, uh, the sizes are very limited. Uh, I think uh, all are within uh, something like a 300 mm by 250 mm by 250 mm. So wa what uh, we are uh, thinking is uh, electron beam additive, which uses uh, wire as the input material. And uh, the sizes, what is capable of doing that is uh, about uh, 2 meter by 2 meter by 2 meter and uh, larger. So it is a size which prevents us from using this technology for our applications. Okay. Thank you so much, Doctor. Yeah. And now uh, may I request uh, Anthony uh, Paul to, uh, to start his presentation. Uh, uh, Hi, Dr. John. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible, Anthony. Thank and you, I hope my presentation is in full screen mode. So that is uh, no, I have, I have not able to see it, but if you can just uh, refresh it and then. Uh... <clears throat> Let me share it again. Just one moment. Sure. Is it visible now? Yeah, it is, uh, Anthony. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, good morning to all of you, to all the, uh, the chief guests uh, present today and to all the participants in the today's session. My name is Anthony. I head the Editor Manufacturing Center of Excellence at l and Defense. Uh, and today, the topic that I'm going to be discussing is regarding the necessity for technology diversity within Metal AM. So before we start, uh, let me give a quick uh, brief of Larson Dubro. Most of you will be well aware of this. LNT is the largest engineering, manufacturing, and technology company of India. We are established at a partnership firm in the year 1938, and thereafter we became a private limited and became public limited in 1950, and we were listed in the BSC in 1951. 
We are a professionally managed company with a group revenues uh, in the ballpark of around 20 billion US dollar and a market cap of about 25 billion US dollar in the year FY20. And we have a credit rating of AAA and with a stable uh, background. And as you can see from the screen, uh, LNT has multiple businesses that we are into and which we lead in. Uh, this includes construction, uh, process plant equipment, hydrocarbon engineering, power, metallurgical, material handling, defense, uh, shipbuilding, valves, uh, realty, technology services, etc. Because of this wide portfolio that we have of businesses, our requirements from additive manufacturing is also very diverse. Uh, you can look at the various scale uh, that you can see in heavy engineering. We are talking about thousands of ton and you know 500 ton equipment. And when you come into defense, uh, you're looking at parts which are a few grams and which are critical in, in its function. So this diversity is what is prompting my topic today regarding diversity in the technology when it comes to metal AM. And as you're well aware, LNT has set many records in the projects we have undertaken and in the products that we have delivered to customers in India and globally. And I will quickly move to LNT Defense. That's an uh, independent company that I am part of, uh, where we presently deal with guns, missiles, and armored systems. We also have a separate unit looking after weapon and engineering systems. We have military communication, shipbuilding, submarines, and underwater platforms. So we also uh, look at unmanned systems, both aerial, on ground, and on water, and underwater as well. So this at LND Defense itself is a very wide product portfolio, which we believe can benefit from additive manufacturing. At LND Defense, we have honed a skill in able to deliver to our customers complete end-to-end -end services. This includes design and engineering, prototyping, production, precision manufacturing, assembly integration testing, global sourcing for critical equipment and uh, you know components which are not available in India presently, a program, project, and product management, performance trials, and through life support for all the projects that we are on to. So just touching upon one specific basket of capabilities, which is precision manufacturing. Uh, we have multiple capabilities under this basket, including critical part manufacturing, covering machining, sheet metal, heat treatment, surface treatment, inspection, uh, joining uh, of the various metals and non-metallics also. We have uh, a dedicated composites facility and capability in-house, which we have developed uh, with support from our customers and, and our partners. We have uh, a complete setup for integration and validation of the equipment that we deliver to our customers and also that which we develop in-house. And we have a rigorous project management team who look after all the requirements and ensure it is completed on time and delivered ahead of schedule. In addition to all these capabilities, uh, since the last few years, we have now been looking at additive manufacturing to augment the capabilities that we are having for our own consumption and all which we can offer to our customers. So why are we looking at additive manufacturing at LNT? We have two particular uh, reasons. One is the design benefits that additive manufacturing offers. As LNT does build to spec uh, design and development of systems, subsystems, and system of systems for our customers. And we also develop systems in-house based on our assessment of what the market requires and what we believe will be a differentiation. Uh, there are a lot of benefits which additive manufacturing brings in this kind of an environment. We are able to come up with complex geometries which fulfill our you know, functional requirements. We are able to come up with performance optimization, again, leveraging the complex geometries that we can produce through additive manufacturing. This could mean being able to dissipate heat faster, being able to reduce the weight improve the endurance of the system, improve the rigidity so that you have better positioning in, in case of certain sensors and uh, equipment like that. We are looking at part consolidation uh, to help us to improve the reliability of the components and system that we supply to our customers and for the armed forces. And we are also now exploring multi-material parts which are done homogeneously instead of being fabricated or assembled thereafter. So all these capabilities which additive manufacturing 
uh, brings forward to LNT as a designer is tremendous. And we believe each of these capabilities will differentiate our products and what our customers will also develop and have it produced at LNT. The second aspect that we look at is the supply chain benefits, both to LNT and by LNT to our customers. Uh, we are looking at flexible and efficient production. And particularly, we are looking at a significantly shorter lead time. As Dr. Anil I had mentioned earlier, there is a significant reduction in lead time that we are getting with additive manufacturing. And this also translates to a lower inventory that our customers will have to hold. So you can print on demand and minimize the inventory that you need to hold and maintain at, at your end. And this flexibility means you can print many parts which are required of the same type, or you can uh, print dissimilar parts within the same batch. So that flexibility also improves the cost effectiveness and the lead time effectiveness. And certain technologies also uh, you know, permit you to do repair and feature addition. As we were discussing earlier, as Colonel Kuber mentioned, the MRO industry for defense aviation and for commercial aviation could definitely benefit from the repair function that additive manufacturing brings forward. The ability to repair a small feature of a part instead of discarding and making a part completely would bring tremendous cost benefits to the service provider. And we also believe uh, in being in the defense and aerospace sector, the the economies of scale and complexity also benefit, uh, bring the benefits of additive manufacturing to this particular industry. Because typically we are looking at smaller scale parts. We have a lot of prototyping which is done. We do that uh, especially at LNT. Once a prototyping is done, you typically have a small batch production and thereafter uh, a limited or mid series production. So additive manufacturing brings a lot of benefits in minimizing the tooling, uh, improving the lead times keeping the overall development cost down. Thereafter, uh, it also allows, as I mentioned in my uh, few slides before, it allows us as a designer to explore complex geometries to derive the maximum benefit. And this complexity does not add significant cost to our design or our production. So these two advantages are well suited for aerospace and defense, and we hope to leverage that to this full extent in, in, the, in the years to come. And I'd like to stress here, uh, again, as Colonel Kuber has mentioned, we are not looking at replacing traditional manufacturing or conventional manufacturing with AM. We are hoping to complement this with additive manufacturing because each technology and each type of uh, manufacturing process has its own benefits. So we will assess the, which is the most suitable process and we would like to take it forward. Uh, as Dr. Anil has also mentioned and what most of you would also be aware of, Along with the benefits of additive manufacturing, there are certain limitations which are far-reaching in some contexts. Uh, for example, in certain metal additive manufacturing and even polymer-based additive manufacturing, the variety of materials that you require to fulfill, a, let's say, a legacy component with the armed forces need may not be existing. So there is a necessity for us to look at AM equivalent part or a, a equivalent material or a substitute material which brings with it certain challenges in you know, validation, qualification, etc. The second challenge, again, which has been touched upon before, is the limited component size or complexity. You can either have a large component with less complexity or a small component with high complexity. At the moment, the market, the, the technology does not allow you to do both uh, e effectively. And this is primarily driven by the design of the equipment, which brings with it certain, you know, uh, build chambers for controlling the atmosphere inside the build process. And that limits the size of parts that you can make. And this is where we believe a big differentiation between uh, certain technologies in metal AM uh, come forward with respect to other technologies in metal AM. And most of them have some challenges with respect to porosity. And if it's a hot process, we have warpage. And because it's a layer by layer process, we also have some surface roughness constraints. And typically, majority of the parts which are additively manufactured require some level of post-processing, be it heat treatment, surface treatment, or machining. There are very few parts which are done presently, at least in India, where the part goes as is for end use. So there is still some improvement that we can do, either in the technology or in the way we deal with the part once it's done with printing. And of course, there are certain geometric and orientation constraints, which I believe a lot of improvements are coming 
with uh, support free uh, manufacturing possible in metal additive manufacturing especially in dmlm and ebm few other constraints uh, such as anisotropy and uh, a lower fatigue life are also challenges that we see and again each metal additive manufacturing technology has varying degrees of anisotropy and fatigue life constraints and uh, similarly some of the challenges that we have faced thus far in the industry are the high cost of materials especially powders and the high cost of imported machines and we believe with with new players coming in india such as intech mas etc we hope this dynamics would change and we would have most more cross com- competitive solutions available locally so while we were looking at additive manufacturing for our uh, you know for our lmts for it we looked at all the technologies available and of course i've listed the broad baskets which are showcased here and we have taken a you know a conscious decision to focus on metal am we have many service bureaus in india who are offering polymer based solutions so lmt's focus is on metal additive manufacturing and we are looking at the various technologies under the metal additive manufacturing so a few of the technologies i will cover here because uh, maybe it's good to refresh on that the first is powder bed fusion where we are building parts layer by layer by depositing a thin layer of metal powder this is fused either using a laser as a source or an an electron beam as a source so this layer by layer process allows you to create complex parts with or without supports depending on the technology that you use now the challenges of this particular process are that you know you are constrained by the build chamber size you cannot build parts beyond let's say 400 by 400 by 400 in india of course globally there are some companies who are building bigger up to a meter size parts but in india presently i think the limit is around 450 linear dimension and we hope this will increase further but the advantage this technology brings is that you are able to get higher resolution or accuracy and higher complexities and between laser and electron beam uh, electron beam does bring certain advantages because it's a uh, control vacuum environment and it also has a elevated temperature in the chamber so that you have lower residual stresses which are coming through so you have less warpage and less uh, propensity for uh, fracture happening uh just some clips here to show the uh, process of additive manufacturing through dmlm and ebm the second set of technology that we are looking at are direct energy deposition Uh, which typically use uh, wire feedstock but is also possible with powder feedstock uh, these are uh, generally larger build sizes uh, if you look at wire arc additive manufacturing which is robotic welding but instead of joining parts you're depositing uh, material it allows you to have a geometry which is much bigger than 1 meter there are definite examples globally where wire arc additive manufacturing have created propellers for naval applications they have uh, produce uh, large components for ship uh, structures so these go beyond the sizes that are possible with powder bed fusion and these allow you to create free form parts which are not bound by the you know the the control environment that you require inside the chambers of dmlm and ebm however it brings with it certain uh, deficiencies such as a higher surface roughness higher distortions that are visible and the necessity for more post processing thereafter so one clip here shows the uh, filler wire or the welding wire being melted and deposited and creating the the build on a, a substrate that is placed before on the right hand side of course you see an electron beam additive manufacturing which is something similar to vam but instead of welding uh, instead of melting the metal wire with uh, the arc we are actually using an electron beam to do this and it is done in a controlled environment within a vacuum chamber so both of these components are able to produce much larger parts than what can be done in powder bed fusion but again two different approaches one which is free form and which can go to a much larger dimensions and one which is having uh, better properties because you are eliminating contamination by encasing the entire build into a vacuum chamber of course there are also uh, many technologies in dd which are now using powder as feedstock one is lens which is laser engineered near, near ship where the jet of powder which comes out is melted prior to deposition through a laser or a, any other you know a plasma and the, of course this is a hot process 
And you also have kinetic fusion where you have uh, accelerated powder, which is in, impacted on a prior substrate and allowing it to create part without a thermal uh, constraint. Uh, of course, the densities that you get with each of these parts are different. And the strength that you get also are different depending on whether you're using powder bed fusion, uh, DED process with wire or DED process uh, powder. And most of them would require heat treatment thereafter. So while we were looking at the various technologies available and looking at what our requirements are for LNT as a company with the various businesses that we have and the product portfolios that we presently hold, uh, we try to assess it across multiple uh, Access in the spider chart that we have over here. So we evaluated them against complexity. We evaluated them against accuracy, surface finish, overall cost saving with respect to what you need to spend to build up the you know, near net shape part and what you need to mention thereafter. We are looking at the amount of material wastage or material utilization, the post processing requirement, the me mechanical properties achieved during the printing process. Of course, you can amend, modify that through heat treatment thereafter. The flexibility of the platform to able to address different part types, different part sizes, and also different materials. And also the maximum volume that is available through each of these technologies. And in addition to that, uh, we also looked at the typical material availability in powder feedstock, wire feedstock, etc. Material compatibility based on the, the technologies possible. The material cost, we all know the powder which is primarily imported in India right now is substantially higher than the other powder, uh, other materials available for it to manufacture. We also have looked at the potential for material contamination during the, uh, the deposition process. And lastly, we also looked at the ability to do multi-material composition for a part to make it uh, a single part with multiple materials at different regions. So you get, get functional grading. So what we found that if you look at the entire basket of uh, products or uh, the applications that are available in India and which will what will require going forward, one metal AM technology is not able to fulfill that completely. So you will require multiple technologies to address specific applications which derive those requirements. For example, if you require a very large part, let's say a propeller of 1.2 meter diameter, as is shown under the VAM heading, you will need to go with VAM or DED for that matter. But if you need very precise components, which are much smaller in size, you will need to go for DMLM or EBM. And between DMLM and EBM, of course, you still need to look at what are the surface roughnesses that you will get, what are the accuracies that you'll get, what are the you know bill layer heights that you can get, so that you know you look at your end productivity. And you also need to compare it with the traditional manufacturing and uh, you know conventional production technologies to see whether additive is able to fulfill your requirements completely or do you still need to do machining thereafter because when you add machining over additive manufacturing in some cases it doesn't become cost effective so either we need to eliminate the need for machining and subsequent post processing or we need to find that there is significant cost reduction in additive manufacturing so that the net cost is lower through the additive group and of course, we also have challenges to what materials are readily available, both globally and in India. So each process and each type of feedstock has certain constraint. For example, in DMLM, which is laser powder bed fusion, there is a larger variety of met metals available, but still there are some exotic materials which are not available and even conventional materials which have not been developed by the OEMs because they are focusing on higher performance material. So, a one-is-to-one -one substitution for legacy component with the armed forces might require. Presently, it's not possible unless we substitute with the AM-ready material. Similarly, uh, for EBM, there are, again, very li limited materials available uh, because the technology is uh, more niche, and uh, which is one of the reasons we are considering wire-based deposition at LNT because we believe that increases the spectrum of materials that we can consider for additive manufacturing. So if you look at all the assessment that LNT has done and what is available in the market in terms of technology, in terms of equipment, in terms of support, in terms of materials, uh, we will go with a, a broad basket of technologies as shown here. And as you can see clearly, each of them have 
different degrees of you know excellence in terms of part performance cost or the build size that you can get or the lot size you can build at one time so powder bed fusion which is more dominant in india and globally for metal additive manufacturing of course has a higher performance but it also comes with a higher cost and smaller lot sizes dd comes with uh, bigger sizes but lower cost but uh, you also have slower uh, you know surface uh, you have poorer surface roughness which is achievable and you have a lot of new technologies like material jetting binder jetting which have been established they are in nascent stages and they have been established right now a lot of industries are pursuing it a lot of companies are also putting effort into it but they are yet to see the level of adoption as powder bed fusion presently so what we have done is at lnt we have looked at both powder bed fusion with laser and powder bed fusion with electron beam we have established a facility which will house both these technologies at lnt in coimbatore of course the sizes are smaller but we'll have a wide array of materials and the differences and the usps of each of these technologies will allow us to fulfill specific requirements based on the application we are also looking at ded as i said primarily because a lot of our businesses and our customers require parts which are bigger than 400 mm so it is not possible with powder bed fusion so we are looking at a, a wire deposition or a powder nozzle but our initial focus is in wire deposition using wire arc and through ebam Uh, electron beam in a vacuum chamber so as you can see here the dimensions that we're talking about are 1 meter and beyond and they allow you to create large parts at much lower rates uh, lower costs and with a higher productivity than what is possible with powder bed fusion so with all these technologies that we have identified now we will be leveraging on the capabilities we already have at lnt such as the uh, design prowess the optimization capabilities and, and the engineering uh, you know skill set that we have we have also established multiple post processing capabilities and these are qualified and validated be it for heat treatment surface treatment or machining we are also uh, well aware with the testing and qualification requirements as a, as a required by our end customers and the authorities so we are well versed with that in addition to that we are now as i mentioned we have added an in house additive manufacturing facility and we are bringing on board multiple metal em technologies so the powder bed fusion technologies are what we are procuring the dd technologies are what we are developing in house so uh, during the prior discussions there was a there was a call to have startups in india and to have technology developed in india i think lnt would be one of those champions for additive manufacturing as we go forward so we are supporting the ecosystem here both academia and in startup domain and we hope together that we can bring the am ecosystem in india to a much higher level we will also be offering design for additive manufacturing leveraging all the ex, uh, you know benefits that we discussed uh, we will be offering material characterization handling as are required for our own captive requirements and also for our customers and as i mentioned before since there are limited materials available especially for legacy parts and for niche applications we will also be supporting material development and parameter development for each of these technologies that you're bringing on board to summarize uh, i would like to say that lnt's point of view is that additive manufacturing has unshackled the designer in defining what is possible though we have expanded our capabilities in cnc machining in casting in composite manufacturing there were certain challenges in doing certain applications with these existing technologies and we believe additive will open up a lot more capabilities from us to uh improve the performance to reduce the cost and to take down the lead time and as i stated earlier uh no one technology in metal am is able to fulfill all the requirements of the various applications that, that are coming forward from defense and aerospace from automotive from medical from general industry so therefore it is important that we look at the various advantages and constraints of each of these uh, technologies and try to find the the most suited or the best suited technology for a particular application so what at lnd we are trying not to force fit am nor are we trying to force fit a specific am process to a particular application but we are trying to find the best fit and we believe this is essential for us to fully leverage am in india with that i would like to conclude my session i will take any questions or any feedback please thank you thank you and uh, um, thanks to lnt and thanks to my friend from lnt
द एंटायर इंडियन गवर्नमेंट एडमायर्स एल एन टीज कंट्रीब्यूशन एरो स्पेस डिफेंस एंड स्पेस आई हैव टू क्विक क्वेश्चन नंबर वन हाउ डू वी गोइंग फॉरवर्ड रिड्यूज द गैप ऑफ ह्यूमन रिसोर्स शॉर्टेज इन थ्री डी प्रिंटिंग एंड इफ एल एन टी इज डूइंग समथिंग सेकेंडली इन केस यू हैव एडवाइज टू द गवर्नमेंट टू बूस्ट द एक्सपोर्ट फ्रॉम इंडिया बिकॉज इंडिया इज नॉट अ बिग मार्केट एज ऑफ नाउ i believe but, companies like boeing lockheed martin how does indian 3d printing companies like you and other small msme become part of the global supply chain in other areas non defense sector also three bullet points on ex- export potential from india for rest of the world thank you sir uh, uh thank you uh, vinkam and sorry so the first point is regarding increasing the capability in india for it to manufacturing i i think we have a lot of pioneers in india we have already discussed few wipro intech mas there are many others who have come in there are a lot of academia all who are also doing lot of research on additive manufacturing metal and non metallic also and i believe industrial uh, partners partnership with academia and with the startup and with you know the entrepreneurs who are trying to bring am into india that will definitely help the ecosystem in growing forward so as bigger companies and uh, as bigger companies such as lnt and the others come in into am the adoption also would improve like i said this is not only defense and aerospace we are looking at we are looking at heavy engineering we are looking at power we are looking at valves business we are looking at construction business so adoption by the larger players will definitely bring in the interest in the in the market and also would have people step up to fulfill their requirements and what we are doing is we are partnering with some academia iits for example to develop some of these technologies in india so that it's a ip development in india and which we hope will bring the cost down and also improve the adoption in india with regards to export uh, i think few of the requirements which are mandated by companies who require 3d printed parts for aerospace and defense are one meeting all the quality standards and qualification requirements so i i do understand that a lot of these companies in india are already qualified to supply to them and more are on the way uh, once they get their hands hands dirty on this technology so a collective effort to encourage participation would also mean that they are well equipped to be qualified when the time is right and lastly to improve export we also need to look at what is the cost to produce this part in india so the cost of the machine the cost of the powder whether it's imported or local would dictate the price that you can offer to your customers globally of course this is a machine intensive costing it's there are though there are many post processing steps to be done where india could be cost competitive with respect to uh, western western nations the significantly higher price of material and, and the machines make it lopsided the costing will be lopsided for for us so as long as we can bring the net cost down through machine cost reduction powder cost reduction and possibly the technology being locally available i'm sure we can be com- competitive but one part i'm very sure is that the level of innovation and the amount of technical prowess that we have in india is is definitely a benefit for us and it will it's a usp for us to offer we know that from the various you know forays we have, we have done what the the advances that isro has done developing so many capabilities in such a short time at and such a lower cost than the western nations i am certain that we can do the same with the additive manufacturing industry as well so these are my my inputs to your queries uh, thank you sir um, since the um, uh, indian next budget speech would be getting ready by now i would request you and other uh, big players what we call as the bombay club companies tatas and lnts and mahindras we would like to send a set of recommendations to the government in the next budget especially for the 3d printing if we can you know get your email id and get in touch with your jayant patil and other people also we would like to have some kind of inputs given to the government what india uh, budget should have especially for some uh, solace for the 3d printing to boost the industry and get more inputs for that so uh, i will get in touch with you directly and also through dr shibu john and uh, i am actually ex viproite so i did start the vipro hydraulics business long back 
So we'll get Fantastic. connected again and then we'll have some boost for the industry. And I'm sure in the Defense Expo in the month of March in Ahmedabad, we'll have some companies displaying their products in the 3D printing also. Thank you, sir. Definitely. Look forward to your communication. Over to Dr. Shibu John. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Anthony, and uh, with the insightful uh, presentation that you shared. Also, because now that you there is a, a, a huge buffet of uh, solutions that you are set to offer, uh, also in the many many time also shipbuilding. Interestingly, the next event that we will be post, uh, hosting is on shipbuilding and uh, also for shipyards to also participate and various other OEMs to join. So I think there's a lot of promise uh, that we see in 3D technology and the way you actually setting it up, and also more private players coming into the space will mean that uh, we are here to for a long run. I'm sure a pattern needs to be designed for more startups as uh, in the morning also uh, uh, Dr. SK Vasudevan sir also mentioned. More startups coming into this foray will also mean that we are igniting more fuel for uh, respondents and investors to come in on board uh, collectively and work to, uh, towards you know setting up a, a benchmark for 3D technology consortium in the country. So that's exactly what we are doing in a way uh, to also ensure that you know how we can activate that business eventually going forward so now take let me take the opportunity thank you both both gentlemen and now let me take the opportunity to introduce you to uh, uh, mr a uh, manjunath actually a group director with uh, drdo uh, who will uh, be sharing his insights and he's also a material scientist and also somebody who has done some great work uh, uh, you know with, under his leadership uh, uh, manjunath uh, over to you and i'm sure it will be a great insight for everybody to be updated of. Thank you so much. Right, sir. Thank you very much. I'll just see the screen, sir, one second. Yeah, please. You're able please. to see the screen, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, sir. You can start. Thank you. Uh, very good afternoon to all the uh, dignitaries and all the delegates. Uh, let me thank uh, Shibu, uh, John, and also Mr. Ashok Verma for introducing me to this August gathering. and. Uh, uh, dignitaries who are uh, talking on uh, additive manufacturing. Uh, let me start my presentation with uh, a quote from Dr. Abdul Kalam. Uh, he says that without your involvement, you cannot succeed. And if you are involved, you cannot fail. So with this, I'll uh, go ahead. So let me present about uh, uh, my um, topic is on additive manufacturing in the defense applications. Uh, though DRDO is, uh, has got more than 50 labs, uh, I am representing one of the labs uh, that is gas turbine research establishment, which is basically working on uh, design and development of uh, gas turbine engines for the military applications, basically. Uh, so with this, I'll go ahead and just give you a brief about what are the activities GTR has been doing with respect to the manufacturing of the gas turbines and where we are using these additive manufacturing and how it is helping us in uh, overcoming all the problems. And uh, I was happy to note that Dr. Anil, uh, what he presented, were similar lines. I was thinking DRD on ISRO is looking at similar lines when he presented the first slide itself. He was talking about the uh, definition of uh, uh, additive manufacturing. So this is the outline. I'll just go through the introduction and maybe classifications. Both the previous speakers have been uh, covering a lot on these processes. And I like to highlight slightly on the uh, capabilities of the powder and the wire process, which is of uh, uh, main uh, discussions, and also some of the application areas in the aero engines, which we have been exploring, and few uh, case studies, uh, which I have uh, come across and used uh, additive manufacturing extensively. And then I will conclude with my uh, requirements uh, in this area, which is uh, lacking. Uh, so I was talking about the introduction. I seen that uh, this is the first introduction was given by Dr. Anil. He talks of the ASTM standards, so I don't want to repeat it. Even pictures were also matching with what he presented. So I will not cut down this part and just like go through this uh, flowchart, which says that uh, a lot of work has to be done in background. It looks like you just feed in some drawing and a part comes out. But uh, it is like a lot of background work has to be done with respect to the CAD model and then you do the uh, design for IT manufacturing using various softwares uh, to understand uh, the support requirements and uh, how the part will build and also the post-processing requirement, which is also is very important when the additive manufacturing is concerned. So with that, I'll just go to the uh, various uh, processes which is covered under additive manufacturing. Uh, basically, I would classify them as uh, metal parts which are uh, indirectly made using additive manufacturing is one way of classifying. And other method is to say there are some metal parts which are directly built. 
and uh, both uh, lnt uh, person and also dr anil were talking about uh, uh, the certification parts which is main concern for uh, our aviation industry uh, where we where was a manned person is there the certification becomes critical and it has to go through the uh, certifying authorities which is uh, not happy of putting these parts just like that without uh, extensive data to be generated and standards to be built up which is of main concern in both this uh, uh, application both aerospace and aerogen applications so i learned get into the details it is the additive manufacture part and uh, many people who are attending uh, learning about additive manufacturing are concerned or aware of this uh, words which we use uh, for example slm means people understand selective laser melting and i would classify them as solid based systems powder based systems or liquid based systems in the powder bed it covers the electron beam and laser melting and fusion metal deposition there are the solid contents about the wire related things where uh, extensive discussion was there so let me go ahead with uh, my i am being basically in a mechanical engineer for applications rather than getting into the uh, details of the metallurgy which is also an important part so let me give some glimpses of uh, where i have been using this uh, examples of additive manufacturing uh, before i go there i was just looking at uh, the two main um, aspects of using both the powder as well as the wire uh, and i find that this usage of wire in the additive manufacturing is not uh, extensively been explored i would like you to uh, have a look at this comparison where we look at powder bed uh, there is a constraint in the size of the parts that can be built and when the wire spare thing there is a slightly bigger parts can be built and usually in wire we definitely need the post processing and sometimes in powder bed you may not require the post processing and near net shaping can be done using wire parts are near to the final product in case of powder bed and here the maximum utilization of material is used that is 90% of the material is utilization is takes place whereas the powder we may have to uh, reuse the powder and uh, make sure you uh, it is economic and the speeds in case of wire is very high they were able to deposition rates are higher so that way it has got some advantages so this is the comparison between powder and the wire now let me give some of the uh, application areas uh, in the aero engine where we have been exploring and this is the uh, rapid prototype technologies which we have been exploring and these are the application areas in the aero engine specifically which have been uh, looking at we have been using uh, for visualization of the models the designs because we are in the design and the uh, manufacturing activities and we also look at the assembly trials where we need to do some uh, new parts develop the uh, interfacing uh, requirements and even design people use this for the flow isolation uh, which is very extensively used in our r&d in our uh, laboratories and also some tools and fixtures are also extensively used so main concept in our um, uh, now the trend on aero engine is uh, to look at the uh, by to fly ratio uh, which is nothing but the amount of raw material you use and the raw weight of the final component which goes inside the part so this is very important concept which is now uh, driving the aero industry uh, keeping this in mind additive manufacturing will play a very important role where it can uh, bring down this uh, amount of material which in uh, 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 what is it you can say it's not been used completely in the actual part which is going into the flying of the engine so this is a uh, very important concept where additive manufacturing plays a very important role so let me give some uh, a few uh, examples uh, one is for the design visualization model so we had one uh, uh, gearbox uh, casing uh, which was to be uh, newly designed and we have been doing a lot of uh, testing and this was to be uh, manufactured and uh, we were discussion with the vendors so we thought we'll build up an uh, uh, anti manufactured part which will be easy really for the communication breakfast break, break. Time. and also uh, abhi, be, abhi to mera zarurat nahi hai na isme and uh, also the process planning uh, it will help the uh, manufacturing person to look at the process planning activities and uh, if we build this in a yes, uh, system aur to koi sawal puchhe na sare sawal bhi the beta two days per one part <laughs> and uh, this is the size of the part envelope 
and got CAD modeling took some almost okay, two months. Okay, I got. And we took a time of around fourteen months if you have to build the actual part. But this was built in. अच्छा ये जो इनका presentations हैं और इसका video recording आपके पास रहेगा क्या? The uh, full okay. scale model was used uh, as a design communication okay. model thanks, thanks, thanks. as well as for the tool for the process planning. So this is one uh, application uh, where we had done the design visualization models for the gearbox case model. So similar lines, uh, we have the uh, uh, there is a combustor in the uh, gas turbine engine uh, where the flow of the uh, fuel and how the combustion takes place was to be visualized. And the we wanted to do the uh, uh, a transparent RP model was made, which was used to do the uh, water flow analysis, and we could see the uh, uh, study the flow analysis using this sanity manufactured part. And usually the actual part will take almost uh, traditional manufacturing will take almost six months to take make one, and uh, we used it for a, within a month to do this part. A lot of visualization studies with a lot of different parameters were done, and. <coughs> help the design person to conclude on the design areas so this is one more uh, interesting application we had using rp uh, then uh, another example in the manufacturing aspect uh, what i wanted to tell was uh, uh, this is one of the aero engine if you look at the front portion we have the uh, low pressure compressor and uh, in the front of the aero uh, low pressure compressor we have an uh, it casing a stationary part which we call as inlet casing and uh, this was a new design uh, for uh, our uh, new aero engine application which was a uh, unmanned combat aircraft engine applications which is strategic and this is a new design which had got some inner uh, ring and an outer casing and it had got some around uh, 15 uh, aerofoil studs which were required to be welded on both sides so 15 and it comes to around 30 welds to be done and we were uh, planning to make it come the first time right so we had a lot of uh, preparatory work which we did and this component was made up of titanium so here how do we uh, uh, used uh, to manufacturing was uh, the constraint was in the form of welding you know, the 15 studs so before the parts could be made we wanted to identify the uh, uh, suitable welding torch Uh, and also have a feel of the simulation welding for the welder so we just thought we can make some rp parts uh, simulating similar condition for the welder the constraints because the gap was almost around 70 60 mm in this and we wanted to put a new special torch with the filler wire using a tip weld uh, it was really interesting for the uh, welder to get really trained on this kind of simulation work and finally with this experience uh, the welder was able to do the all the welds and uh, we were able to realize this uh, inlet fan casing uh, in the first time right with minimum distortions which was expected with additional uh, machining so this is how the uh, activity was used for uh, making the actual inlet fan casing uh, similar requirement was on the uh, bottom left hand corner if you could see a rp model uh, this is a cross section of an uh, disc actually there is a weld coming here using electron beam weld and the beam exits and it could damage this part so we usually used to protect it by providing a uh, beam arrester and this uh, beam arrester has to after welding had to be taken out and this is the gap that was existing uh, between these two parts so this to visualize and also to have a feel like what is the part how it is going to stay there and how to come out of this gap we made this rp model and it was very much useful and we could design the fixtures and toolings with this help so this kind of application was really helping the manufacturing part to ease our life rather than uh, making a, a very uh, gross mistakes on the actual parts this is one of the case studies and next coming to the application in the uh, our assembly integration uh, we were doing a uh, small gas turbine engine uh, for an uav in application and uh, this has been indigenized and there was a fuel system uh, in the uav part and uh, this was first initially done on a uh, portable table uh, once the uh, control laws were uh, fixed we wanted to go ahead and fix that part on to the engine uh, and before the parts were getting manufactured uh, there are other uh, uh, pipelines and uh, electric instrumentation harnesses which need to be done during the instrumentation integration of the engine and this part we wanted the assembly people to get a feel of it in the presence of the fuel system 
So, so we made in a, a RP part and uh, with different parts. We can see on the uh, right hand uh, top corner. There's a different parts which are made and just probably assembled it here. And it was a hydraulic pump and just we fixed it onto the uh, engine carcass during the dummy building of the engine. And uh, people are uh, doing all the routings, harnessing, instrumentations. So this way, uh, we were saving time until the uh, actual part of the fuel system was coming. Meanwhile, we were also giving a lot of feedbacks to the designers, uh, which were uh, getting clear, like where are the uh, fouling and routing can happen, what issues will come up. So this facilitates uh, the uh, remediate uh, modifications in the, uh, with respect to the uh, functionality betterment. And also, uh, the uh, when you're going to the getting it manufactured from the uh, vendors or industry partners, uh, this kind of uh, real estimation of the time and the cost also comes because it doesn't have any interpretation errors and it's very clear how the part looks like and it gets a visual uh, uh, clarity with respect to part that has to be done. So this is one of the uh, applications with respect to the uh, design assembly integration trials. And uh, one more interesting uh, uh, case study what I want to delve upon with respect to uh, defense application is we were working on a, uh, a sub-project from our uh, sister concern, uh, which was working on making a battle tank. And uh, they were making a 1,500 HP engine, and we had outsourced making of a uh, turbocharger because it was similar to a small gas turbine without the combustor. So if you can see the cross-section uh, here, these are other parts which are all uh, cast parts, CMO cast, inverse uh, castings. But uh, if you see the main turbine and the compressor, uh, they were made up of nickel and uh, uh, titanium alloy. And uh, this we wanted to realize it earlier, but finding a casting of titanium was really difficult. So manual to save time, we were uh, told to make these two parts from additive manufacturing. So we, these two parts, uh, the uh, both the compressor and uh, which is made up of TA64 and the turbine wheel, which was made up of 7 and 8, were built from the additive manufacturing in our uh, lab. And uh, another requirement was there are the shaft which was required, which was joining the, both the parts. And it was required to join an, uh, a stainless steel uh, shaft to the uh, turbine wheel. And this we had done with rotor friction welding. So you know, this opens up another uh, gamut of area where we need to explore and study uh, joining of additive manufactured parts. So here we did the, um, uh, if we just play the video, if that is a friction welding, which we have done. And this is the first time I would say we had explored welding of an additive manufactured part with an broad uh, uh, alloy of steel. So this dissimilar joint uh, was done and uh, we could study the uh, tensile properties and we found that, uh, so this you can see this is the part which is welded here and this is how the welded part looks like uh, with the shaft and the turbine wheel and uh, we had done plenty of uh, studies like tensile test, bend test and torsional test and found they are meeting the uh, requirements of the uh, almost equivalent to the parent metal strength. But they are slightly lower. What we see in the properties, uh, they are basically better than the cast parts and lower than that of the forged parts. And somewhere in between they lie. But it is uh, making suitable requirements and we were able to uh, put this IT manufactured part in our uh, first turbocharger and a rig. And we were able to run it uh, for uh, 70,000 RPM for almost an hour. And we accumulated around 8 hours. And uh, in spite of that, we checked and there are no internal defects or any external defects which are found inside these parts. So even though the uh, testing was done and uh, with these time constraints, we were able to prove the designs. Uh, that way, we had used this IIT manufacturer in one of these applications. So that was one more uh, case study which I wanted to show uh, that it was also contributing somewhere to the uh, army in uh, indirect way. Then this is the facility which we had and it is almost, uh, we were uh, established this metal rapid prototyping system somewhere in 1998 and um, Mr. Dr. U. Chandrasekhar was the one who had initiated this activity. He is now um, with uh, Wipro. Then uh, one more application uh, when we look at this is the rapid manufacturing. So this is the uh, utilize, direct utilization of the additive, additive processed parts of the component 
uh, which gives us uh, a feel of the visualization. You can realize them quickly and uh, maybe it will be suitable for limited batch productions and when using in the uh, R&D environment, but not into the production. And uh, as I was telling and stressing more again that uh, um, it requires a lot of standardization with respect to the Semilac certification or DGQA certification. So, and uh, there are no standards available. We have been creating our own standards like what Dr. Anil was telling with respect to number of tests, uh, the material uh, testing, uh, the tensile properties. We need to generate plenty of data and uh, even uh, many other uh, uh, people in this area are looking into this, but we need to put this acceptance standards in place at the earliest if it has to find a place in the actual engine. And um, one of the examples which people have been quoting for uh, in additive manufacturing has been uh, use of uh, used by uh, G, where they are trying to con uh, use this additive manufacturing of a fuel atomizer, which has got many number of part count, and uh, the aim is to reduce the part counts. And we were uh, we tried this in our own uh, way, and we were able to reduce the part counts reduction uh, to one from sixteen parts. Uh, if you can see the cross section here, there are the small components, it's called the pintle and so many other assemblies uh, which go into this part. And uh, the uh, build uh, uh, supports uh, were uh, required many number of uh, iterations before we could do. And this main aim is to reduce the weight and thereby uh, make the thrust to weight ratio of the engine better. So this is our way, and yes, we were able to do it in a uh, shorter period, but we are trying to try to put it in the engine rigs now. So this testing is under progress. So we may get a, a quick reply telling that we have been successful in this. We'll come back to you. And uh, uh, some discussion uh, from both the previous speakers were on um, wire uh, additive manufacturing. I am uh, basically a, a person who has been using electron beam welding for a long period and almost 20 years of experience in electron beam welding. So I was more fascinated uh, when we found that the electron beam is being used to using wire in the IIT manufacturing. And uh, I would like to say that uh, the first machine is in uh, LPSC uh, Bangalore, uh, which has purchased this machine with the wire additive manufacturing uh, feature. And uh, this basically, uh, it's basically the electron beam, which is used as the source. And we are uh, coaxial, uh, a wire is coming down and beam melts it and deposits in the form of layers. So this is uh, now uh, you being extensively used in many features and applications. Uh, basically, it is used to uh, build new parts or also to add on the new features on existing parts. And also for uh, main importantly, the uh, repair of the parts. Uh, so I just listed a few advantages. Uh, the EBM uh, process offers two advantages over the other feature deposition process. It has got high deposition rates. It's almost uh, nine kgs per hour, which can uh, be demonstrated and with good results with the values and uh, properties of the mechanical properties. And also the uh, uh, deposition takes place in a uh, very high vacuum most to 10 to the power of minus 4 uh, millibars and uh, this is very good for reactive materials like titanium which is a boss and uh, this is more important factor uh, for the most aero engine as well as aerospace applications which has to be uh, extensively explored. Uh, main disadvantages is the availability of the equipment and cost is also one of the um, requirements and size of the chamber uh, can also uh, limit the application of the components in the aero engine. So this is the uh, uh, advantages and uh, GTRE, uh, DRDO is in the process. We have placed order for an electron beam welding machine and uh, we will have definitely the uh, wire additive feature in this machine and it can be capable of the building up around 300 mm diameter at a height of 300 mm. So this will be, we wanted to explore for many number of applications in the engine. And uh, this just pictures, uh, just indicates the uh, add-on features which can be done on a forging. Imagine you have a forging and you wanted a slightly shortage of this part and you have a bigger diameter to make this external feature. Uh, this can be used as an add-on feature and it can be machined. And as you can see, the process in wire uh, manufacturing is not so fine. It's very coarse. Definitely it requires a lot of machining activities and post-processing with respect to the heat treatment also. 
and uh, this is one of the application which uh, I'm, i feel that uh, lpsc and isro is exploring to do the gas portals and uh, i was also a part of making joining these uh, gas portals so this pictures just show how the uh, cubics uh, cubico cuboids uh, were built in uh, uh, using a wire additive manufacturing and metal was uh, basically titanium 64 and we extracted many number of samples and did lot of microstructure studies which i'm not presenting here but uh, we found that uh, they have good very good properties have been obtained and uh, this can we need to generate more data and uh, then we'll be able to use it in the real applications of the components so plenty of work has been done with respect to the microstructure uh, the heat treatment process and post processing also for the wire energy part and uh, well coming to the uh, uh, very important part of the gas turbine uh, is the high pressure and the low pressure turbine blades in the gas turbine uh, is just a picture from the net which i didn't want to show my engines uh, or our engines rather so this is the high pressure turbine blades and this is the low pressure turbine blades and uh, this high pressure turbine blades uh, they are basically investment cast parts uh, they are made from uh, they call uh, equiaxed uh, blades cast blades or directionally solidified uh, cast blades so these two uh, technologies are somewhat existing in our country and uh, people like uh, midani and um, dmrl are taking some initiatives and working on it but then the future requirements of this engine and blades were the requirement this is to be indianized the complete the blade is not made in india i have to say it's completely been uh, uh, exported uh, imported rather and uh, this uh, critical part it's the one which is uh, exposed to high temperatures and high pressures and uh, it has got plenty of technologies with respect to uh, laser drilling either on the blade or uh, three feet grinding of these uh, uh, for tree uh, locking blade and uh, thermal barrier coating plenty number of applications so while this uh, single crystal uh, casting of this uh, turbine blade is been explored by my our sister concern uh, we were given the mandate to uh, develop the uh, other machining activities after the casting is available so we were not uh, having the casting readily to go ahead and do some uh, studies on the machining part so we made these turbine blades in house from the uh, powder metallurgy uh, additive manufacturing using laser uh, beds and uh, laser bed process and we started working on uh, the drilling and this uh, machining uh, design of the fixtures toolings so that we get a first hand uh, technology feel before the actual blades of the castings are delivered to gtri as a uh, lead through we wanted to start working on it so we have been doing plenty of work on this that is how it was used for this purpose and uh, coming to the most uh, critical part which we are looking at in the uh, future is uh, using uh, this uh, to replace the nickel based alloy low pressure turbine blades with uh, titanium aluminate intermetallics so this uh, has got better properties as comparable properties with nickel based alloys Uh, but they reduce the weight by 50% so this is a major uh, uh, area which we are concerned now and we are concentrating to work on and uh, this has been demonstrated by another engine houses in the world and uh, this technology is what is uh, uh, crunch there uh, if i have to uh, i'll just brief you what is the background uh, basically the machine manufacturer uh, made this part and uh, it was made from titanium aluminum 
later the engine house used these parts they were successful and uh, in order to prevent this technology going out to other engine houses uh, the oem purchased this company manufacturing uh, equipment manufacturer and that way the technology is now held with only one oem so this uh, we are trying to find out how the uh, equipment can be brought into india and how will be able to process titan aluminate intermetallics in india uh, we have very few machines which uh, process titan aluminate using electron beam uh, melting technology uh, that is uh, now been explored uh, with iisc is building a machine and there are a few machines in the country but they don't have uh, the capability to process titan aluminate they can only process ti64 so this is a crunch uh, which we are trying to work on uh, so this is a very important area where uh, we are trying to see how to seek help from the academics as well as from the other industries so with that uh, go to another application uh, for the future applications gtre or drd was looking at uh, making a fifth generation aircraft uh, engines which we call it as uh, um, amka aircraft engines it is advanced medium combat aircraft engines and here the latest technology is to be used or uh, something called a blisk which earlier uh, it used to be a disc and with a blade uh, which would do different parts and the blade used to fix there and now the future requirement is to make a blisk which is called a bladed disc and uh, once this is integral part it becomes integral part the blade and the disc and uh, this is a eurojet uh, fighter uh, um, fan which was using three stages of blisk and main crunch behind making the blisk is not an issue uh, once the engine has been running some damages come on to the blades and uh, you cannot throw out the whole blisk it has to be repaired and reused this repair technology is where additive manufacturing comes in in the form of laser engineered net shaping where we deposit uh, the blades where the part has broken down we deposit the powder and again we build the blades and again it needs to use the adaptive manufacturing and machining capabilities to recover the uh, same profile and the positional tolerance which is uh, uh, a mammoth task to do when you have a blisk uh, this is where we are looking at the future uh, for the uh, um, additive manufacture application well uh, uh, i was talking about these uh, visualizations uh, even the root details of the turbine blade which is very critical for us we are looking at and uh, the floor details also was used uh, using this uh, polymer based additive manufacturing parts and um, to conclude before that i would like to talk about this electron beam melting technology uh, this uh, process only can process the titanium aluminum that is why this uh, equipment is getting more prominence uh, it can process ti64 ti64 can be processed with laser also but coming to titan aluminum it needs electron beam melting only so this is one main reason uh, why this uh, electron beam melting uh, equipment is getting a lot of uh, prominence and uh, uh, the high speed deflection of the electron beam Uh, keeps the powder in a particular uh, temperature which is required for uh, before you make the uh, layer by layer manufacturing of the part so this equipment is one which we are uh, planning to buy in the near future then uh, i would just like to uh, summarize with this slides like what are the areas where the near net shape uh, technologies can be used and uh, that is for manufacturing uh, by deposition of different lugs and on the casings it can be used for repair and it can be used for the uh, rapid prototyping and even some surface uh, treatments are been used by improved coatings can be provided on the um, components so uh, before i uh, close the program let me uh, conclude my uh, um, feeling about this additive manufacturing uh, basically additive manufacturing allows the paradigm shift in uh, product development and uh, concurrent engineering but it also cannot offer any uh, solution and its applications uh, should be based on the pragmatic approach and uh, engineering judgment it also facilitates uh, achievement of time cost and quality features it will uh, it will come and uh, additive manufacturing provides very good products very quickly and under also cost effective but the main concern using in aero engines or aero applications will respect to uh, to is to arrive at the standards 
uh, I think uh, all the experts in this area should work together to provide this kind of uh, acceptable standards for certification agencies to allow the additive manufacture parts to go into the flying engines or flying uh, rockets. With that, uh, I'll uh, conclude with uh, again a, a quote from uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam. Uh, Dream is not which you see while you're sleeping, but it's something that does not let you sleep. Thank you very much. Over to Shibu. Uh, thank you, Dr. Manjunath. Uh, I wish uh, we get a day when we start dreaming about 3D printing also in our sleep. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. You have been doing an excellent presentation. And uh, GTR is something which we are always proud of. So there are some questions from uh, some media friends. Uh, I am able to see the question. You can read the question. Yeah. Uh, what engines are you using AM at the moment? Um, I, I, I don't. I don't be able to see. We are working on uh, different engines. One is the uh, manned aircraft, uh, fighter aircraft engine development, which is the Kaveri dry engine. And uh, we are also working on uh, small turbofan engines, which are to use the for the missile applications. So there are the sizes varies. Uh, for example, thrust wise, if I talk about, uh, we have uh, a four kilonewton thrust class engine. We have got an uh, eighty class, eighty kilonewton thrust class engine, fifty class, uh, fifty kilonewton thrust class engine, and we are looking at uh, going to one hundred and ten kilonewton thrust class engine. That is our future aircraft engines. I hope that are the answers to your first question. And uh, are you looking at larger engines? Yes, that is uh, larger engines, not in the uh, terms of the size of the parts, uh, but with respect to the thrust. Uh, actually, the trend of the engine manufacturing is uh, you make it smaller and smaller, but develop higher thrust. That is a lookout. It's not that you make a big engine, it will have more thrust. Uh, that is in the, with respect to the uh, civil uh, applications, but the military applications, you make the engine smaller, increase the thrust. So that is what I would say for uh, looking at uh, one question, which says, are you looking at larger engines? More trusted engines is what I would say. And is there a day when you could produce a complete engine IT manufacturing? Well, uh, uh, that is an interesting question. Uh, but uh, as the previous speaker also was talking, uh, conventional uh, manufacturing process as well as its own advantages and disadvantages. I don't think everything will come from the IT manufacturing part. It has to have some kind of uh, traditional and uh, non-traditional manufacturing processes involved to make the complete engine. So, and uh, are we making EB machines for AIM in the country? And we are uh, importing the laser and EB machines. Well, uh, I have to say the facts that uh, electron beam gun, the main source, power source is not made in India. And laser source, it's not made in India. You are not having any OEM who makes lasers and electron beam. Major gun powers are not made in India. We are dependent on abroad for making this kind of technologies. And machines, yes, uh, we may be able to build the chamber. Vacuum systems uh, expertise exists in the country. It can be done. It exists in India, in Bangalore itself. Hindi Vacuum is one of them who is a pioneer in making vacuum systems. But gun has to come from abroad. So, but we need to integrate it. It can be taken that we need to do all integration. It can be integrated, but we can make some of the, um, uh, to be frank, uh, BRC I had been working on making a complete electron beam welding machine for a long time. Then uh, many uh, more, many more, more please on the uh, AMCA engine and IoT manufacture. Uh, will the uh, OEM? OEM give the designs. Well, uh, there is no fifth generation engine existing in the world. Uh, we are trying to collaborate with some of the uh, leading OEMs across the world. And many people have shown interest to collaborate with GTRE. And uh, it is in the policy matters. Yes, we have, uh, we are keen on working on it. We will definitely come out with uh, some kind of solution. And parallelly, we are trying to put up some of the uh, added, uh, manufacturing infrastructures that are required to realize this uh, AMCA class of engines. So one of them is electron beam melting. So we are definitely going to work on it. You will uh, come to know in a few new, um, in the next coming uh, six, four months, uh, something will come out concrete on that. Uh, Dr. Manjunath, a small question. Uh, is DRDO currently offering some in-house courses for the engineers? On the uh, sir, uh, we do encourage a lot of uh, internship and uh, projects. 
and uh, recently there is a college called nitte minakshi technology institute of technology uh, where uh, through drdo a mtech program is been uh, tied up where we are planning to bring in this curriculum on additive manufacturing it will one of the uh, selective subjects elective subjects so we are working on making syllabus for that so yeah in so in fact uh, uh, i would like to have some more interactions offline with you Sure, sir. If we have to rewrite the AICT syllabi for the engineering courses, yes, sir. Uh, I would like to get in touch with you and send some sure, recommendations to the Ministry sure. of Education, Technical sure, Education. Sir. Yes, sir. Because the AICT is allergic to modifying the syllabi, yes, and sir. takes time. I was in the education industry also, right, whereas sir. the other universities in rest of the world are very very fast. So even you take a case of mechanical engineering four year course. engineering drawing itself is going to be a upside uh, change yes sir there will be disruption in the education industry itself when it comes to 3d printing per se yes. and the second question would be that drdo does encourage uh, some tot to the industry can you share with the audience and with me what are the current guidelines of the drdo to do some tot with the industry to boost this uh, stakeholders regime Mm, sir, with respect to TOT, yes. Uh, once we develop it, we are very much open to the uh, uh, industry partners you know, to tie up with TOTs. And uh, there is a, a group called DI Square TM, uh, which is an industry interface uh, group department directorate in our headquarters. You can just Google it, DI Square TM. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can always get in touch. There is a list of uh, uh, TOTs which. Are, no, I am uh, aware of that. But anything yeah. specific to 3D printing, they are doing currently. No, no, sir. So far, nothing related to 3D printing. General TOT is available. That I am aware. Uh, we need to frame up something for that kind of activity. Maybe we can think on that lines. on the case of uh, rewriting the icit course for engineering on 3d yes, print because yes, currently no nothing is taught in uh, engineering course no presently it nothing is taught so we thought that it, as a part of dr do thing this should be one of the electives that is what i have been in contact with one of the uh, former uh, colleague of uh, drdo who is in uh, touch with our uh, institutes so i am trying to uh, drdo it. along with met university has come out with the mtech in uh, defense technology mtech Yes, so I'm not sure anything is listed for 3D printing in the MTech stage also. Mm-hmm. So that so is where we need to modify the syllabi. Oh, we have to bring some to it. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Over to right. Dr. Shibu, please. Right. Thank you so much for the nice presentation, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Manjula, for your yeah for your uh, detailed presentation, and I think uh, uh, for various case studies that you have also shared. Now. Uh, Uh, ladies and gentlemen to vaman kulkarni he is the ex director uh, for uh, honey honeywell technologies and solutions uh, also uh, an ardent fan for uh, additive manufacturing uh, a very good morning uh, mr vaman kulkarni and he is also somebody who has been an active respondent uh, for uh, promoting uh, 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 defam that is designed for additive manufacturing because from the sessions that we learned from each of the presenters uh from the morning uh defam was something which was also a part of the uh, you know the presentations because uh, topo, uh topology optimization this is the only way in terms of getting there with that kind of a, 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 a format of design so uh, he comes with the expertise in terms in terms of training uh, so mr vaman there is also a confluence that we can build because everybody is looking at curriculums uh, i think maybe your insights will also help so i'm i'm sure this is very tuned to the presentation that you will be sharing on the subject thank you so much uh, mr vaman over to you thank you <clears throat> thank you uh, good afternoon everybody uh, thanks uh, shibu for that uh, introduction uh, nice to hear couple of uh, earlier talks uh, that makes uh, my job little more easier uh, a very good introduction to the overall uh, uh, additive manufacturing and it's uh, where it is being deployed uh, uh, today so let me share my desktop let, tell me whether you are able to see my desktop uh, uh, i'll uh, i'll be talking about uh, the additive manufacturing uh, on the aerospace applications by the different uh, industry leaders across the uh, globe uh, i'll spend more time talking about the design for additive manufacturing because that's the one which uh, will will help in getting the maximum benefits of additive manufacturing into the Uh, into the new product uh, uh, designs 
uh, and then of course we'll look at the other uh, applications and what are the uh, channels of additive manufacturing. Uh, just a, a, a very brief uh, snapshot of uh, where we are. This is a little old, but this is what was uh, projected for 2022 uh, by uh, by Wohler's uh, association. Uh, uh, we may not be there today because of the what happened because of pandemic in the last uh, couple of years, but definitely this tells you the trend where it will be. The uh, the laser sintering, whether it is uh, direct metal laser sintering or the selective laser sintering, that is going to be the ones which will uh, lead. The, the clear reason for that is uh, the various uh, metals and the alloys, what we can directly uh, produce the parts. That's the big reason for it. And most of those uh, materials, what you're talking about, they're all aerospace uh, friendly. It could be the, the nickel alloys like the inconel uh, alloys, or it could be titanium alloys or the aluminum alloys and the stainless steels. They're all uh, the ones which have been very heavily used in the aerospace and uh, uh, defense applications. Of course, following that is the uh, fusion deposition modeling, which is catching up, especially with uh, uh, there was a patent which has expired in the last four or five years and a lot of industries have come into the FDM uh, technology. And that's the other thing which is catching up. It could be more uh, for the non-metals, but it, it's also being now heavily being explored for the uh, metal uh, opportunities also using the uh, FDM. Uh, from the applications point of view, um, aerospace is most about 20% uh, of the overall uh, AM and it's definitely likely to grow. Um, the, the, re the, the real reason is uh, uh, the innovative products, what you can bring out uh, with, uh, uh, with adopting, by adopting the additive manufacturing technology, the medical is the other thing which has been growing and it will grow because of a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, implants and uh, dentures and other things. It's been very heavily growing in the last couple of years. In fact, pandemic has not affected much on the uh, medical implants and other things. So uh, that is another thing which is going to uh, catch up uh, uh, as, we, as we move along. Uh, the, the applications, the functional parts has been close to about 35%. This includes both metals, non-metals, all put together. But again, these functional parts, which are, I call it as a production parts. That means these are the parts which will directly get into the end product. So uh, that's uh, one way we can uh, deploy a lot of uh, the, uh, the new technologies, innovative designs. Uh, which is close to about 35%, but I'm sure it will grow a lot uh, in next uh, three, to, three to five years. Uh, I think that gives a good overview of uh, how this AM applications is, uh, is growing. From the, from the uh, benefits and the applications point of view, um, I think a lot of people have talked about the benefits, what we get from additive by having a parts which are lightweight, it could come out with a better performance because of the, the the complex designs. What we can what we can come out and we can produce the parts. That's most important. The earlier we were able to come out with the design, but we had difficulty in producing it. Either it is not cost effective or it cannot be produced. But with additive coming in, uh, most of those uh, manufacturing limitations have been uh, uh, have been overcome. And even from the assembly point of view, the part consolidation. And uh, the assembly related uh, challenges eliminate some of the special processes like uh, welding and coming out with a, a full assembly. Uh, those are the, the big benefits uh, which additive has been uh, providing. Uh, the, uh, the staircase model, which uh, is shown here, that's a, a good way how the AM is being deployed. Uh, at the bottom, you see the AM applications for the uh, prototypes and uh, tooling. Uh, in fact, I will say that uh, the additive manufacturing is a technology which is, late, which is there for last 30 plus years. It's not a new thing. But uh, for almost like last 20, 25 years, it, the, uh, it, it, the, the prototypes which we used to develop, it used to be uh, with the either the plastics or the polymer-based uh, parts which we were able to produce, not the exactly the... Um, uh, parts with the uh, with the actual alloys which will get into the uh, final uh, production uh, but it helps in uh, overcoming in, uh, in understanding the uh, 
uh, and demonstrating the uh, design as well as even some of the performance tests also could be done. We can in, you can also carry out a lot of assembly checks and it's also used for visualization purposes. So those are the per things which, which rapid prototyping have been used uh, continuously and the applications have been growing. Today we also, we, I, I'll show you a few examples how prototypes is being uh, very heavily used to reduce the cycle time as well as the cost of the new product uh, development. Uh, then we have the direct part replacement. These are the parts which have been designed for conventional manufacturing, uh, but uh, there are some challenges in making those parts and there may be a lot of rejections which are happening today uh, or uh, the suppliers who may not be available today and building another supplier could be another challenge, but you are not making any changes to the design. The reason is, uh, they are, this is a proven design which is already in uh, in service and we don't want to make any any, any changes to that uh, design so it's just replacing the existing design only we are adopting the aim as a process for uh, manufacturing and the third piece is the part consolidations in as part of the direct part replacement we also look at the adjacent parts which are there and then see whether those things also could be consolidated so that we can uh, remove some of the assembly uh, uh, related challenges or the reduce the uh, cost uh, some of those benefits we can bring. but on the top you see the design for additive manufacturing that's where we get uh, the other benefits which EM is uh, offering uh, uh, because we don't need any tools to as part of the additive manufacturing uh, uh, process and uh, theoretically speaking, anything and everything can be manufactured out of additive manufacturing. So you really have to open up your uh, design thinking process to get those uh, benefits, what we earlier uh, uh, mentioned. But there are there are uh, constraints, limitations, and then the uh, how we can make the design uh, more game friendly designs. Uh, so keeping some of the uh, the process related. Uh, uh, challenges or how we can make the design more uh, uh, more adaptable for the uh, producing it out of uh, AEM. So uh, in, in my next few charts, we'll start from the top. We'll look at the, uh, the design for additive, especially for the uh, new product designs, uh, how we can get the best benefits and how a systematic st uh, study of design for additive manufacturing will help you to come out with the, the better uh, better designs. So uh, we talked about the uh, uh, high performance, lower weight, what additive can uh, uh, provide. Uh, the key things which enables that, especially for the lower weight, is the, the topology optimization and then the, the lattice structure uh, uh, designs. So uh, these are the, uh, the uh, two things. They are not new. They are not new technologies. Topology optimization, again, has been there for last 20, 25 years. But whatever design you come out topology optimization, uh, we were either not able to produce that uh, part or it is too costly to make those parts using the conventional manufacturing. With additive manufacturing, uh, the topology optimization adaptation has considerably increased. There are many uh, tools which are available today, uh, uh, which have become, which were in the uh, Topology optimization modules with additive manufacturing as a focus is, is, is available to do that. A, a good example here you can see is the, uh, the this is the uh, one of the Honeywell uh, engine mounts. Uh, the, the, this is the, uh, the original uh, design and with topology optimization, uh, you will be able to reduce that weight by almost more than 30%. Um, and similarly, uh, one of the uh, wheels and brakes, uh, uh, the key de device, which how we can reduce that weight. So you, looking at the part itself, uh, you are able to come out with a very uh, uh, very unique uh, design using the topology optimization. But think of making it out of conventional uh, manufacturing. It is definitely going to cost more and then it is also going to take uh, uh, time to do this. So uh, uh, the, the process of topology optimization is very simple. Uh, you have the original design you do the finite element analysis and look at the part uh, where the stresses are and then you do the optimization of the uh, 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 looking at the, the, the areas where you can take out the material or you can reduce the thicknesses and all and then finally have a, a 
modified CAD model. And then that CAD model, you can do a, a, a finite element analysis to ensure that it meets all the all the uh, the loads what it is going to be subjected to. So on top of this, what you have to do is you have to now add some of the additive manufacturing uh, the design guidelines so that DFAM plus additive manufacturing is, is the one which is going to give you the, the best solution. In fact, at the bottom, you can see the design. We have optimized it for the uh, uh, design for additive manufacturing, but you can see that there are a lot of support structures which are required, even the circular holes they need inside support structures. But with the, if you make it uh, 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 more friendly for the additive manufacturing, in fact, some of these circular holes, you can make it as a rectangular uh, holes so that you don't need any support structures there. So that way, if you add DFAM plus additive manufacturing, you'll be able to get a, a better uh, uh, design which can be produced with, uh, with additive, uh, uh, additive manufacturing. And there are quite a few examples which I, I just talked about uh, about these things. Uh, looking at the lattice uh, structure designs, uh, again, uh, I'm showing with one of the uh, a theoretical classical example of how this can be used to, uh, uh, to make best use of the lattice structure designs. Uh, it can be a simple uh, flow duct, what you're talking about here, but this flow duct also has the functionality of taking away the, the heat. The heat transfer rate is an another important uh, but at the same time, we, we, we don't want to have too much of a pressure drop uh, across that. So the, 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 four the three designs which you have uh, uh, considered here with the different, uh, uh, different lattice uh, structures, a, a, a detailed uh, uh, fluid dynamics analysis, CFD study, shows that we can uh, have a design which has the lower pressure drop, very small, very small, very marginal impact on the pressure drop, but you have a very high uh, uh, impact on the heat transfer rate. So that way, the the uh, the lattice structure designs could be very very effectively used. In fact, uh, the, the there is an uh, the uh, heat uh, heat exchanger which G has developed for their uh, uh, latest uh, G90X engine, uh, which has uh, improved the performance by almost more than twenty five percent. And the uh, the number of parts have reduced from almost like 160 plus parts to a single assembly of the heat exchanger. So the lattice structure design uh, uh, it could be used. One is the heat transfer is a good example, but it can also be used where you need to have some negative Poisson's ratio, or you can have a, a better thermal conductivity, or better acoustic uh, designs. So those are all the areas where uh, the lattice designs could be very very effectively uh, used. So the complexity of the design. So uh, uh, I think in Manjunath's design also we talked about we, about the turbine uh, uh, blades. Uh, uh, the internal, the, the most of these turbine blades have these internal uh, uh, cooling passages, uh, and we can add the additional functionality to that uh, uh, design. Uh, in, instead of just uh, having it as an airfoil, we can also use it uh, for the. Uh, uh, for the either the cooling purposes or if it's a, a swirler for an engine combustion chamber, it can also be used uh, uh, to mix the fuel and air flow without affecting the uh, the, 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 the pressure drop in the, in the combustion chamber. So those are the additional functionalities what you can use. Um, the, uh, the thing which a lot of uh, uh, research is going on today is for the functionally graded additive manufacturing uh, parts. So the functionally graded means we can vary the property across the uh, across the length of the part or across the breadth of the part. It could be achieved either by uh, controlling the porosity as well as the density, which is intentionally introduced into the design, so that you can get a, a varying uh, properties. Or it could be adding two different materials. Uh, adding two different materials is definitely a reality today in the many of the non-metals. But in the metals also, there is a lot of machine developments which are going on today so that we can have uh, two different materials and then we can uh, uh, can build the parts so that we can have a, a, a property, varying properties uh, to meet the uh, design requirements. So uh, the, the plant is already available with additive manufacturing, but additive manufacturing with metal uh, alloys is also going to be a reality, reality in a, a very short period of uh, time. 
Um, there are certain things of uh, design for additive manufacturing which is uh, which is more manufacturing uh, uh, driven, uh, especially the part consolidation. Uh, in fact, this is the the fuel nozzle uh, which is uh, uh, made by General Electric. Uh, it's made out of cobalt chrome, uh, and this assembly is uh, re reduced from twenty parts to a single part. So, reducing the part has no advantages. It will. Uh, eliminate the uh, 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 the tooling which could be required for the assemblies or the distortions which could uh, happen uh, uh, during the assembly process or uh, the number of inventory of parts what you have to manage that also considerably uh, reduces so uh, uh, in fact when i talk about the approach you see that whenever you talk about introducing additive manufacturing parts you also look at the overall system rather than looking at just one part uh, to be made out of uh, additive manufacturing. And the other big example is the small production runs and the turnaround time which is required, especially in the aerospace industry, which has a very large lifespan. I will typically say that it varies from 30 years to 50 years of uh, lifespan, which is there. And during that life cycle, uh, we may have a lot of uh, manufacturing related uh, challenges because of the uh, supplier himself, or it could be because of the uh, uh, non-availability of certain things which we, was available 30 years back or 40 years uh, back. In fact, there is a, a one very well what Honeywell uh, uh, may had for one of their uh, uh, ATF engine. Uh, this is an engine which goes on the Fal Falcon aircraft. The design of this was made way back in late 60s, 1967 in fact. But there are still 12 aircrafts which are in service. And the aircraft which are in service, we definitely need to provide the space and the supports which is uh, required for that. And the for one of the bearing housing, uh, we had a supplier who, who who had closed his shops, and we, if we have to develop another new supplier, uh, we have to uh, invest a lot for all the toolings and uh, again go through the, the certification process. So we decided to do this through the additive manufacturing uh, uh, approach. And then we could successfully make that part and then get it FAA certified and then now it is in production. So it's another classical example how additive manufacturing helps to address this, this type of uh, manufacturing uh, challenges. It's a simple example how additive design uh, helps, especially uh, the support structures which are required to build the additive parts uh, is uh, uh, it, it's a uh, it's a knowledge base which has to be developed based on the experience. Um, typically, uh, the guideline says that if the if the angle is uh, uh, less than forty degrees, we need to have these uh, uh, supports. If it is more than forty degrees, then we may not have the uh, supports. But this we can arrive at based on the orientation in which you build that uh, part, or you can change some of these small geometries. A good example you can see here is a, a, a flow duct, a T duct. Uh, the important thing is you want to have a smooth flow and then have a minimum pressure drop. But because of the, the uh, conventional manufacturing uh, constraints, we used to have a straight holes and a circular holes. So that's how the typical design used to be. And then we leave it with the penalties which are required. But now with the additive manufacturing, you can have this uh, the curved shape, the hole, so that you get a smoother flows. And then the shape of the hole also you can alter it in such a way that it becomes more uh, additive friendly uh, holes. You can see here that we don't need any other support structure for it except at the uh, bottom. And then we are able to get a better performer and uh, uh, we are able to have a lower uh, uh, lower pressure drops. Another good example you can see is the, the hydraulic manifold here. Uh, typically we have a lot of uh, drilled holes uh, through the uh, manifold uh, for the flow passages. And then we used to make those holes as straight holes. And then maybe we may have to plug some of those things uh, to, uh, in order to reach out to that particular uh, locations. But with an additive manufacturing, again, you can completely optimize these uh, uh, hole shapes, uh, the internal hole shapes. And we don't need to have those additional plugs which are required. And then you can have a, pressure, uh, uh, a smoother flow and then lower pressure drops. So it's a, a good a, 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 another example of how uh, DFAM can be applied uh, and then uh, make best use of the, uh, the, the benefits what additive uh, provides. 
So the typical approach which uh, 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 designed for additive manufacturing, if you uh, if it can be followed, then we'll get a, 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 a very well uh, innovative design parts uh, done out of it. As I told, we should start with the system design. So that's very important. Look at the adjacent parts. Look at the uh, boundaries. Uh, so then look at the, the 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 loads and load cases as well as the materials and the environment in which it is going to operate. So that way we will be able to define the problem very, very clearly uh, following the, the system design approach. Uh, so <clears throat> once you have done that, then you move to the part design. So when you do the part design, you initially do a, a conceptual design or an initial uh, uh, design. And uh, uh, without keeping any manufacturing uh, constraints or even not even considering how, it, how good it is for additive manufacturing. Then you start interpreting that design from the additive manufacturing uh, point of view, uh, which process you want to follow and uh, 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 how we can make that design more uh, uh, aim friendly part of it and all. And then you do the verification of that design, carrying out the uh, whether it's an FE analysis or the sales for the performance. You do that. You verify that design, saying that yes, you are uh, you are able to uh, uh, exceed or meet most of these uh, requirements. On top of that, you start importing, the, imposing the additive manufacturing uh, uh, related uh, uh, limitations or the constraints, like the support structure. Now you have to decide how to orient that uh, part or uh, what are those areas I can uh, uh, improvise to keep the minimum uh, support structure. So look at it from that point and then uh, decide on the which aim process you want to follow uh, to build that uh, part and what are those process parameters, what should be the, uh, the laser beam uh, intensity, the uh, the, 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 the cycle, what you need to follow and what is the layer thickness and those things which are specifically uh, focused on the AM process point of view. Then you validate that from building that part. In fact, many of the uh, AM machines today, they come out with this uh, feature of telling you whether a part can be built and then uh, what time it takes. Uh, uh, but definitely when you look at the cost, you don't look at building that part just as a standalone. Uh, in fact, the cost models, what in Honeywell, what we have built is you always look at it from end to end. That is right from getting the raw material to the finished part to be delivered to the customer. So if you look at it that way, it will really, uh, really helps you to make a good comparison. If you just look at the manufacturing that part cost, you may feel that additive manufacturing is costing uh, uh, more. So the AM simulation has really uh, 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 improved a lot in the last uh, three to five years. There are a lot of simulation tools which simulates the building process. Uh, when I say building the process, it simu simulates the, the complete uh, uh, the thermal cycle which the part undergoes while building that part so that it, it goes to that uh, 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 the microstructure related uh, AM simulation what I'm uh, talking about. So that will really help to say, make sure that we succeed for the first time when you build the part. There used to be a lot of uh, uh, failures, especially when you're building a large parts. There could be a lot of uh, the thermal stresses uh, and the cracks which could be there. And if we are able to uh, predict that through the AM simulation, then we can uh, sort of uh, either modify the design or modify the process of building that uh, part so that you will succeed. So I'll say that there's a good focus which has happened on CM simulation for last three to five years, and it's going to uh, uh, going to be much better as we move along. So that's the typical DFAM process which helps you to uh, go through a systematic way of getting the maximum uh, benefits. I, I'm not going to many of those uh, details of DFAM. DFAM itself could be a, a separate topic. Uh, which could be run for uh, half a day uh, as part of uh, uh, as part of this type of uh, exposures. Some of the good examples uh, on the prototyping uh, piece of it, how additive manufacturing helps. So these are the parts which are used only for prototypes. They are not used for production because the volume of parts what we need to produce, and then the uh, the for making that. Uh, uh, 
the cost effectiveness study it may not uh, it may not be that much beneficial to do it the production parts out of additive manufacturing but definitely it helps uh, uh, when you are uh, coming out with the uh, new designs it, and this is an example in in honeywell this is the the second stage hpt uh, blade typically designing these blades with those inter in, uh, comp internal cooling passages and uh, validating it this takes typically about three hour a conventional process the reason is you may take uh, uh, two to three months for the design but getting a prototype done could take easily about eight to nine months and then after the testing you had to go through another two or three cycles before you finalize the design so that way typically it's a three year cycle to uh, uh, to do to uh, freeze the design of these uh, blades but with the additive manufacturing uh, approach which honeywell successfully uh, implemented we were able to design the blade and then the prototypes we could get it done in less, in about four weeks of time so the, the what used to take about uh, seven to eight months we are able to get the prototypes done in about four weeks of time and then you quickly do the uh, uh, the uh, the testing of these blades in the test facilities and then modify that uh, uh, design and then you uh, have the next cycle of prototypes uh, built so typically we could finish the four design iterations in uh, in eight weeks and then we could finalize the design in less than three to four months of these uh, uh, turbine blades so that's the uh, <clears throat> time reduction of more than 70 percent and two all parts for the prototypes uh, using the the typically the investment casting which is used in this type of uh, 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 the cooled blades uh, that cost also is much much less uh, for uh, for the prototype development and we can do more uh, uh, design iterations to finalize and typically another example here is the uh, the the toby nozzle ring is an another good example of similar things where you could uh, save time of more than 9 months uh, and then we could give that uh, part for even for the engine testing for those to evaluate the engine performance in those initial uh, stages uh, so uh, making it for the prototypes certain things which you have to keep in mind for the final certification we don't have to do that because it's more like a development testing but we can quickly have those uh, uh, have those uh, performance evaluations uh, done in some cases we may not use the the same material we can use the alternative uh, plastic materials and then build those uh, parts these are some of the things what we, we carried out in in honeywell uh, the purpose could be different it could be just to carry out assembly trials and then the checks which you wanted to do or in, in an example what you are seeing here is a, a, a new new product a solenoid what what we are designing uh, we the design indicates that uh, on the bobbin we need to have so much of uh, coils wound on that uh, bobbin but to, to do that and then evaluate that parts uh, it would have taken uh, two to three months and then that, at that stage we feel that it is not possible to have that uh, so many windings to get to get the power what is required whereas we can make these plastic parts in a day and then do that winding trials and then next in, 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 in two or three days you know that whether that is uh, design which we can accommodate the the number of windings or not so these are some of the <coughs> good examples where uh, we can uh, use even the uh, other materials plastic or even some of the uh, things which you can easily build those prototypes and then evaluate some of the uh, design challenges which could be there so that you don't have the surprises when you have the final product the tooling is another uh, very good example uh, in fact you can a uh, lot of things i have shown here there is a flow mixer which is required for uh, 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 for testing a, a flow meter uh, and it needs to have the uh, flow straightener and then the mixer together done and then we can really come out with a complex uh, mixer design uh, so that we can test for all the uh, all the variations with, with just one mixer and then we can minimize the number of tests what we have to do um, and then you can see these uh, breaks in a uh, uh, for testing uh, 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 and you can incorporate those uh, rakes while building that part itself and then uh, uh, you can build that uh, part and uh, uh, and then use it for the uh, uh, for the testing purposes 
There are a lot of good examples even on the tooling where additive manufacturing helps to both reduce the cost as well as the time which is involved to prepare those assembly fixtures or the text fixtures and the the instrumentation uh, uh, jigs. So those are all the things which uh, uh, we can uh, incorporate. The conformal cooling is another uh, a good example. You know that you are going to use the investment casting, but typically the investment, the, the production rate using this uh, investment casting depends on the, the, the time we have to give for cooling those uh, uh, dyes. In fact, that time is almost like 50% of the time uh, uh, what is involved in, uh, in the cooling. And that cooling we cannot improve in the earlier designs because we need the cooling passages used to be straight cooling passages. With the additive designs, we can come out with the uh, design which has the, uh, uh, the, the, the complex cooling so that you can improve the uh, production rate. You can improve the uh, heat exchange and then reduce the, cycle, the cooling time and then we can increase the, the production rate. In fact, this is one of the practical example where Honeywell, uh, uh, one of the safety devices uh, where we implemented this and we coordinated with the, uh, the supplier who was doing investment casting for us and we could achieve an increase in the, um, the production rate of more than 50%. Uh, increase in the production rate of 150 percent and we also could have a significant improvement on the part quality because it is a uh, it's a uh, more effective way of cooling and then uniform cooling what we could achieve with these uh, with complex uh, uh, cooling passages and in fact there are a lot of industry examples today for the conformal cooling which has been very very widely uh, very widely used using the additive uh, manufacturing um, the, the, uh, when Manjanath was talking, he did talk about the repair of the parts, uh, how additive can be used and all. Uh, this is one of the examples which I am showing. The other examples which we have used it for uh, uh, for building, uh, for rebuilding the worn out blade. Uh, I am not showing it here because there is, uh, it's a little classified. But you can see the real example here. This is one of our turbocharger uh, housing. Uh, we had made this turbocharger housing for uh, uh, Honda. And then when Suzuki came back and then they wanted to have a, a, a same uh, uh, turbocharger from performance point of view, but for to integrate it with their engine and then their assemblies, they wanted a different orientation of the uh, flange. Uh, for us to remake that uh, uh, turbine housing with a different orientation, and then get it done through the uh, casting, it would have taken us at least uh, seven to eight months because again, we, uh, we had to go to our supplier and then he has to make those uh, casting tools and other things and then uh, build those parts. <clears throat> so what we did is we took the existing Honda uh, uh, housing and then we removed the, uh, uh, the existing uh, uh, flange and then we, on top of that, we built a uh, our own uh, flange. You can see here the finished the part. And then we offered it to the uh, Suzuki people in less than four weeks. And then that way, the Suzuki could do their initial uh, assembly trials. In fact, they could do the initial uh, engine testing also with these uh, uh, things. And then uh, they came back and then we gave them some of their inputs, which we told that, yes, we can incorporate it in the final design. So uh, the... This is another good example of how uh, uh, part repair could be used. Uh, uh, and we called it as incremental uh, uh, printing. We have done a lot of study on this, uh, especially the question which is asked is the strength at the joint uh, between the uh, uh, between the cast part and the uh, and the additively built part. The joint which is there, how it looks in terms of the the, the, the strength. And then we did a lot of uh, the tensile uh, testing on the coupons what we had built and then we had seen that the weakest part is not the joint the weakest part lies in the in the in the, in the base material so that way the joint is not a, a concern for this so we are extending the same thing for doing it for the uh, the, the 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 turbine blades as well as the uh, the compressor blades and how this can there the challenge could be little more involved because it's a rotating part and then it's a, it could be a flight critical part we need to demonstrate a lot of the testing. So that's the one which is uh, under process uh, process today. So we looked at all the benefits. Uh, what is that challenge which is there for the AM? Uh, uh, 
to adopt why industry is still not uh, uh, not uh, embracing this technology and uh, initially i made that statement additive manufacturing is not going to replace the conventional manufacturing the yeah, conventional manufacturing and additive manufacturing which complement each other to address many of the manufacturing challenges which the industry has and also how we can be the, the the time which is involved in making manufacturing that part how it can be reduced how it can be more produce more reliable parts and how it can be made more cost effective so that's how the both the am technology and the conventional things will complement each other and work uh, i think manjunath also answered very very clearly that it's not that we can make a complete engine out of additive manufacturing and that's not our aim also how we can make the engine which takes let us say a year to build how that can be reduced to 6 months and then how it can be made much more uh, 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 much more reliable and then how we can reduce that cost which is involved in manufacturing that part so that's where both the technology will uh, make. so there are still tech- things which are uh, if, for example if you want a very uh, very uh, Uh, accurate uh, parts which is less than 50 microns it is a challenge to make it out of additive manufacturing and if you say that i need a uh, very high surface finish which is required it's a challenge we need to do some post uh, machining on top of the am built part to achieve those uh, uh, dimensional tolerances or the, uh, the the surface finish what you need so that's the uh, reality uh, today and then similarly the build quality uh, it definitely has lot of uh, internal uh, residual stresses uh, and then uh, especially when you build a, a big part which uh, which can have the uh, the temperature uh, gradient which could be there and then that could result in cracks once the part is taken out from the uh, from the uh, base so those are the things which are being addressed through the am simulation so that we can address it to control the the process parameters today but it is still considered as a challenge the most important question which the uh, aerospace industry keeps on asking is the the question which is there in another location can i get the same uh, 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 same part with uh, same part with uh, uh, with with all the uh, with all the accuracies and tolerances what i am looking at it unless you put together a process in place where you say that this is exactly the process you need to follow it is difficult to say that you will get the same uh, uh, same part so uh, in fact with honeywell what we did is the part which you build in bangalore and the part which is built in us we compared that following the exactly the same process we defined the process uh so uh, so that we can reproduce that and then go back to the fia and then justify that as if you follow this process on on a machine which is anywhere then we will be able to ensure that it it it, it comes out to the with the same uh, uh, design features so it's still not a universal process there are uh, uh, each industry is adopting to that and i think lot of effort needs to be put to to standardize uh, standardize that we still have a part size limitation uh, although today machines are available where you can build a part by 1 meter by 1 meter may not be in the country country we have 400 mm by 400 mm block but the, there are machines which are being built by with 1 meter by 1 meter <clears throat> so uh, size has to be kept in mind and not all materials can be done out of uh, I, i did not touch upon the what materials and all in my topic again that's a, uh, a bigger topic to talk about so there are a lot of post processing which is involved uh, stress relieving is one of the process which uh, every part has to be subjected to because of the uh, the uh, the residual stresses which will be there uh, so uh it's a uh, minimum uh, post uh, heat treatment which we have to subject in and in if requires some of the additional uh, heat treatment process you may have to follow that and then for the aerospace and uh, defense especially for the parts which uh, uh, which are uh, subjected to the high fatigue type of uh, loading and other things hot isostatic pressing heaping is a process which is typically recommended so that we get a consistent reliable uh, uh, parts but otherwise we typically carry out only the short pinning or if there are some uh, uh, other uh, surface finish uh, operations like uh, chemical etching or vibratory honing so that, those are the things which follow it for, to improve the uh, the surface uh, finish 
So uh, uh, getting a certification through the certifying agency is, a, is definitely a, a, a challenge, which uh, uh, I think uh, the, uh, the earlier speakers have already emphasized because there are a lot of parameters which are uh, which affects the quality of the part what we are uh, building. I'm not going to read all those things. It starts with the powder and then it uh, uh, then it goes right up to the the, 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 the post processing which and other things which you are following on that part. There are a lot of uh, uh, variables which affect the quality of the part and those things have to be very very clearly defined and then the documented so that we are able to answer all the questions which comes out from the SEMILAC. Uh, each industry is following their own process. G has established their own process. Uh, uh, Honeywell has their own process which has been uh, established and we have got quite a, quite, a, quite a few parts which are certified by the FAA authorities. So I think the some focused effort in the country is also required here so that every industry need not repeat that and then we can define those, uh, those guidelines. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so that's the, where the challenges needs to be addressed. Uh, to conclude it, I will say that, yes, definitely additive manufacturing has opened up the design space. We can come out with more innovative uh, parts and uh, we can also make quick changes to the customer requirements. It's almost like on demand what you can uh, print out of additive manufacturing and any late feedback which comes from the customers that can be very easily addressed. So the customer is, is very happy to adopt this uh, uh, technology. Uh, challenges which I talked about those things uh, industry has understood all those challenges and then they are uh, now how they can be formally uh, uh, put it into a, a, a acceptable guidelines uh, so that's the one which is uh, going on uh, uh, from the community point of view uh, I'll say that the uh, the coordinated effort is definitely required right from the powder developers to OEMs and then having the right uh, uh, skills from the education institutions. Uh, those are the things which are definitely needed to take this technology forward. So with that, I conclude. If there are any questions, we'll take it up. Thank you, Mr. Kulkarni. Excellent presentation. And we don't really ask questions from Honeywell people. But uh, just to interact with you, uh, we have Semilec in Bangalore, Center for Military Airworthiness Certificate. Uh, well, anything which is done, modification or induction of any parts, uh, they do come into the Military Airworthiness Certificate. And of course, for the civil, there is a separate option. What has been your experience in terms of the certification of aerospace parts? Yeah, uh, in fact, I did have interacted with uh, a few Semilac people uh, on the on the uh, uh, on the approach we need to follow for uh, certifying the parts for the uh, aerospace applications and whatever we have learned it in a hard way from Honeywell. So, uh, just to give you in a minute what helps uh, uh, in getting this part certified. Uh, See, the typical thing what Semilac or looks at it is we need to have the traceability for everything. It starts with the raw material. Uh, uh, if I'm buying a raw material from uh, X and then if I change the source of that raw material to Y in the when it is part is in production and if you are not able to trace the the the, uh, the pro manufacturing process what has been followed for that uh, uh, powder uh, then it, it, it's difficult to answer the, uh, the similar question. So in Honeywell, what we have done is we have gone to a supplier. We have gone and audited his uh, uh, facility for the uh, how he makes that uh, or the automation process, typically what they uh, follow and how the process parameters are managed and then controlled so that we are able to provide that uh, inputs to FAA when that question is uh, asked. Uh, similarly, when we build the part, uh, 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 the typical question which is asked is the uh, the properties what we get out of that uh, part. 
So one is the detailed material uh, characterization. What we do, uh, we subject uh, multiple samples to the tensile, compressive, fatigue, creep, and those testing, which is very exhaustive testing, and then build that uh, database. In fact, that data is could be available uh, from the OEMs of the machine manufacturers. But what FAA looks at it is, can we trace that right from the uh, the powder to the building that. Uh, part and then the data which is there, uh, many of the machine OEMs are not able to provide that. So we need to again put in that effort. But in addition to that, uh, when a part is built, we also build a test coupon. And then we, so that test coupon is also subjected to the uh, same building parameters as the part. And then we subject that coupon to the, the minimum testing which is uh, required so that we can demonstrate to the certific agencies that yes, the part what is built and the test data is uh, uh, is the one which meets that product uh, design requirement. And we have an exhaustive data what we have generated out of it. So that's the second thing what the semi like will ask and then we are able to demonstrate. And the third piece is the component itself when it is uh, subjected to the component level certification uh, test. Uh, how we can use certain things uh, by uh, similarity and then certain things by actual test. So that's another thing which we have to clearly agree upon with the similar agencies and then demonstrate. I think if we address those things, we will be able to answer many of the questions which come out from the uh, certificate. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kulkarni. Excellent, uh, educative, uh, this thing. So what is your current engagement? Are you available for uh, off-the-shelf consulting also? Yes, uh, yes, okay. Commander. In fact, yeah. that's what I have been doing today after I moved out from uh, Honeywell. Uh, I've been interacting with the AIM industry a lot. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Shibo has been using where, wherever my experience could benefit. And then some of the education issues also I'm working with, like uh, IIT Chennai, I'm working with some of the, giving some of the, the webinars and then the mentoring for the students and other things. So I, I definitely want to uh, uh, contribute to the uh, how we can take this technology to the next level. Especially thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. We are honored to have you here today. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Sir. Yeah. Dr. Shibu, please take over. Yeah. Thank you so much, Vaman uh, uh, Kulkarni, sir. Thank you for your inputs. And I'm sure uh, we have an opportunity to work together in this direction. Uh, Mr. Waman Kulkarni is also now uh, a, a, a 3D graphy associate panel for us uh, in terms of representing engineering. And uh, thank you so much, Mr. Waman Kulkarni, for being a part of this. In fact, uh, Wing Commander Ramanji and we were also uh, discussing on the, the training aspect. Uh, and I'm sure uh, even he would have got impressed with the, the, the kind of uh, you know inputs and information that uh, is so much there in, in the domain which needs to be actually translated in terms of value for the young aspirants uh, and also the professionals who are already there in the in the market to be updated of a, a, AM as a technology of, uh, which will definitely benefit. So, uh, sir, uh, as we did discuss, uh, uh, Vaman Kulkarni is also a key respondent and we will be working on those aspect too uh, with this training program that we've been conducting for dental and medical for so many years would be something very similar that we can institute here. Thank you so much, uh, gentlemen. Now, uh, I'm so sorry about the, 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 the cascading effect in terms of the presentation, but I'm sure uh, it's very engaging and a lot of information. So, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, we will now shift to the next uh, uh, session two with another uh, informative, uh, you know, substance coming from all the 3D printing technology experts who are already offering solutions in this space. So that will be, uh, a, I'm sure, an engaging one and very insightful with all the new machines. Now we see that there are so many new technologies in 3D technology, in 3D printing specifically that we are discussing, and also the software part, where CAD firm will also share how simulation softwares can be used in terms of tracing and uh, you know uh, ensuring that how the design consolidation can be done rightly. So I, I thank you so much, gentlemen, and we'll shift to the next uh, session too, and then we'll join for that session subsequently back to back. Thank you so much.
and thank you so much for this uh, for the start of the next uh, session which is going to be very interesting uh, while the session is called 3d printing and 3d visualization uh, the crux of this session is going to be uh, on uh, new technologies and innovations done by these uh, senior experts who have been in the space for some long time uh, may i introduce you to doc, uh, uh, sir uh, sarup chand who is the director for endotech uh, information systems somebody who is actually been in the the helm of the 3d printing technology for almost last more than a more than a decade and so and and more i believe uh, for his expertise in uh, understanding how cad cam design and uh, could be taken into consider but the company is almost four uh, three and a half decades old but 3d printing is uh, doctor if i'm not uh, sort of if i'm not wrong maybe 15 years from now that you have introduced this technology and somebody who has got a, uh, a vast experience and also a lot of uh, solution building in terms of materials that he will also be sharing on the subject and also the various different technologies may be on polymers or also in metal and also on metals uh, materials like carbon fiber so i'm sure it will be a great interesting session uh, followed by him would be uh, another gentleman uh, mr chandan mishra who will also uh, join in soon uh, uh, who is from lodestar uh, offering solutions in dmls technology and also evm technology currently uh, and then i have uh, also yeah chandan is here already yeah so the dr chris paul who is actually a researcher and a material scientist uh, done some great work and very impressive uh, work that he has done in the educational space and very interestingly to also know that he is also built a indigenous uh, evm technology machine uh, dr thank you so much for your presence and your participation you. i'm sure there will be a lot of learnings for us to know and also he's published uh, a book on uh, additive manufacturing I, i'm sure it will be a great learning for all of us and we will also be promoting it through our 3d graphy news which is a new initiative because with last 7 years of our time and effort spent in 3d technology now it is time for us to also do a proper proliferation with the content that we have been able to generate so thank you so much dr christ uh, paul thank and you. also chandan is back chandan a short introduction again uh, since i did introduce you but you are, you, uh, you joined just now so chandan is the director for lord lord star uh, innovations Uh, primarily they are uh, uh, they also deal into different technologies made be a peak material they are also into evm technology and also a dmls technology so they are also uh, key respondents for these uh, high end machines uh, uh, proliferating and marketing in the country uh, from companies like g additive and also shine 3d and uh, shyan scores and uh, uh, an am expert but he is past is past experiences work with bharat forge uh also uh, a, a manufacturing center of excellence uh, and now with aims uh, solutions which is also the first indigenous manufactured 3d printers in metal uh interestingly they are also taking a great leap uh, in the prospect of uh, being one of the indigenous companies in india who has really made us proud thank you so much uh, uh, shreyans for for being a part of the session uh also then let me introduce and with uh, great privilege also one of our the 3d graphy advisories uh, in our panel for engineering uh, captain uh, group captain uh, er rajapan who is also uh, uh, a key respondent and also a service provider he also has a setup uh, in bangalore offering services in 3d printing so he would want to also know which are the new technologies uh, 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 that is there instituted in the country where he can make a choice currently he is using the uh, doctor if i am not wrong and, and also fdm that's okay. correct yes the sla and fdm fdm great so I, i think it will be a great session for everybody to know understand he comes from the end users perspective also because he is also end user and now also a service provider in the aerospace and even shipping we, we see a lot of prospect uh, uh, in building there too so thank you so much gentlemen and may i now uh, invite uh, mr sarup chand to kindly uh, take to uh, take us uh, through his presentation thank you so much uh, thank you sure good afternoon a project uh, as a group works in the emerging technologies and uh, way back in 1990 uh, 1989 when we started introducing the cad cam the drafting board was known and it was a challenge to change the there there is a lot of noise coming so the drafting board the concept of drafting board the cad has to be explained the concept of a large board to a small team in no distance to that to be seen so we i see that in this emerging technology the city thinking we are almost going to the same uh, where the commercial manufacturing is no 
not be added with the uh, uh, certificate manufacturer. We are close to about 30 year old. We have about 300 plus people uh, working with more than 10,000 customers. Uh, and we do provide work in Kazakhstan and from there to the area of certificate manufacturing as well. Today, we have four streams of emerging technology, which is the graphics. And adaptive CAD, which is an extension of the CAD system to a knowledge based engineering, which are all the components of it, Industry 4.0 or a smart manufacturing. Uh, as a company, we provide solutions and we have the equipment, and therefore we offer the services. It is in FDM, SLA. MJF, which is a new technology, which has not been talked about in the morning. So I'll just touch upon that. Uh, DD and Adam technology. Again, a technology which has just been introduced about three years back. And therefore, some of the speakers did not touch upon that. We work in materials like polymer, resin, metal of different type. We work extensively with clay and ceramic, as well as the continuous fiber uh, for carbon composite and other composites and the bio inks. If we look at the technology and the value add, we do the reverse engineering as well as doing the 3D printing, which gets supplemented with design for manufacturing. Having said that, what 3D printing is doing, and I don't need to illustrate that, uh, replacing some of the large factories uh, running into acres to a factory which is within the room. Uh, I think most of the speakers have already spoken about some of these things and therefore I will not touch upon because the time is relatively short. Reduced manufacturing time, no tooling, no MOQ, trial of alternatives, light weighting, integration of many parts, complex geometry is the biggest advantage for 3D printing. And of course, the speakers did talk about the challenges in the area of uh, finished parts, but a large part of the factory and the automation is done in tools, jigs and fixtures, which as of right now does not require that much of certification and is a low hanging fruit for additive manufacturing to be adopted in the different area, whether it is for maintenance or it is for the uh, parts to be assembled or quality checked. So you do use it for prototyping and working on alternative functional design. And I think Dr. Manjunath illustrated it very well in the morning session on how he's able to use uh, or his team is able to use the visualization to facilitate the manufacturing of the engine as well as the different components of the engine and improve upon the design. And he I'm very impressed with the design, with the visualization model where he talked about the weld guns being chosen and optimized on a plastic model so that the there is no interference which happens and the part could be manufactured. So I think prototyping is not just for the part visualization, but also to test the jigs and fixtures as well as the manufacturing process per se. Uh, in terms of functional part, there could be operational parts, which is what was discussed in the morning, but there are a lot of ground facilities related to communication systems, exoskeletons, nose cover for missiles, battery casing, radio communication systems, which are not the functional part, but are facilitators on the ground facility, whether it is a satellite to be launched or it is a, a space station to be worked upon or a defense equipment. So we, when we started working with some of the people in Air Force and Army, even simple thing like jigs for holding and opening the or filling the selenium in a missile are critical components and are required to be made because they are right now being imported. Uh, looking at the growth, a lot of people have now started working on it. So it's not an effort anymore of one organization which is making everything. 
like it used to happen in a DEC system or an IBM system where the hard disk software, the computer board were ma made by one guy. Today it is being made by, it, it started getting uh, democratized and in the same way 3D printing is taking a big jump where the technology provider, the software people, the simulation people, the material suppliers, the service providers are all coming together to give that growth from that peak trough and then going up. And if you look at it, very large manufacturers, technology providers, very large material manufacturers are all now working to see how they can be a participant in the future uh, of the manufacturing and additive manufacturing is one of those future which is being seen by all these companies which I think will help in taking this additive manufacturing to the next level. Uh, I don't think I will be, I initially thought that I will talk about technology but I'm skipping this because I think most of the people are familiar with the technology and I don't need to touch upon at least the conventional technologies of the FFF or the SLA printing, uh, and I'll skip this. So I hope it's okay with everyone. Uh, metal was discussed in the morning session extensively, where the advantages of the DED, wire EBM, as well as the uh, powder-based technology was discussed and was shown in terms of illustration as to where the powder-based technology become more applicable than the direct energy technology, uh, direct energy deposition or the wire uh, EDM or a beam technology, all were discussed. So I'm not going to, I'm, I think if you permit me, I'll try to skip this as well. What was uh, not talked about, and I think, uh, I would touch upon that is a, a new technology which has come up called the Adam technology. In the Adam technology, if hey you everyone, look at I'm it, I'm here to talk today about the Mark can you hear it? process. It's a simple, safe, and cost effective yes, yes. to go from design uh, to functional metal part. There are three steps in this process printing, washing, and then sintering. First, let's start with CAD. You design your part, then export to STL and upload it to Iger. Iger is a cloud-based slicing and print management system that comes with every MarkForge product. This automatically configures your part based on the material and printer you've selected. When your part slices for metal 3D printing, it gets scaled up to account for shrink and deformation in the downstream processes. It then slices your part into discrete layers, identifies overhang features, and builds supports and a raft underneath your part. As we go through printing, washing, and sintering, Iger will monitor the part's progress along the way. Let's start this print and go to the Metal X. Before starting a print, the machine automatically maps and levels the bed to ensure the first layer goes down well. Your print is built of two materials stored in this heated chamber above. One of ceramic release material and one of the metal to be printed. This filament material is metal powder safely suspended within a two-part plastic binder. It gets heated and extruded onto the build plate where the part is created layer by layer. The release material gets extruded as an interface between the part and its supports. So that once your part comes out of the furnace, it's easy to remove. Unlike other metal 3D printing systems, this process does not require loose metal powder, resulting in a safer and more cost-efficient workflow. 17.4 stainless steel is loaded now. However, with a quick changeover, the system is capable of printing in stainless steels, tool steels, coppers, ink and L, along with several other materials currently in development. Once your part is finished printing, you'll get a notification. At this point, you can go to the printer, remove the part from the build tray, and clear the bed. Now we have what's called a green part. It doesn't really look or feel like metal. However, a large part of it is comprised of metal powder. Next step, we'll be putting it into wash one for the debind process. The wash one removes the first stage of the binding material. A green part is taken from the printer and placed into the wash basket, which is then lowered into the solvent. Wash times will vary, ranging from a few hours to a few days, depending on the thickest region of your part. After that, it's now called a brown part and is ready for sintering. Let's go over to the furnaces. This is Sinter 2, a furnace designed for mid-volume production runs and larger printed parts. Sintering transforms a print from a lightly bound collection of metal powder to a fully finished metal part. 
First, the temperature ramps slowly to burn away the trace amounts of remaining binding material. Then, the temperature ramps closer to the melting point of the material, allowing metal particles to start to fuse together to create a strong metal part. Mark IV sintering furnaces use a carbon-free retort to ensure part quality and alloy composition standards are met for our finished pieces. Each run takes about a day and can be monitored remotely using the Iger software. Once a run is complete, the center tray full of finished metal pieces can be removed from the furnace. Once removed from the raft, these parts are ready for use. In the furnace, the layer of printed release material between supports and the raft and your printed part remains powderized. This allows the structure to be tacked to the raft to better control shrink and accuracy throughout the process, but also an easy release after sintering. At this stage, your part is fully sintered and ready to be used. It can be post-machined, polished, or otherwise processed as necessary for the final application. But in many uses, the accuracy and strength are good enough as is. It's ready for install. Check out markforge.com for more information about our simple, safe, and cost-effective method of metal additive manufacturing. I hope this gave you an idea of what I meant by a new technology where you didn't need the CNC machine, you didn't need the wire EDM, and one of the speakers did talk about ready to use parts, and it does not require you to have the difficulty of changing the powder or changing the metal for different metal parts to be printed. So on within a minute, you can change it over to copper or to inconel or to any other material. So we think that this is a game changer for various applications for producing the parts in metal. So it does not also lead to any powder flying when you have to take out the part. It does not require too much of uh, uh, cleaning up of the parts as well as sintering, as well as the debinding process is a clean process. So today you have even tools, uh, filaments in A2, D2, H13, apart from the stainless steel, copper, and ink color. The second process, which was not discussed and I thought would be very relevant, is the, so far, only the laser spot was used to do the melting of the polymer and making the parts in polymer. There was a new technology which was introduced by HP called MJF technology. In the MJF technology, like inkjet printer, you are no longer typing one dot by one dot by one dot, but you are able to do 16,000 dots in one go, which means you almost do printing as if it's a full uh, page printing, which is being attempted. If I share with you how it is done. To reinvent 3D printing, HP engineers went to the very core of 3D printing science, the voxel. Think pixel, but in the 3D space. Unlike conventional 3D printing, transforming part properties voxel by voxel allows for fully functional prototypes and final parts today and limitless applications for the future. HP Multi-Jet Fusion applies proprietary liquids onto the printer bed at 340 million voxels per second, each measuring one-third the width of a human hair. Next, our proprietary heat fusion process affects the structural properties of each voxel, resulting in... Oh. Precise detail and advanced mechanical properties. Our agents, print bar and heat fusion process make multi-jet fusion a totally new 3D printing technology. One that delivers consistently high quality parts, faster, all at a lower cost. And it can all be scaled to produce larger size parts or more parts per day. That's the kind of tangible proof industry needs to reinvent manufacturing and shift away from traditional methods. And shifting, they are. It appears the next industrial revolution is in full gear. So I think this gave you an idea of how the polymer printing can be done very fast and can reach the production level. So today, we produce from our service center at least about 2,000 parts per day. So that gives you an idea of how much production can be done, small parts. If there are big parts, during the COVID period, we, we produced in about 
30 days time, more than two lakh parts, which were used for the ventilators, they were airtight, they were watertight, and they could be directly used because they were accurate and, they, and had good enough finish to be utilized. So the third technology, which was Dick Talk, Dr. I think, uh, uh, and Mr. Anthony did talk, Dr. Anthony talked about it. And then uh, this is a technology of carbon fiber. Now carbon composite are very, very strong. Uh, Shibu, can you hear me? Yes, yes, you're yes, audible. You're on... Okay. And the videos were also audible, no? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. So the third technology which is there is the con while the composite can be a mixture of the matrix material like nylon or patchy or any of them and then in that you mix up very microfiber of the carbon to make it a carbon composite but the strength though get improved over the abs or patchy or uh, peak but it does not give you the strength of a continuous fiber like in a concrete structure you reinforce it with steel bar in a plastic part, you can reinforce it with different type of fibers. These fibers can be carbon fiber, they can be Kevlar, they can be uh, glass fiber. Depending on the usage, you use these different type of fibers to get that uh, 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 significant strength. And the software allows you to do the orientation of the fiber in the XY at any angle. And therefore, you get in the XY a very strong properties in any of those directions. So if I can show you. If you look at it, this is the printing which is going on. The, the same technology as was shown in the metal is also used in the carbon. To so, understand the profound impact of being able to 3D print metal parts like these, just look at look around you and the world around you. This is industrial. I mean, this is a different scale. The Mark Forge every year is like a new breakthrough. With this new printer, you print materials you already know how to use. There's no learning curve. Sorry. You can bring that magic right into your office. You start to print tonight, and the next day. You're so you can print continuous fiber directly on the printer, and you can lay it up in any direction which you would like to do. So that gives you the capability of making very, very strong parts on the in the plastic or in the carbon composite. The fourth technology which was also not talked about very much was the SLA technology. I think the Form Lab did a fantastic job from their earlier version of the Form 2 to the Form 3 and now the 3B as well as the 3L which is a very large size printing. What they did, they in they improved the tank to make it a flexible tank. As a result, the parts don't get pulled out from the build plate. And secondly, they made the laser enclosed. As a result, the problem of resin going and hitting the laser does not come in. And it gives the high reliability. So if you look at it, this is the curved bed which was there and as the, uh, the plate moves, it becomes 90 degree. And since it becomes 90 degree, you are able to get far, far higher accuracy. Today, you are able to achieve 25 micron accuracy on this. And they introduce a large number of raisins, which are suitable for high strength, high uh, uh, the clear raisins. They introduce bio raisins, which are fully biocompatible. 
they introduce resins which are flexible with 50A or 80A shore, so you can make rubber-like components, and they are used as a rubber-like components. So with this, they are able to achieve a very high accuracy, uh, and today it is being used both for jewelry and for dental. Practically 90% of the jewelers and the uh, uh, dental people are using the form lab for different applications. Uh, of course, there was a touch upon the bioprinting, where the bio inks are also being used for doing the printing, and we work with bio inks extensively and work with various institutes as well as the medical uh, organizations in this area of pharmacy and to print the, the tissues. So this is one of the printers which we are manufacturing ourselves as well as we are giving it to the different institute for different applications. So in this, what we did, we introduced a concept that instead of having different type of machines being purchased, you can have one machine and in which you can change the extruders to be able to make a syringe based printer, printer which can be used for silicone uh, and material like this. On the same machine, you can print pink and you can also do the engraving you, or the cutting using the laser. You also have a CNC tool head, so you can do a little bit of a CNC work as well, apart from doing the work of printing the polymers and things like that. So these are the different type of materials which can be printed using this type of a technology. And these are the type of extruders which come. So we even printed the epoxy by combining the two materials in C2 which is a critical requirement for printing the epoxy as one of the layers during the print process. So having said that, today the materials which are available are very large range, which is metal, resin, nylon, thermoplastic, including high temperature thermoplastic, fibers, carbon fibers, and ceramic. We work with all of them. And I think Dr. Bermani also touched upon the design for additive manufacturing and the significance of design for additive manufacturing. I think this is one of those examples where it was used for light weighting. And I like to touch upon one issue here, one of the key advantages why we do light weighting apart from the temperature conductivity as well as for the purpose of different uh, needs is it reduces the cost of doing the printing. And since it reduces the cost of printing, our production run, many of the parts when done with optimized design without compromising on the functionality, my cost of part comes down. So there was a company which was making the LED lights. He came to us and we did the design for additive manufacturing. His conventional aluminum extrusion with paper insulation was costing him about 650 rupees. It started costing him 430 rupees once we did design for additive. And the same thing when we did it without design for additive manufacturing was costing him 2,200 rupees. So he would have just been happy with the prototype. But once you did the design for additive manufacturing, you were able to reduce the cost and were able to make it production run. There is another company which is special purpose machinery manufacturer. He had 300 components and he had an inventory of 6,000 K bins in which the parts were being kept. Once they started using the additive manufacturing, all bins vanished because now they can, they are free to make changes in the design instead of getting limited by the design, the part which is already available uh, for the new design to be done. So design for additive manufacturing and 3D printing combined together is reducing significant inventory and cost uh, if we adopt design for additive manufacturing judiciously. Some of the defense parts, if you just look at it, this was uh, developing the flexible coupling with different designs and different material. So one of our preferred material was onyx combined with carbon fiber. Uh, continuous fiber for high torque applications. And in this case, we were able to get as much as 750 nanometer torque, 
which is very very high typically it would have been done in stainless steel or would have been done in titanium so we use the carbon fiber and the peak as a combination Uh, another example, I think uh, I would have been very happy to show it to Dr. Anil Kumar. One of his groups worked on the pipe for the cryogenic engine and we modified the process of printing where we used one additional axis, which is a rotating axis along with the X, Y, and Z. So we printed it, many of you are familiar with FDM process. The printing is done in the X and Y and then the bed goes down and the Z get printed. In this case, we printed it on a rotating axis at any of the angles. And to make it isotropic, we also use the length, uh, the extruder moving along the length. And by doing it, we were able to make the pipes which are peak uh, with carbon fiber. So it gave a very, very high strength. And they are now doing the testing for the cryogenic engine tubing uh, using the same technology. Uh, another nice example, which I think is very relevant, is a battery box. And this is being used for electronic vehicle, for the drones, as well as for uh, different uh, vehicles being used by the defense. So you can use a combination of uh, carbon fiber with peak and peer or any of the PSU polymer to do the uh, battery boxes. Uh, now we have even introduced the uh, uh, ESD material, so you don't have a, you can use the ESD material or a uh, material which can be a fire retardant material. So using a fire retardant material, you are relatively safe that there will be no flame, even if there is some short circuit, which can happen in a, uh, in a box in which the electronic is housed. Uh, another nice example which we worked upon using an SLA technology and a flexible material with about 80A short strength is the bellow. And this is a fairly large bellow uh, in which the uh, it moves as flexibly as they could have done it and it got done in less than a day's time. So uh, imagine a bellow being made in a rubber-like material in one day time. This was again done for VSSE using this. Uh, so Dr. Bermani was here and I think we worked with Honeywell to give a different type of uh, graphene uh, usage by them. Uh, and we used the graphene plus the metal powder combined together and worked on the 3D printer, which you just saw, where we could combine the paste along with uh, uh, other things to be able to print it out. So you can create your own material and test the additive capability, which is ideal for a research institute or for an educational institute. Here are some more examples of hand jigs, uh, lid plates, display cover for electronics, filament guide rolls, display cover for electronic applications using the fire retardant materials or the impellers for the, in fact, in one of the machines, they took it to the ship and we used it for making the parts. So I'll share with you that example as well. In defense and army, typically you need ruggedness and uh, for the parts. And I think the uh, onyx with carbon fiber or the peak gives far, far higher strength. And now we can combine peak with carbon fiber to be able to achieve that. An example of it, is that when a vehicle is moving in the night, you need the hatch plugs to be able to see inside the vehicle as to what is ahead. So these are night cameras. This was typically being made in metal. Now using the carbon fiber, this could be done and the cost could be significantly reduced from $800 to $230. This is actual example of a US Army being using the same. So I'll skip this. Uh, there was another example of a US Marine trying to test the different type of uh, uh, bombs and making the outer casing with the help of the uh, 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 carbon composites. Uh, I think what is critical as a technology 
is not just for usage within the safe environment. Uh, today, the demand has started coming both from the Indian uh, uh, Defense Forces as well as it is uh, also being used by the US forces where the machine had to be made such that it is mid grade and it is the packing is such that it is satisfying the Pelican AL3232 single lid uh, mechanism and the machine could be carried, the parts could be carried, the components could be carried and the manufacturing of the parts could be done both on the ship as well as on the vehicle directly. So you didn't have to create a separate room for doing the same. And therefore the Mark Forge as one of the companies worked on the same. And today you have the machine here, you have the components, you have the spools and you have the casing in which the machine does not move. And you just start using it from whether you are using it on the vehicle or you're using it on the ship or you're using it on the aircraft. Uh, all of us have talked about the mechanical applications. Uh, I thought that it is equally relevant to talk about how the 3D printing is being used now for by some of the Indian of, uh, armed forces to make what used to be called as a model for doing the planning of the defense forces movement. So using the satellite image, you can get very accurate 3D model of the uh, terrain. And with that, one can do line of sight planning, one can do the logistic movement and other applications. Uh, the third, ap second application, which uh, was talked about is that can we make the full electronic including the PCB material, which is dielectric, which is critical for making the antennas. And especially when you're talking of 5G and 6G, these antennas become very relevant and they are very, very small in size. So using the 3D printer, you are able to make 32 layers simultaneously. And instead of mounting the components on the top and the bottom, you could mount them inside as well because using 3D printing, you can leave the cavity where the mounting need to be done. The capacitors, resistance can, or some of the passive components like inductance can directly be printed using the electronic inks. So today you have the conductive inks which are being used as well as the dielectric from which you make the PCB and you are able to make a very dense component uh, part uh, very uh, quickly as a single component. So you don't have the dry soldering as a common problem, which is a common problem which happens. Uh, another application which I wanted to touch upon and which we work with is the civil, in the civil, civil engineering space is the use of uh, 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 clay and uh, different uh, sand to make the 3D printed parts. Why is it necessary for defense? I saw one of the applications with the defense forces were using in the uh, uh, Middle East during the war was to create tea walls and uh, uh, protective barriers, which one could also uh, uh, use. And they use the 3D printing very intelligently where they use the curved uh, walls and in between, they left a hollow, this thing, where they put a lot of golf balls because golf balls are very hard and they change the direction of the force which is uh, coming from a bullet or from a bomb. As a result, they became much more protective and at the same time, the thickness and the weight of these uh, protective barriers was far, far smaller, so uh, far lesser. So you could use in the defense forces applications which are little offbeat, which do not require so much of classification, with the, which can be certified a lot more easily, uh, and they are low-hanging fruits in the defense forces. Uh, I also thought that maybe because over a period of time, the drones is becoming a common requirement in every area, whether it's uh, carrying the medicine or food, or it is to carry some of the weaponry uh, as well. So 
today we as a company have been working with a lot of drone companies in making the different components which would also be necessary for the mro as well because these components need to be replaced so if you look at the complex structures which have been worked upon uh, for the camera for the uh, structural elements for this thing and embedded with carbon continuous fiber to give them the strength and work uh, uh, almost like an aluminium part right so in brief this is what i wanted to share with you and i thought that maybe uh, in air it gives you an idea of how the technology is moving and how we as a company as a droidic as a company can support you in doing the proof of concept in trying out the different parts and trying different technologies and uh, how at the design level we can participate along with you to be able to do the proving and then subsequently doing the production without you making that much of an investment thank you very much hello yes yes uh, uh, surup ji thank you so much for your uh, insightful presentations uh, i think uh, it covered almost uh, all the aspects of what can be offered when it comes to resin or or metal or uh, thermoplastic uh, so you covered a very very broad uh, spectrum in terms of the offerings that you also have in services thank you sir shyans for your time and uh, we can start the presentation yeah thank you mm. anybody can see this everybody can see this my screen yeah yeah we can see your screen and we can start yeah please thank you okay. thank you dr shubhu john giving this particular platform to present our machine make in india machine and uh, then uh, we will start with this particular s mechanical group company uh, what we belongs to the, the group we are hardcore machine builders uh, this particularly started with the mechanical gratic in 1973 73 uh, founded by technocrats all our technocrats and then we slowly moved to progati automation which is the largest uh, cnc turret manufacturing in the second world just world largest cnc turret manufacturing and then our uh, flagship company is designer which is mainly in uh, cnc lathe manufacturing in the turning solutions this is found in 1979 and subsequent oh. micromatic machine tool this is uh, this is a sales and marketing company for all these group companies this is formed in 18, 1987 and then ams the s manufacturing company we are formed in this particular for the machining solution for this vmc hmc and then 5s6 machining total group till that we have the capacity of 10000 machines per year we are producing and then till that more than 95000 we have machine sold across the globe also and then uh, we have the some uh, iot industry uh, 4.0 and iot company which is uh, 2002 we have firm and then apart from these we have some uh, plastic forging and the uh, machining companies and then 2018 we found we formed this ames solution with a joint venture between as designer and ams this is called as ams called as ames solution to to make a make in india machine only because we are hardcore machine builder we are a one motor to sell this particular machines uh, this is my uh, agenda of this particular today's meeting why uh, additive manufacturing already all this particular speakers they have already covered this and then am for aerospace and then uh, process validation okay uh, i will do script this particular presentation for process validation and some case study yeah. and then um, about ames what the ames machines we have uh, uh, designed this particular things so 3d printing is one of the disruptive technologies if you compare this all this particular iot kind of things cloud technology energy automation robotics how we can leverage this particular capability of 3d printing it's up to you up to us only uh, this has the some advantages and some hypes are there but how we uh, has to take up this particular additive manufacturing to, to leverage the advantages one of the advantages is uh, already they have already previous uh, speakers they have explained in details all the advantages 
वन थिंग आई वॉन्टेड टू पॉइंट इट आउट जस्ट नाउ वामन कुलकर्णी ऑल्सो टोल डी दैट डी एफ एम सो वॉट आर द डिजाइन्स आर अवेलेबल इन द मार्केट टिल डेट टिल डेट वॉट आर द डिजाइन्स यू कैन टेक एनी डिजाइन्स वॉट एवर द डिजाइनर थिंग्स प्रीवियसली बाय कीपिंग इन माइंड वॉट आर द मैन्युफैक्चरिंग प्रोसेस आर अवेलेबल means previously there is a casting forging machining fabrication welding brazing etc etc all the processes are available according to the processes are available he has designed their own design by keeping in mind the the processes are available nobody thinking the advantages of additive manufacturing there is a complex city parts we can produce in the additive manufacturing part cover reductions so we have to add the value we have to add the value by design for additive manufacturing so there is a separate topics are there uh, uh, basically uh, this is aerospace defense industries are there so there is a weight reduction will definitely give this particular uh, carbon footprint saving on this uh, aerospace uh, total weight of the aerospace these are some examples are there by putting the topology optimization and lattice structures we can uh, reduce down this particular uh, 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 the component weight and can, it can be possible by 3d printing manufactured by possible by 3d printing second will be the part cover reductions uh, already so many speakers have uh, uh, shown this particular ge catalyst engine and then if you see the cost effective manufacturing by per kg weight from automobile to aircraft design to aerospace if you say this per One kg of engine, the huge amount of this particular monetary benefits are there on the thirty, forty years of life of this particular aircraft, and then, uh, and then subsequently to reduce down the carbon footprint also. And then there is on-demand manufacturing. We have some uh, case study. I will show you in the next slide what are the on-demand manufacturing. How we have given. this particular service is to ursc for their chandrayaan mission also second will be the am for aerospace industry and then uh, uh, what are the product lines are there this particular gas turbine engine parts are there according to engine parts there are so many engine parts are there there is a stringent requirement to qualify this particular engine component by additive so many uh, uh, certification bodies are there ffa same like already mentioned by waman kunkan sir also but they the the, the 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 particular certification requirement for different companies different, different. I, rather than going to rotational engine component we have to concentrate on the internal structure also there is a two two different scenario for aerospace also if we concentrate on the aero ducts this particular seat chamber work and seat and caps wall panels so many are there there is a part screening uh, softwares are there or we have to part screening what are the daily available particular component how we can twist the design how we can do the complexity adding the complexity and then how we can add the value Add the value by topology optimization, part count reduction, and it can be best suitable for additive manufacturing. What are the different technologies are available in additive manufacturing? We have to think. Our designer has to train like that only to how we can convert conventional manufacturing design. Rather than there is just some stringent requirement for engine component. Let's see. First, we start with internal structure. Then slowly we can move to engine components. Need that particular process. My 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 intention or my experience is that rather than going to particular uh, stringent requirement of aerospace component, we have to qualify our process itself. Means how we can qualify the process itself. Once we we started with the, our part, starting from the powder to uh, simulation and then printing parameters. Then once we for means uh, standardize our particular process itself definitely it will easy for us to qualify all the certification levels including ffa semi lab all conductors so starting with the powder we have to check with the powder what are the 
manufacturing of this particular powders either it is a water atomized gas atomized and then ega and then plasma atomized we have to check with this and then we have to certify this particular powder by particular uh, testing in house testing facility we have to develop our uh, process to qualify this particular powder by particular apparent density and then uh, then checking this morphology and phd phd also and then uh, some kind of uh, what kind of uh, uh, internal defects are there agglomerations are then particle size distributions are there we have to check it we have to establish it we have to print some coupon we have to uh, document it for the traceability point of point how many times this powder can be used means one if you take the ss316 or if you take the i6 solids how many times i can reuse this powder means first use powder second time use powder 11 time use powder we have to test this coupon by density microstructure analysis and this particular uh, uh, mechanical properties then once we have some particular structure in house itself we will definitely it will be easier to go to any certification body rather than astm similac once we have the uh, documented information we will definitely represent and then anybody can anybody can represent it and uh, go for the certification kind of things second we will come to into the, the particular the other process parameters how there is a if i am not wrong for powder by technology 244 or 260 parameters we can vary mainly this uh, some i have identified here this particular power scanning speed apart from this there is a fill counter there is a border n number of borders we can then down skin up skin we have to play with all the kind of things third will be the process simulation uh, now in the market uh, if i am not wrong the semi fact is available then net fab is available then the alter is available and then n number of simulation software is where we can check the distortion level temperature distribution and the stress stress analysis what are these are the predictive software the, by developed by this particular algorithm we have to print it before the small test coupon and we have to fill this particular distortion level so uh, it 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 will cover the almost 91 to 95% uh, uh, predictions then we have to check the prediction level to qualify this particular before going to print this particular part once we have this particular distortion level definitely we can add the supports wherever required to avoid the distortion to avoid the uh, heat dissipation means uh, to give the good heat dissipations so next will be this particular mechanical properties there is a standard processor we are following ms we are we are following this this particular microstructure analysis in cell coupons we have to print it if required if required crip test fatigue life improvements uh, fatigue some sample low cycle fatigue high cycle fatigue with high temperature low temperature and then the impact test also and then uh, second will be the, this particular we have to check this particular microstructure analysis and then the hardness levels with uh, with the particular predefined uh, points only we have developed our own standards to qualify our factory test uh, acceptance machines also to go, to qualify all this particular test second will be the we have to check this particular entity test also what our process but combination of powder combination of process combination of laser process parameter and then uh, the, the heat treatment what we have given we have to check this particular porosity level there is a, some instruments are available even also software prediction software are available where they can predict by combination of these with combination of matter properties what are the 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 ttt diagram or cct diagram that particular material and with giving the heat heat input by laser power and scanning speed they will predict it and there is uh, testing are available we have to check this particular uh, density level or porosity level and then we have to correlate this particular with the process parameter with the post processing what kind of heat treatment cycles we are given to this and what kind of expected expected is 99.99 98.99 what are the density level and the porosity level and then we have to go this particular crack levels also we have to check with the ndt levels second third 
third will be this particular uh, as per the ASTM standard of 52902 and then 52941 there is a standards now they have published kind of things to, we have to go for the dimensional accuracy of this particular machine what we have developed our machines we have to qualify our machine also to sell with this particular aerospace market we have to qualify our machines also the for this particular uh, small intricate shapes uh, holes how which can be produced uh, there is some standards are available below 45 you cannot produce below 35 we cannot produce this supports are required how our machine uh, uh, laser and scanner combination give the uh, smallest uh, printing accuracy we have to qualify and there are some standards are available for design and materials process and terminology and test metals we are following this particular standards for our machine qualification and process qualification what are the product printed in our machine we have to uh, establish particular uh, this kind of this particular uh, processes itself third will be the i am jumping to the case study directly because i had to more concentrated about the machine parak machine what we have uh, design and, and we to we have to showcase some case studies are there if you see this particular first case study we have created in ls at nmg for vsc space application and then then if you see this small intricate shapes what we have printed It's a delicate intricate shapes, and uh, we have printed this particular uh, what you call it, one part inside the another part, so with this part part consolidation, and then we have printed with this 17 hour cycle time. Main benefit will be the saving of tooling cost and reduce the lead time. Definitely, uh, I wanted to, to focus that we have the capability of uh, a number of matter we have developed till date. to bundle with our machine second uh, this is a defense application rf wave guard uh, they previously they have manufactured this particular component by sheet metal and they have welded together particular things there is a uh, uh, reduction over of the 100 parts into one single assembly definitely this is not our design they have the uh, modified this particular Design with the inputs given from us, and then multiple sources, and they have uh, given the design. The 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 the, the more stringent requirement will be this particular leakage test, and then the support inside there is a support is coming. So we have done this particular orientation kind of things, and then we have added dummy walls. Dummy walls to reduce down the supports inside this particular structure, and we have now. After that, we have some slightly machined, and we have supplied in the particular within the 24 hour cycle time. Third, this particular collimator we have supplied to URSC uh, collimator for satellite for ALS and TMC. And then, the, if you see this particular the stringent requirement along the 110 mm length, along the length of 110 mm, we have to maintain this this particular walls for by The laser spot diameter available in the market. What are the existing machines seller? They have the available in the market uh, laser spot diameter in ranging between 50 micron to 80 micron to 120 micron. If you see the 120 micron laser spot diameter to overlap kind of things with the heat affected zone, and then the powder surrounding is sticking to the wall. It is very difficult to maintain the 0.3 mm. so we had done this particular analysis we our researcher we have done so many test coupon to validate the 0.3 mm with the surface finish requirement also and then we had developed a special post processing method also to clean up to clean up this particular uh, walls to to give the good surface finish and there is a no leakage requirement in signals there is specific requirement and then we have printed 40 hours uh, four parts in the 40 hours and then uh, in this particular als at the nmg material fourth will be the this uh, again the defense application to it is a uh, it is a uh, what you call a body scanner in this airport they the instrument electronic instrument plus in this particular thing is a casing 
for this uh, housing kind of things. We have printed this particular uh, in ALS at 10 mg. Previously, there is a they 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 wanted to they are manufacturing by PDC tooling and then pressure like casting. If I am not wrong, yeah, pressure like casting. And then uh, uh, within 36 hours, we have printed two components. There is urgent requirement, and then we had done some post processing equipment of. Uh, anodizing on this particular ALS at 10 mg, specific requirement of oh, 0.3 mm thickness, 0.3 to 0.5 mm thickness of this particular anodizing requirements are there. We have established this particular process with uh, printing, orientation, and then machining also, and then this particular post processing. This application is the thruster part. Uh, recently, this is came from this particular uh, uh, Latin America. Uh, that's for the particular for aerospace application, and then there's a stringent requirement uh, is there. If you see the inside, there is small intricate holes are there along the along the length. We have to maintain this particular uh, ovality or concentricity of this particular hole. If you see SS three one six almost 40% elongation material means after printing we have to go to for this particular machining it is a very ductile material and because of chromium and kind of things are there and then the support trim wall is a tedious job we have to play with this particular process parameter to to give the less energy density for the support because it is a hollow inside and this particular uh, this particular holes we have to print almost 30 40 mm along the length so it is very difficult to hold this particular parts and second the support optimizations so we had done this particular monolith structures this particular with the faster time to the market and now now we have provided uh, now it is gone to um, prototype application to batch production now because we have qualified this particular all the their requirement their specific requirement of that particular company we have qualified we have supplied this particular first batch then the test coupon the tensile coupon and then uh, what you call the microstructure analysis and then particular uh, some kind of phase analysis they are required we have supplied very enough and then uh, uh, now we are going to a particular for batch production company. This is the exhaust mixture we wanted to showcase this particular actual, actual photograph of our MS machine inside the 400 by 400 by 400 with a twin laser machine with one kilowatt twin laser machine means it is a high productive machines. We have printed less than 17 hours all this particular big side components for this aerospace application and then we wanted to try this particular internal alloys because high temperature alloys it is a high temperature alloy to check this particular temperature distribution and how much temperature it can withstand some some testings are going on still that and then very soon we will this particular qualify this also this particular not only product but the metal itself it is a metal qualifications are going on and then complex structure can be possible by this particular things. Uh, fourth one will be the just in time. Just now I told you in the previous slide itself. Uh, the 3D printing required uh, once uh, this particular uh, uh, URSC came into the company. We have supplied too many parts also. There is a Chandrayaan mission. Uh, unfortunately, it has been failed. But uh, once the rover will move this particular moon surface, in this particular last rover, they have put this particular emblem, Ashok Chakra emblem, where the impression on this particular moon surface will come into picture. And then in this particular, just in time, within eight hours, it is almost two or three hours printing, plus particular machine cleaning, and then the design validation because it has a curve. Curvature surface, it has split into one, two, three, four, six parts differently. And then um, we, we had to check the design feasibility. And within all these particular projects, we had delivered with, within the eight hours. Means it is a just in time consensus where we have added the value. B, B means additive manufacturing advantages. The process advantages are there. We have added the value. 
okay so this is the case studies are there now uh, time to show our this particular machine what we have developed our machine first machine by keeping in mind what are the restriction what are this particular current uh, limitations available in the market for the selling of this particular european man machine manufacturer we are keeping in eye we have developed a 400 size machine this is the particular high powered laser powder bed fusions means it is has a uh, two lasers with 1 kilowatt each means in case if you want to go for productive kind of things currently what are the other machine manufacturers are providing up to 30 micron 60 micron 80 micron maximum 100 micron definitely for production purpose if you really want to reduce down the manufacturing cost of the product we have to go for higher layer thickness higher layer thickness definitely somehow we have to go for the higher power laser somehow and then for this keeping in mind even also high temperature alloys by keeping in this particular in corner tungsten carbide required the high magnetic point of things we have to go for high kilowatt lasers second will be the large building volume with higher productivity third will be the all this because we believe all 60 years what we have the machine building experience we believe once we open this particular machine more and more trust will generate and then to taking all this particular uh, thing into mind all the laser process parameters including all this particular power scanning speed almost 250 parameters we are fully editable parameters with multiple matrices with layer thickness and definitely our machines can be open for all powder sources there is no restriction kind of things that this powder can be used this powder this particular matrix can be used in our machine and then we have the less recording time to, we have the bidirectional recorder systems with the multiple technology patented technology so with the minimum uh, recording time what we have given to this particular uh, motor without disturbing the uh, powder spreading quality along the 400 by 400 we have reduced down to minimum to 3 seconds and some of the distinct features are there our machines it is a smart motor manufacturing system means if you see this if you want to really want to high high particular product for the aerospace there is a no stoppage is required no machine pause is required once the machine will pause the line marks will come and definitely it will disqualify this particular by keeping in mind we have put some sensor some particular our algorithm our train our innovative ideas and we have patented this technology it the machine will give the alarm or the machine will sense it what are the powder available in the hopper and according to the height uh, machine uh, part height it will give this particular indication to the mobile and the particular screen also the how much powder is required how much powder will go to this particular over overflow kind of things and uh, how much you wanted to put after sometimes means if there is a 20 hours job are there and then after 10 hours you have to put this kind of particular powder so this machine can speak this particular kind of things second is a real time monitoring and control of machine like the iot kind of things means uh, what are the quality after printing each layer the uh, the, the 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 machine take this particular picture and then in particular deformation level and then heat mapping all kind of terms this uh, machine can be uh, do the real time monitoring no need to uh, watch continuously the machine how this particular problem happens and if if i take this particular six days build and then after five builds we realize that something is happened on the day three and we don't realize and the supports has broken down the this particular leaf has been broken down so this particular disadvantage 
by experience we have taken care and we have uh, developed this particular real time monitoring of this particular machines and then we have this particular machine hand holding and support uh, 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 earlier mentioned in this particular first slide for this all group companies we have dedicated my uh, one different uh, one company it is called as micromatic we have the more than 80 90 cities we have the offices where uh, 250 plus engineer dedicatedly looking for the supports and the kind of things and then uh, as you know we are the hardcore cnc machine manufacturer we will give you the complete end to end suit means the from this particular design software to this particular printing kind of things and then fire access and post processing kind of things it is a, a enhanced user friendly machines and then uh, yeah, what are the sub system class systems are there or components are there we have used uh, all this particular standard components um i think some background is there somebody somebody can note this particular things so can i can go ahead okay thank you very much and then uh, what are the lasers what are the scanners are used uh, what are the particular server drives we are used a uh, best in sub class systems and then faster roi of the printing point definitely all this particular uh, advantage is clobber in this particular machining we have you can get the faster and uh, these are the specification i already uh, uh, stated that 410 by 410 by 450 height will be the bigger and then two 1000 watt fiber lasers are there and then the scanning speed is uh, what uh, the scanner has given this particular up to 9 meter per second we can give mist uh, and then their thickness till date we are qualified up to the 100 micron layer thickness for this particular materials and then laser beam focus diameter is 80 micron to 120 there is a uh, we are using the various scan where on the borders you can use this particular 80 micron to to improve the surface finish and in the core we can to improve the productivity you can use the uh, 120 micron this particular uh, beam focus diameter three quarter type by keeping in mind by the experience we came to know that once the recorder has been damaged or soft recorder we have to pause the machine we have to open the machine we have to change the particular process and it will take the so much time so all this uh, particular experience come into picture we have designed all this particular bidirectional recorder multi blade recorder systems where without pausing this particular uh, all this particular with that quick change of time we can change this particular recorder inside and then dimensions and weights are there machines second machine by keeping in mind all iit or institute all this particular uh, dental industry all medical industry and then just now if i'm not wrong kamal kobar has asking one question about this gold printing also Uh, by keeping all this particular miles we had developed a small machine definitely we are going for this particular certification all kind of things also uh, this is a bid volume of diametrical 180 mm uh, with height of 200 mm we have given uh, 200 watt laser also 400 watt laser so it is op optional kind of things and then scanning speed is up to 5 to 7 meter per second here by keeping in mind the small product we 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 are focusing but particular laser layer thickness of 30 micron to 60 microns same recorder time uh, the quarter is we are proposing here and then dimension and weight you can see and then uh, uh, the what we developed our machine it is powered by materialize the materialize what they have given uh it is a particular magic software support generation software apart from this all this particular our machine is bundled with perpetual license of materialize magic and then the print control hardware and software developed in the collaboration with materialize all this particular build processor what are this particular strategy to print means the meander pattern stripe width then particular laser power and then scanning speed all the process parameter developed for each and every material we had collaboration with uh, materials 
we have developed with Materwise. And this machine design, whatever machine we have designed with our own experience means X, Y, Z calibration, this recorder calibration, and then the loader calibration, apart from this particular part calibrations, all we have machine design and configure and validated by Materwise team from Belgium. The AMG advantages, uh, just now in previous uh, slides, I, I, I had touched these particular things. Uh, there's a big advantages. Over 60 service centers uh, we have the, across the all over India. Almost 250 service engineers are there in this particular uh, service centers. Main time to respond all these particular, our existing customers. What are the our 70,000 plus existing customer of Ace Micrometric Group? Uh, mean time to respond is less than four hours. And locally available spare parts because we are present each and every city of this particular Indian map. And then service team from the factory available at short notice. We, apart from this, we have the nine tech centers with AM experience homes where you can see our particular machine, you can go, you can test this particular, you wanted to print some parts and then the, definitely in the tech center, definitely in future, our each tech center, we, we have the one machines available in future also, where definitely you can test our particular, check uh, uh, your print capability, your, uh, print capability and print qualification also. Uh, as you know, we all came from the research and development background. All this, we are doing this continuous research in collaboration with academia also. What we have started with the industry academy collaborations, and then we have tied up with multiple technologies being developed with association with uh, all this university. Not only powder word technology we are focusing, we are also focusing up all other technologies available, just like LMD, DD, all we have tied up with each and every university. And definitely in future, we will give you one-stop solution for this additive manufacturing metals. Definitely in future, MS will be the one-stop solution. Whatever you want this particular in metal, definitely all the machines will be available in the MS. So conclusion, okay. Uh, it's a high productivity uh, uh, printing parameters with the volume. Aid. We have developed our own build processor with this particular high productivity parameters. If you definitely want to go to jump to 120 micron with with uh, high quality, definitely we we'll give this particular things. Dual laser. Already, uh, I told you the we have the one kilowatt uh, two lasers. If the customer is want, definitely we are working on the quad laser also, and then the bigger platform also. We have the, some future plans. Rich building machine experience. Almost uh, last sixty years, we are developing this particular uh, things kind of things, and then. Uh, Definitely, we have a most so repeated customers are base are there. Definitely, we have a rich building experience, and then we have the global presence also in the American market also, and uh, locally available spare parts also there with the service engineers. I already covered it this. And then the faster ROI this particular machines. So apart from that, uh, we have the two machines. One is uh, uh, STR 400 by 400, and one is a smaller machine, 180 uh, diameter. So hope I cover this. Yeah, uh, it's the last slide. Thank you so much, uh, Shriyans. Uh, I think uh, we wish uh, MA's a, a very future. I mean, you have already have a, a long vision of. Uh, you know, uh, coming up with various other uh, technologies also. Now that you've started with uh, the the binder jetting uh, technology, but I I, I know that uh, you have a long way to go. And uh, the way the company has been able to structure itself for the last uh, five decades. So wishing you all yes. the best. Uh, and I'm sure when it comes to anything to do with the technology, 
uh, all the participants can definitely reach out to us and we will definitely want to connect with Image. Uh, Image is also our TD Graphy uh, corporate associate member and our conscious effort is to actually also lead the channel to see that you know how this technology can get proper pro proliferation for the end user to benefit from that. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, Shira. thank you all of you. Thank you. And so let me introduce uh, you to uh, Dr. Christ Paul. Christ Paul happens to be uh, a key respondent in uh, additive manufacturing for almost two decades. He's also been a researcher and he's been uh, a key faculty in uh, RRCAT. Uh, and uh, interestingly, they have done some fantastic work and he's also made an indigenous machine, uh, which is an EBM technology and uh, very proud to know that uh, Dr. Yesterday in detail when we discussed uh, of all the good work that you've been doing. So I'm sure uh, it will also encourage uh, uh, our conscious effort to work with, you know, institutes like yours to see that, you know, how training and education can be a lead and also then to benefit companies to uh, probably procure these technologies, maybe partnering it in, in collaboration. So uh, as we discussed in the morning, uh, uh, you know, Wing Commander uh, Ramanji also mentioned about uh, the prospects of looking at an investor panel. You did also mention that with grants, you're also looking at that kind of a model. We can we can definitely see into that subsequently, eventually. But yeah, before that, I think uh, you, we will also have your share of insights to be shared. So I think we will take, take it to the next course. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Doctor. Please, you can start your presentation. Thank you, Dr. John. Uh, is my presentation visible? Yeah, I can see your uh, slide, uh, Doctor. Right. You can yeah. start. And voice is also very clear, right? Yeah. So yes. um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a bit late session, like things are going a bit delayed. So many of the things which were basics, I removed and I tried to focus on the, you know, the main uh, agenda and try to bring the things so that at least we can use the time. And at the same time, we should try to catch up the time in the session so that, you know, it is useful to bring back into the track and complete the time part. So let me introduce uh, what RRCAT is. Most of you must be knowing, but still for completion, I just let me tell you. Raja Ramanna Center for Advanced Technology is a premier R&D institute under Department of Atomic Energy, Government of India, engaged in non-nuclear frontline research areas. Like we are working in the lasers and we are working in the particle accelerators and later related technology. When I talk of the lasers means any laser which is built anywhere in the world you will find a scientist working on this lasers. And if you talk about the particle accelerators, any advanced technology, if you talk of uh, ultra high vacuum, if you talk of uh, RF technology, or you talk of uh, making a neobium processing, or if you talk of you know managing the high end stuffs together and making a high powered magnets, everything is being done here and at RRCAT. We are about 15, 70 employees with 60 external PhD students. We offer 140 plus MTech projects every year. And as far as the PhD is concerned, we have almost equal number of people registered from the department size. We are also considered Institute of Homi Bhava National Institute, a, depart a deemed to be university under Department of Atomic Energy. You can join us through BRC Training School at RRCAT. If you are a PhD having very good career, came up with very bright ideas, then you have the opportunity to join us with K.S. Krishnan Research Associateship, which eventually you can be absorbed by the department after two year work. You can also join PhD program at RRCAT. We offer a PhD program in engineering physics, life sciences, and uh, engineering sciences, specifically in mechanical engineering. We also offer orientation course for on accelerators, lasers, and related science and technology. It really gives a flavor to the PG final year students if they want to pursue their career in the research, they can have a flavor how the research is being done in the country and how the how the things can be taken on the next level if they wish to proceed in the career. Let me come to my lab. We are uh, uh, working at the junction of advanced design methods, material science, manufacturing and material processing techniques. And we are covering full domain from system design and development to material processing to material testing, to qualification and validation, to multi-physics modeling. So that area that we are working on and our efforts to have a research endeavor and collaborations so that we can make uh, groundbreaking high impact results 
and create uh, innovative LAMP technologies. So that is our mission to go ahead with us. This is a team. I have a pretty good team, about 16 people full time working with us. And uh, I'm showing the partial list of the students. These are the four uh, students who are working full time with us. They are PhD scholars. Equal students are being shared with other institutes, for example, IIT Indore, IIT Kanpur, IPR Ahmedabad, and IG Karkalpaknam. So I have uh, eight students working on laser manufacturing technology in our lab beside the 15 full-time employees. This is our recent effort because, you know, when I was going through various, various aspects of this, I realized there is a need to have a textbook in the market and, uh, you know, especially written by Indian authors in Indian style. And, you know, uh, I, I'm happy to share uh, during the lockdown when, you know, there was a lot of tension and pressure, why should not we do some utilize this time and write a book? So last year when it was uh, locked down for the three months, uh, we, we could write this book and it has come very nicely now. And it is now available through Amazon and Flipkart. And to make it competitive in the price, we went to the Macrovilles and the price is also brought down to near 700 rupees so that, you know, it is a very good and available information for the people to work on. And it comprehensively covers all the syllabus proposed by AICT and all the leading academic institute in the country, as well as it has got a flavor of the experience that we earned in last 18 years while working in the area of the additive manufacturing. So with this uh, background, let me tell what uh, we are doing at RRCAT, especially in system development and component development. And then quickly, I'll go to the technology challenges and then summary. And I will not touch, uh, you know, a specific part for the design for manufacturing for this time because of the scarcity of the time. But again, I will try to bring the things uh, in between so that people, uh, we, we will discuss about and we have a comprehensive look about the technology. Uh, what we did is we developed the uh, two kilowatt uh, fiber laser based uh, DD system. And uh, this system has... Uh, I think there is some issue. Just, just a minute. Yeah. Yeah, let it, no problem. Yeah. So this machine is 2 kilowatt fiber laser based system with 5 axis. We have used Siemens 810D controller so that it is easy for industry to adopt. Volume size is 250 by 250 by 250. It can use uh, wire from 2 to 20 meter per minute. Wire diameter can be 1 to 2 meter, millimeter in diameter. And uh, it is also used uh, wire uh, powder from 2 to 20 gram per minute. And this is really fantastic technology that we have developed. And now we are moving this technology to next step to giving to the industries through our incubation process because we have been recognized as one of the leading incubation centers in the country uh, with the declaration by the Honorable Finance Minister on 20th May 2020. So we have an um, incubation center in which industries can come work with us, try to have a taste of that. And to give a flavor of that as a first part, we are offering services you know, in, uh, for the additive manufacturing. So initially people can come give the parts to us, we can make for them, work on the design for additive manufacturing part, make the things happening. And once they have a feel about the machine, definitely the technology can be taken by the industry so that we can go to another level. In the morning when there was a discussion, uh, there was a point that uh, the machines available in the countries are limited to one meter by one meter by, you know, is, is a 400 millimeter by 400 millimeter. But I would like to say here, the machine at RRCAT is not limited to 400 by 400 by 400. We have a DD machine working for 1.6 meter diameter and 1.4 meter length. Especially this machine is built seeking the requirement for the nuclear program that we have in the country. And, and this, this machine is now working uh, very nicely and things are being done, whatever the machine hats we have. We have a plan to add not only uh, working with the 2 kilowatt machine, but recently we are upgrading our lasers to a 10 kilowatt laser so that, you know, we can have a larger beam size available, speed can be done, largest component can be built. And many other features are being incorporated in this machine so that we can have a really big innovation coming into the area of uh, LAMP DED in time to come. Another endeavor, we built a powder bed fusion machine on the 500 watt fiber laser base. This machine is again fully indigenously made. You know, what I want to talk of making indigenous machine, it's not buying the component and assembling that. 
it's it's a making a full machine indigenously getting all your own gui made making your spreading unit made everything is from india and now after getting a very good hands on we are trying to figure out where the problems are there where we should work on and recently we are trying to you know match and make some of that things so that uh, we can reach very fast to the next level and very soon maybe in a year time this technology will be again available for the incubation uh, to the industries and the industries can think of taking this technology and take to the next level you see this is the open part of that you know you might have seen this is the indigenous machine part how the things are building here that i wanted to show you you guys see how the things are being uh, on this machine quickly again the working volume presently we are using 250 by 250 by 250 again here the scanner scanner is presently from a scan lab but agar our own indigenous galvanic scanner is coming very soon and people are working on that layer thickness most of the people are working up to 100 microns here we have a target to go up to 250 micron layer thickness how can it be done and how should we proceed ahead is the matter of the strategy and our team are working in this area now let me tell you about what the recent works we did in the laml specifically in collaboration with so many uh, lead institute If you talk of BRC, if you talk of IGCAR, you talk of IPR, Ahmedabad, Gandhi Nagar, ARCI, Hyderabad, Vikram Sarabhai Space Centre. Definitely, Dr. Anil Kumar is one of our close collaborator to make the things happening for uh, ISRO programs. Then we have uh, IIT Indore, IIT Bombay, IIT Kanpur, IIT Guwahati, IIT Palakkad, and many NITs. So I have around 32 institutes working with us uh, on the different projects, and we are pushing the technology to. Uh, another level in the country with the help of the academia uh this is the one of the finest job that we did for our uh, program see what was happening this is called delero 50 bushes these bushes are used in uh, uh control drive mechanisms of a nuclear reactor you know specifically if you talk of a nuclear submarine or if you talk of a, you know ground reactor we always have a control drive mechanism to control the uh, reactor reaction part and in that particular thing the people use something very small component like a bushes and these bushes having a problem of galling and to reduce the problem the galling this has to be made of either delero or columnar alloys so that is the thing that people try to work on and we have to focus on this so what our friend at igcar were doing us they were they used to take a stainless steel substrate like this and they used to deposit uh, delero 50 or columnar using gtaw on that they used to machine in and out to give the shape and you know what are the basic issue here was delero 50 and columnar uh, 6 is very hard material the hardness is more than 850 vhn and it makes the life very miserable and because of the galling they cannot afford to have any dilution zone in the material so it was very difficult task for them how to measure it and they were taking almost 45 days to machine in and out and making the things happening at igcar what we did is with the dd machine we built very simple giving by helical upward motion and after that we did the machining in and out and as a result thing was reduced to 72 hours so this is the magic that we are talking of uh, doing uh, we using dd technology and additive manufacturing technology in the country and abroad another beautiful example is making a mesh type spaces these are used in fuel cluster simulators of 544 megawatt uh, pressurized heavy water fuel bundle and in this what is happening you see this is a very nice component the dimension is about uh, 120 mm diameter height is about 10 mm and the thickness we are talking about 1 mm with 100 micron um dimension tolerances so people were working on this part and there lot of issues were there and earlier what the conventionally people were trying to do us they used to do wire cut of, of these shapes and you see so many square and triangle and circle and it used to take almost 7 days 7 working days to make one uh, mesh type spaces in using wire edm what we did is we started making this using a powder bed fusion technology and after that this 7 days is reduced to 2 and 1/2 days you know so that is the thing which we wanted and what was happening this particular project wanted 56 uh, mesh type spaces and with the with this our supply the things made big change in that and they could save almost 3 and 1/2 months time in, in, in their project schedule so that sort of thing we are talking how the d uh, lamb laser dye manufacturing technologies is making impact into different applications another beautiful example is making honeycomb shaped orifices for prototype fast beta reactor this is the component which is used for as a as a as a um pressure drop devices 
to facilitate uniform temperature distribution and flow of liquid sodium in the reactor. So this is again we built with the LAM technology. Earlier people tried to make it the many conventional technology including GTAW, conventional casting, investment casting, but success were limited. You know, when we did this, things are going on. Now all of the lot is being planned to build using LAM technology. Another beautiful example, you know, uh, already uh, Mr. Mohan Kulkarni talked about uh, uh, making heat exchangers. Yes, this is a beautiful example, one of the things we are doing. Uh, and these things are uh, basically focused for uh, generation for nuclear reactors, very compact things which is going to come in future. And the first prototype they are expecting to shown by 2030 and uh, many of the solar thermal energy generation part. And all these things will be used in supercritical CO2 Breton cycle based stuff. And what the idea is to have a compact thing, low pressure drop, high effectiveness. And again, idea we we try we built one prototype of 200 millimeter by 200 by 150 millimeter using our present technology. And what was happening in a few conventionally, these things are built by using uh, printed circuit heat heat exchanger technology. And in that, uh, it it is costing around uh, 70 lakhs in Indian rupees if they buy one unit. And we are able to build this in three and a half lakh. Uh, three and a half lakh rupees. You can see how big the price difference is coming on this, and the technology is more uh, environment friendly as compared to the uh, printed circuit technology. So that is making the difference, and we are expecting some 400 units required will be required by 20 to 30. And once you go for the 400 units, you can think of how much saving we are talking when we talk of using this novel additive technology uh, in the domain. With the post Fukushima, we had a lot of pressure to improve the uh, safety and security of uh, reactors. We are also working in uh, making a more reliable reactors, specifically in Zircola I-4. We are working to try to deposit silicon carbide clad layers on uh, Zircola I-4 tubes. Some of the initial experiments were done. We have really good success and things are under process. So here idea is why should we have only Zircola I-4? tubes, why should not we have some silicon carbide deposit on this so that the temperature resistance stability of the tubes can be improved drastically and this is bringing a big change into the nuclear technology in the area. We also worked uh, in depositing copper, specifically using DD technology, which is considered to be difficult to work on and this particular stuff is uh, one of the requirement for our uh, applications specifically when we talk of in situ sensor making, you know, we are, we are talking of uh, making sensor on the component itself. And can we have a dissimilar material junction or made using DD technology so that things can be done? And what I am showing you is the basic results and uh, how the things have come, what was the strength about it, how the microstructure and other things are coming, which is in the public domain. But again, the whole technology is to make in situ sensors using material like copper and copper nick. Um, in kernels so that thing can be brought to another level. We are also working uh, in making the stainless steel composites in the collaboration with NIT Warangal we worked on. Can we have stainless steel mixed with the tungsten carbide so that our performance can be improved? Some of the work is done. It's already published and available in the public domain. Another beautiful example of work is making functionally graded material using LDED. This is the work we collaborated with IIT Kanpur and Institute of Plasma Research. And here objective is to make a deposit molybdenum nano upper copper. And uh, this is the thing which is going to be part of uh, ITER project in France. And you know, we know that in France, we are making international thermal nuclear reactors, experimental reactor over there. And this particular part will be made uh, for, and the component name is plasma driver plates. And idea is to have a 0.5, a 0.3 millimeter thick molybdenum coating upon special copper alloys. And uh, we started depositing on that. And we found that things are not happening in you know, a molybdenum cannot be deposited directly on the copper. So what we did is first we deposited nickel on the copper and then, then we deposited uh, molybdenum on the nickel. So that sort of technology, we started working on it and established the stuff. Now component is being fabricated in our lab and soon this will be dispatched to IPR EPSOS 22 ether for the characterization and testing. We are also making functionally graded material of stainless steel and Delaro 50 for some of the novel applications for the PFPR uh, reactors and things are going to be make big change in that scenario also. We always have been taught that porosity is bad. Another time thing that we took into action and then I was very much convinced porosity is not bad, but our understanding about porosity is bad. So 
that made the things and then i just thought why should not we start making a credit porous structure or come people are working a lot on the lattice structure part so we did the porous graded porous structure you see the porosity is increasing from 60% to 0% as we go on and very nice piece can be distribution distribution can be achieved and if we have very good special distribution available into the part uh, and we have high reproducibility then definitely we can deploy this uh, graded porous technology into various application into, into aerospace and many other where where linear you need to have uh, a different uh, type of material into the place the beauty of this particular technology would be uh, you can have a same density material with the different uh, apparent modulus of elasticity modulus of elasticity which is not possible otherwise using conventional technology you see some of the components we built and uh, the last one you see in the left uh, bottom we have a prototype a hip implant made of titanium some testings were done uh things are again uh, being tried and processed and we are making things happening into the next level of the technology so uh, when we talk of these things uh, from my experience uh, i have seen there are many challenges for our country to proceed on i use this uh, forum to bring them upon and where we should focus and make the things uh, working into the next level see uh, i decide that for us we have nine area to work as, as opportunity um for example machine and software development is one area and uh, process development material feed stock development design for lamp modeling and simulation prioritization and testing controls quality controls and assurance application development education and training so these are the nine areas i'll take one or one by one these areas quickly uh when we talk of machine and software development we know that whatever the machine today we are seeing having a huge capital investment and with the country like india we cannot think of uh, taking this in a very big way if we have machines available in the few crores now issue is can we have some machine built in sub crores you know that that makes the things different and pull ball changing game and we need to have a lot of innovation required at arakat we are trying to build machine specifically uh, for the for the uh, academia which can be not sub crores but can it be you know few tens of lakhs and which will make fetch the lot of academic interest so that sort of things we are trying and maybe very soon we'll have a, a one demo model available and then we'll take it up to incubation and things can be brought to next level we heard a lot about the process development and control you saw a lot of work by us on in the area of this and across the globe people are working on this but issue is can we can we work on a close loop control technology make it to next level so that a better reproducibility can be achieved i'm not saying people are not working in this area but still you know it it's it just start you know things are not to the level it should have been so what i propose is that we need to focus on this we have to bring uh, many new tools to think make the things happening in the direction of process development and control if we talk of material and feed stock now we have few materials coming in and most of the material uh, whatever we are using they are being they are developed for some other applications i guess can we have fine tweaking of the you know composition to better have a better properties or can we go for a new alloy as per the specific application requirement so that those are the areas which we need to explore and material scientists need to work on today we are working on um, design of lamp a really uh, thing which we are trying to do as some of the examples are always cited that they have done full change but if you see most of the work done in the area of laser de manufacturing is direct replacement type or maybe you know look like component fabrication you know it's not like people are starting from that and going on and 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 this has to be done slowly things are coming into the directions in the previous speakers also pointed out this part very clearly we need to have a very nice established design rules and thumb rules so that this particular stuff which is now art can we move to the segment of science and technology which is one of the thing that we have opportunity to work and make the things to next level if we talk of the modeling and simulation we all know that when whenever we talk of the analytical modeling they are not suitable for the complex structures and when we talk of the numerical modeling it takes very long time to achieve it so can we use some nomogram or machine learning uh, useful for the specific machine and the material so that we can have a very faster and very good solutions Uh, our team was working one of the uh, problems like this one phd students full time working on this area but again we are expecting more people to work come on this area and can can we bring a total uh, very widespread modeling and simulation of the process which make the things into different dimension we talk of the characterization testing 
uh, more sophisticated tools are required, as we know that, especially micro city machine and Arista. In many of the applications, we need to go for the simulated load testing, specifically in our applications. So idea is, can we have some standards, you know, some other uh, criteria easily available made so that uh, these things can be done in an economical way. There is a need to have quality control and assurance, you know, some standard like ASME section. Some things are being started, but again, we need to go for a many certifying agencies and guidelines are to be brought in. So this is again a challenge and opportunity in the area of laser manufacturing. There is opportunity for application engineers to come to the uh, new domains, defining various applications, show the capacity and capability demonstrations, go for a dissimilar material processing and how the things are done and great, uh, make the things great. Uh, the last and ninth part, which is most important, is education and training. When whole country is going for uh, another revolutions in the area of manufacturing, there is a need to have a very nice and good curriculum and faculty development program. A lot of things are being done under ATL FTB. Uh, I also am taking many of these things. But again, uh, there is a vacuum and industries and uh, education institutes, especially national labs, all have to come together and make the things happening very much vibrant in the country. With this, uh, I will stop here and uh, complete the, the summary of the, my presentation. AM is a novel methodology capable of providing new manufacturing solutions. There is a decent lead at the international level. India is also carrying up for this. Uh, we have taken a lead role in making machine development and process modeling. Um, we are also collaborating with different national labs and academic institutes to make the things happening faster and sooner. We need to have more innovation in this area, which is not limited to the process development and material characterization, but in a holistic way. And we need to tackle all the nine domains for the successful de deployment of the technology in the country. With this, uh, I stop. Thank you very much uh, for patient hearing to me. If you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. Uh, Dr. Paul, uh, may I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, a very excellent presentation. I did visit RRCAT Indore when I was doing my MTech in laser electro optics. Yes, sir. Uh, my current, uh, this thing is on the consulting and investment. Mm -hmm. We are getting a lot of uh, requirements from companies into working in the area of graphene technologies. Yeah. As you know, uh, diamond is the hardest material. But beyond that, we also need to develop some technologies, nanotechnologies to make the material which is light but very strong. So can you suggest which is the organization in India or anywhere else outside using 3D technology to print uh, material with the graphene technologies? If uh, you sir, you know Ampri, Ampri Bhopal. Yes. And uh, Dr. Satish is there. He started some work in the area of uh, metal embedded uh, graphenes and he's working on this area. And um, I think he has got two PhD students working on this uh, at Ampri Bhopal. So that is the quick uh, thing I could collect. And uh, if anything, I'll, I'll share more yeah, details. Yeah, please, it. please share with me. And next time when I'm in your area, I'll definitely visit you. Please do visit. Uh, one thing I'll tell you, there is a big change in the policy by the government. Uh, you know, um, by after 26 May 2020, when uh, Honorable Finance Minister Nir Nirmala Sitharaman told that DRDO, ISRO and DA should go to the public and uh, show their technology, you know, make it more happening in the in the public domain. So with that, uh, we have many things are coming in. And uh, fortunately, uh, at RRCAT also, we have uh, incubation center established with the DAE framework and uh, many things. And uh, luckily enough, I am asked to take the lead uh, to do this particular assignment. And uh, I'll be happy to work with the industries, uh, not only in the area of the laser manufacturing, but many other areas, wherever we can collaborate and make the things to the next level. Of the uh, technology. That brings me to the second supplementary question on the technical textiles. Yes. Are soldiers in the army who are fighting battle in the coldest glacier in the world, in Siachen Glacier, we need to reduce the weight on the shoulders backpack. So currently the clothing is very heavy. And we need uh, lightest bulletproof jackets and vests available with sensor. So if you or your scientists can uh, look into that, how to make the soldier's life a little more comfortable to make him warm, but light and strong material on the technical textiles. And now that the uh, government has already created a separate uh, troop comfort DPSU out of uh, the, you know, restructuring the ordnance factory labs, I think time has come for all the uh, stakeholders to come together 
to look into this uh, need because it will generate a lot of export uh, value also. We are importing quite a lot of stuff which actually China is doing a lot of work in the graphene technology and so is USA. So if you can kindly look into it, that will be great. I will get in touch with you directly also. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Christ Paul. Uh, it was uh, really very informative in terms of what you've been doing, your work in the space. So trading and development uh, is also a key aspect with 3D graphy, wherein we see an opportunity to work together. And uh, we will definitely want to connect, uh, post this event also, and um, in various uh, areas that we see how we can collaborate. Uh, uh, so now let me take the opportunity to invite uh, Group Captain uh, E.R. Rajapan. Uh, who happens to be uh, uh, a key respondent who is also now a service provider. He's a chairman and managing director for uh, Shiv, uh, uh, Shivayu Aerospace. Doctor, you already have a setup and you already have offering services in 3D printing. Good evening at the outset. Let me thank uh, Dr. Shibu, John, uh, the other panelists and also the uh, speakers. And uh, Dr. John Shipu particularly for inviting me to talk on uh, a topic which I'm not too familiar, but we are in the business to talk about uh, what we are doing in the 3D printing. Well, having listened to uh, the luminaries like Dr. Anil Kumar from ISRO, uh, Mr. Manjanath from GTRU, Mr. Anthony Paul from Elanti, Mr. Vaman Kulkarni from uh, uh, his own consultancy company, and Mr. Suru Chand, Shreya Scott, and Dr. Price Paul from uh, R. Catch. They are all luminaries and experts in their own field in uh, 3D printing, having contributed a lot in the development of indigenous technology and also taking it to the practical application for not only the defense and aerospace and all other fields of uh, technology. Well, in this uh, field, uh, my entry is very, very late. What qualification I can call is or talk about is that uh, I am an ex-Air Force officer who is driven by the passion for uh, serving the nation in uniform, out of uniform. And I am also greatly impressed by Prime Minister's initiative for uh, Atmanabad Bharat and Make in India. Many of my colleagues after retirement uh, thought that it is the time for them to rest. I and driven by the passion for in uniform and out of uniform in service of the nation. I thought I need to contribute towards the contributing towards the capacity building in aerospace and defense. The field which I am very familiar with and having worked for almost 35 years, I do understand the requirement of technology and also indigenous development of many of the products within India. Even today we are importing about 55% of the military hardware. And even after 75 years of independence, if we have not been able to at least, uh, you know, produce half of our requirement, I think this is the time that we have started thinking how to improve our indigenous development of defense and aerospace components and equipment. So this is the reason why I also came into this field and uh, invested all my savings from the Air Force and also other savings uh, my family had to make a company to contribute towards India, support towards Make in India in defense and aerospace. Well, my company's name is Shivai Aerospace uh, Components and Malls. So we are manufacturing high precision components for uh, aerospace and defense applications, but we also manufacture components uh, for uh, general engineering applications and medical fields also. Our company is uh, not a big one, it's a startup company, spread over about 3,500 yard uh, square, square area. And we do have uh, state-of-the-art CNC machines, measuring equipment uh, and uh, testing equipment for manufacturing and also testing various kinds of aerospace and defense equipment. Let me talk about a little about our journey so far. The company was established in 2017 and 2018 we started manufacturing and uh, in 2018 itself we started manufacturing components for Boeing and ISRO. 
Then 2019 and 20, we got uh, AS9100 ISO certification. Then uh, some of the major DPSUs are uh, they enlisted as uh, the vendors. They are HAL and Bharat Electronics in 2019 and 20. And in 2021, we put outreach to America and France, Tespil Aerospace, and uh, AAA Topus France. They also have given us the vendorship. And some of the other uh, channel partners are uh, SpaceNex, Casca, Asteria, Unimet, this again an aerospace. Uh, and defense company, Sika Aerospace, Sendem Electronics, which is one of the main contributors to the ISRO, Rakan, which is a French company, they are into telecom uh, uh, products, Weinmark is a fruit product company, and uh, V3 Technology are our other important channel partners. Our aim is to adopt new technologies and methods for developing new products for uh, defense and aerospace applications. The components we are capable of manufacturing are for the aircraft, drone, defense equipment, medical equipment, and automotive parts. And we are now concentrating on using additive manufacturing for the developing the prototypes for defense and aerospace applications. And most of us know that according to research, 75% of the aerospace and defense industry leaders believe that 3D printing will become customary within the blocks aerospace and defense industry in another nine years time. Additive manufacturing of the 3D printing is already transforming the aerospace and defense industry, providing new ways to 3D print replacement parts on demand while reducing costs and enabling new design engineering possibilities. As you all know that additive manufacturing is extensively being used in aerospace and defense industries for reducing production costs for tools and components provide additional design flexibility to reduce weight of the part on site and localized manufacturing are also be accomplished through 3D printing and also to enhance maintenance of aerospace and defense equipment by producing spare or obsolete parts. Additive manufacturing enabler for future aerospace and defense equipment design and manufacturing. The Indian aerospace and defense market is projected to reach US 70 billion by 2030. Driven by the burgeoning demand for advanced infrastructure and government trust, India's defense, there is a need for us to enhance our additive manufacturing capability to reach this figure of export. India's defense budget for 2020-21 is rupees 4.71 lakh crore, which is 9.37 higher than that was in 2019-20. And this additional budget gives us opportunity for uh, searching and also adopting new technology for developing our own aerospace and defense products within India through indigenous capabilities. Presently, only 45% of the defense equipment is manufactured in India. So in the next 10 years, if we have to become a net defense exporter, we need to adopt and also implement these new technologies, which are they, they are 4.0 industry as well as disruptive technologies for the design, development and manufacturing of aerospace and defense components. The government would like India to be a net defense exporter of 35,000 crores annually in the next three to four years of time. So additive manufacturing is the future enabler of aerospace and defense industry in India. Indian aerospace and defense industry is poised for a rapid growth. India's aerospace and defense ecosystem is expanding rapidly, both in the private sector and the public sector. Indian aerospace and defense industry is presently 85,000 crore. As of now, India is ranked 19th among the world's defense exporters in attracting the foreign investment. Whereas India is the second largest armed importer in the world. So you see what is the difference between our present ranking in terms of defense export and in terms of imports. It is time that we have invested our resources and also 
brain power in developing technology within India and uh, the modern state of the art technologies that is industry 4.0 and disruptive technologies are going to be the enabler for uh, developing this kind of modern warfare as well as aerospace equipment within India. Things are uh, really taking shape and if you see in the last five years, we have increased our defense export by 325 percentage. And in the coming five to 10 years, it is going to even grow much faster. And the government is giving a lot of uh, swaps as well as they are coming out with a lot of policy frameworks for uh, Indian private industries, especially the MSMEs, to expand their capability to support the defense PSUs and also for the India own capacity as exporters. So Indian A&D MSME's contribution is presently 18,000 crores and it can definitely go twofold at least in the next five years if we take the right initiative and also start the building the equipment within India. So what are the opportunities for MSMEs in A&D manufacturing? To promote export of defense items and to make India part of global defense supply chain, Government of India has set a target of 35,000 crores in aerospace and defense good services by 2040-2025. The government is encouraging the private sector to play a larger role in strengthening the aerospace and defense manufacturing sector. So where, where do we fit in Shivai Aerospace in the current scenario? Shivai Aerospace wants to seize the opportunities in the emerging AD market, leveraging the state-of-the-art manufacturing technologies, including additive manufacturing. We are scaling up to offer end-to-end -end solutions for various products for aerospace and defense industry. We can offer products, aerospace and defense, for the design, development, and rapid prototyping and serial production using our both capabilities, 3D as well as conventional machining using the CNC machines. We are also looking for JV technology partnership for 3D printing and capital funding. So which are the end end solutions uh, which are on offer from CY Aerospace, for which I have partnered with the Naugrav Design Lab, uh, the uh, MD of the company is a, a designer who has been educated in Italy and has got uh, ample years of experience working with the major uh, companies in the world, including Benz. So we both are partnered to provide a new product design. We will also provide rapid prototyping, technology development in terms of new materials uh, and uh, also the products and the new product design. So let me now hand over uh, to my partner, Sumit Lakera for uh, giving a uh, uh, detailed uh, presentation on uh, our uh, 3D printing capabilities. So thank you, sir, for the introduction. And um, so as we have seen that, um, so already Shiva Aerospace into precision manufacturing and it takes a lot because I'm coming from automotive industry. I worked uh, in Tata Motors, I worked in uh, Mercedes-Benz R&D, been, uh, you know, worked in Germany, worked in USA and uh, production at a precision level is something which is very challenging. Of course, uh, many of you know it, that uh, it takes a lot when you have to, uh, you know, use a component on ground and making component work in the aerospace is further challenging. So, um, uh, considering this capability um, and uh, Nogger Design Lab, which I will show you now, uh, I propose that, you know, we see it as an end-to-end -end capability. And uh, since we are back to door to door in the same wall, I see that um, we as joined Shivayo Space and Nogger Design Lab, we offer a capability which is very unique in the present context of uh, the product development and also let's say indigenization if we say or uh, if we say uh, not only making a prototype but also the next stage which comes after prototype is that we have to also manufacture it so designing it is alone not enough we have to prototype it we have to manufacture it we have to again manufacture it with the same quality standards 
So basically, it takes it takes a whole chain of uh, product development to do this. It also needs an infrastructure. It also needs an experience. It also needs an uh, knowledge. So this is what we are trying to uh, uh, do a collaborative uh, you know approach here, and uh, we are in the process of doing some products. I quickly show you what we do. This is about me. I have uh, worked in these companies, uh, Mercedes Benz, and then I did my master's in design from Italy, Milan. And uh, yeah, so this company is about uh, prototyping. Uh, we we try to uh, support startups, SMEs, MSMEs in developing uh, the new products right from the scratch at the addition phase. We take it to a level where it can be pitched in a functional prototype form, uh, format. And uh, this is where 3D printing comes of use to us. We actually uh, uh, design product first prototype itself is so functional in nature that it is used by various startups in pitching at various investment level and and it really helps it really cuts short a lot of cost a lot of time and sometimes you get to know that whatever you were thinking uh, wasn't enough you need to further work on the design to make it better Talking about our design capability, um, you can see these are all the products, all are functional products uh, which have been working right, you see on the left, top left, in the middle, and uh, what you see on the right side, Pure Sky is the product which you have done for a company, is a startup, uh, it's a air purifier, and uh, so this kind of designing we, we are doing here, uh, talking about 3D printing now coming directly to the prototyping, so all these uh, 3D printed prototypes we have done. Uh, uh, like you can see on the left side is a uh, prototype which was directly, uh, you know, coming out of the printer. We, we, we printed in a very fine quality and uh, very important, uh, important is that, you know, design uh, should be, uh, I would say, respected when you are going to manufacturing. We all know that what happens when we are into design, it is very fancy, it looks wow. But when we started manufacturing, something happens in between and we end up getting something which is not so good. And uh, I have seen this in the automotive industry, it struggles a lot. Almost, I think every industry struggles when aesthetics compromises because of certain gaps, maybe in the product design or in the manufacturing process. So this is where we are uh, trying to you know, build that gap, uh, making a product which is looking as good as the design itself. And it really uh, changes the whole game altogether. In terms of uh, capability which we are offering here at Nogra Design Lab, which is in Bangalore. Uh, so we have something unique uh, uh, capability. We can do uh, plastic parts as big as one meter in size. It's a very uh, unique printer we have got and uh, we can do some materials like PLA, PDG, TP, ABS, nylon and we can do some advanced materials also. And uh, what you see on the right side of the screen uh, is the detailing work, kind of uh, functional prototypes we have done very challenging. Uh, they are directly used on field for certain uh, functional requirements by a company. And you can see the level of detailing uh, there. So not only uh, the functional or looking aesthetic type, uh, uh, we focus here in Nogra Design Lab about the, the functionality of the product. It has to look good. It also has to be fully functional and uh, then only uh, the whole product makes sense. That is the main ideology behind the whole concept. So this is, these are some prototypes and the quality of uh, work we are doing here. Uh, you can see all these are prototypes made out of 3D printing, but also uh, not just 3D printing. We are also developing special processes for, you know, painting, for example, because um, uh, 3D printing itself is uh, not sufficient uh, as a product, but it is a technology which, which basic, basically gives you a jump from point 0.1 to point 0.2 or let's say point 0.0 to point 0.1. So um, we are also evolving uh, with the different processes, uh, different technologies, and um, uh, it's a journey. And uh, it's a journey of product development. It's a journey of research and development. That's what we are doing here. And yeah, this is uh, what the Novel Design Lab is about. So yeah, I think I will hand over to you, Rajkumar, and take questions. Thank you. Indian aerospace and defense uh, product development is very, very time consuming and uh, mostly used uh, 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 the product design is uh, uh, being done using the existing technology and also uh, con through conventional methods. And the prototyping is one area where the 3D printing uh, is uh, the most useful technology. And if we have to cut down the cycle time for the designing to the production of defense and aerospace uh, products, it is imperative that we have to use uh, 3D technology uh, 
initially the plastic for the making the you know shape and prototype and thereafter using the metal for the different parts of uh, the products and we see an opportunity in uh, contributing towards uh, the design and development of the products and the series production will can be done with the conventional machines or uh, if the time uh, is less for uh, producing the number of uh, products that supply in a one like scenario that is where uh, we uh, 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 additive manufacturing can come into play but as of now what i see is uh, additive manufacturing for the prototype and the product development and there is a great amount of opportunity in the dpc has already started using it and uh, along with uh, them we can collaborate uh, in a small manner for the product development in the design and also well the development of uh, the sub assemblies or the uh, components which are uh, up to about one meter this is what the shiva aerospace and uh, nagura design uh, combined capability and we would like to use our uh, compliance with the as 9100 and iso you know quality standards where we understand what is the requirement of work, the traceability the material used the non destructive testing the uh, other qualitative testings which are required to pass the product so we understand the, the global standard as far as the traceability to manufacturing to the you know supply chain is concerned so we would like to use this uh, 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 experience in designing and the prototyping the uh, um, defense and aerospace part we would like to help the sail we would like to help the bell and all you know topic uh, Uh, defense uh, public sector undertakings. With this, uh, I would like to conclude. And if there are some questions, I would like to take on. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Guru Captain, uh, for your uh, insightful uh, expression of what you do as a company. And I'm sure uh, uh, more than uh, uh, I think. Uh, uh, let me also introduce you as uh, one of the key. Uh, members of adcai uh, and uh, now that uh, wing commander uh, raman surubhi ji is also here i think it's it's part of the group in any which way so uh, very insightful i just wanted to understand from you uh, uh, captain beyond concept uh, group of concepts uh, uh, which is obviously where 3d printing technology is is definitely gaining a lot of traction because now if you want to have these prototypes and proof of concepts 3d printing is becomes a very key aspect you know for us to start any project and then obviously the machining can also take over when it comes to uh, uh, you know mass production obviously both has to uh, coexist uh, it's like uh, signs uh, you know two sides of the same coin you know with machining and 3d printing so i see that every shop room will have a 3d printer machine going forward and i'm seeing that the, the pace is also happening but uh, as shivayu uh, aerospace do you think that uh, the final part production when it comes to metal or, or any other material which is like a carbon fiber are you also looking into that area of uh, expansion or to have a 360 degree starting from prototype yes you are doing a lot of work there but to that extent you know because uh, you can probably look at having a larger pie in terms of an opportunity See, as a customer there are two aspects they will look in with one is the cost factor the second one is the time delivery so if they need the product in a short span of time obviously this is one of the technologies which we can definitely use but when it comes to you, you know producing n mass or the uh, reasonably large number of uh, you know items of the same type then uh, conventional machine would be better but the uh, for the prototyping and proof of concept uh, definitely additive method uh, manufacturing is the right method and uh, in india you understand that we have been struggling with the designing of aircraft for almost 30 years okay the lca project and uh, we did have the 3d technology then of course it was uh, being used in uh, foreign countries but uh, our uh, you know hesitation to use this new technology for the development was actually you know taken Too long a time for us to operationalize and also fully really develop this product. Now this is the time that if you want to be ahead in the industry, you got to you know manufacture the the product within a short period of time. You cannot have five years, ten years of period for development. So 
initial proof of concept has to be done with the you know additive manufacturing and maybe few series not series production uh, you know the functional prototypes can be with this and uh, there are many items uh, which can be manufactured uh, using the additive manufacturing technology especially cylindrical items with the arteries and uh, inside uh, you know curved surface etc this can only be done through you know artificial sorry additive manufacturing conventional machining is so so difficult so uh, this kind of items uh, definitely has to be made through artificial sorry additive manufacturing and uh, we find uh, there is a lot of opportunity as you rightly said uh, in the coming days uh, probably you know each shop floor may have uh, uh, a 3d printer it may not be the sophisticated one but to get uh, a feel of what is going to be the final product uh, at least the shape and other things can be seen uh, you know visualization per se is definitely possible through the uh, additive manufacturing and we in south india we would like to be one of the major contributors uh, though our assets are not big but definitely we can scale up if we get uh, continuous orders that is the reason we want to partner with the people and we are willing to collaborate with anybody who is uh, interested in uh, collaborating with us and also uh, our combined experience in the manufacturing and the 3d printing will be offered to them uh, uh, for their business and prototyping proof of concept or whatever they want yeah so i think collaboration is the key sir as you rightly said even if you're not looking at uh, immediately procuring the metal machines you know these are large uh, large size machines which can print metal uh, uh, i think there is an opportunity in terms of even collaborating with these uh, service providers in terms of seeing you know how yes. those capacities can be uh, uh, you know dealt with and slowly and steadily while you feel that uh, now it's time for uh, the the organization to even set up a a metal machine i think that can be looked at as an option good yeah, thank you so much sir. Uh, we are definitely looking at that uh, you know scaling up uh, uh, for uh, metal 3d printing also but it all depends upon the business what is like yeah. to come in yeah thank and you so we, much we uh, seeking support for uh, you know getting that kind of business <laughs> right 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 dr john can i speak a minute yeah yeah please sir please uh, i had the honor of visiting shivayu aerospace myself about 2 years back i must place on record that despite the covid times our friend from bangalore cryptocryptan rajapan he is uh, from a battle hardened soldier has become a seasoned uh, business person uh, rajapan thank you so much for the nice presentation and your collaborative method with uh, the other company from uh, whomsoever uh, this mr lakra uh, is the best way to go forward in fact for the sake of audience uh i wanted to tell that uh, adci is also in the business of uh, arranging funds but uh, rajapan said no sir i need first orders what do i do with the funding but i think now you can go for funding also and i promise that uh, the invitation from uh, seattle to visit boeing on april 11 12 and 13 is always open and adci will be very happy to take you along we are taking some few delegates from here to india to seattle and uh, the ticket is always ready for you thank you so much for thank you very much sir thank you for your kind support sir thank you sir thank you for your uh, uh, insight and also your vision and your your uh, the, the way you have started your business the way you have led it and i'm sure uh, wishing you all the best for your business sir and also having this uh, nurtured and with a very effective team with navraga design lab that you have collaborated because design is the key you know it all starts with design So yes. congratulations and wishing you both a, a great success going forward. Thank you so much for your time. Sir. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thanks. Sir. Thank you. Sir. So now uh, may I take the opportunity to uh, invite uh, uh, Karthik. Uh, Karthik is actually a key respondent in uh, ensuring that how this design can be matured and made real good products. So he is in the business of uh, uh, you know simulation, 3D simulation. because everything is going to be a part and parcel of ensuring that the final product is out in the market so 3d similar uh, 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 he is actually a, a technologist uh, and a technologist engineer from cad fem uh, who happens to be a, a company uh, working in uh, in consensus with the uh, ansys uh, and uh, certified as one of their uh, assisted partners uh, so karthik uh, Uh, you can start your presentation and we will need to understand and learn from you in terms of how the solutions is offering uh, better opportunities for 3d printing companies eventually for them to also benefit from these uh, solutions as in the manufacturing companies thank you so much 
thank you very much for the introduction. So let me share my screen. Can you please confirm whether you can see my screen or not? Sure, sure. I hope you can see my screen, yes. right? Yes, yes, correct. Yeah. So uh, I think almost all of this. Good evening, everyone. Uh, OK. So good evening, everyone. Myself, Karthik. Uh, I think um, I have seen a lot of presentations, people talking upon you know, different kinds of uh, research going on in additive manufacturing. And um, you know, I, uh, I mean, I do not come from that background of research and uh, the machine technology itself. My core area is from the simulation front, how we can help uh, the development of additive manufacturing products, especially in the metal uh, field. You know. So that's where I really come from. And I think I'll be discussing more on that front uh, today. So I said myself, Karthik, I basically am a master's from Germany, from TU Munich uh, in computation mechanics. And so basically, we are a um, uh, German company or parent companies in Germany. And uh, we have been working with uh, on simulations and with answers for last 35 years. So our core expertise is with respect to uh, uh, the simulations, as you can see our name, CAD FEM. The FEM is what we are expertised at, not only the FEM part, but we also do the CFT, electromagnetics, optics, all kinds of simulations. You can ask for, you know, uh, EMAG simulations, high frequency, low frequency, and everything, okay? So in India, basically we started in 2007, and uh, we are basically, uh, you know, our main office in India is based out of Hyderabad, but we have offices in Bangalore, Pune, Delhi, and Chennai also. Okay. And the main core expertise, as I said, is simulations, right? So, and that's where our customer satisfaction with the customers is quite high because that's where we interact with the customers, help them develop their products using the simulations and help them, uh, you know, with the queries they have, the support, the development processes, and everything. Okay. So to, uh, today's agenda will be, you know, I think, uh, I mean, most of the people here uh, knows why are you manufacturing, you know, why in a &D, and I think what are the challenges also. And most of the time I'll be concentrating on the solutions, what we offer, and I'll be talking about the two case studies, uh, especially from GK and Aerospace, uh, who have built a turbine exhaust casing, and also we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, heat exchangers uh, here. Uh, so, which is from uh, end topology and uh, synopsis. Okay, those are two case studies I'll be talking. There are many more. Uh, you can refer them on the, uh, you know, uh, you know, when the white papers are present. And if you are interested, let me know so that I can share them also along with. Okay, so uh, the major challenges nowadays in the market is not only with additive, but there are different uh, technologies which are kind of disrupting the market, uh, starting with the you know, chips itself, you know, which is becoming very, very important for all the products. Then electronics, electrification is the most important topic nowadays. And for aerospace and other sectors like automotive also, the composites are playing a very important role, modeling them, you know, uh, and analyzing the composites and checking the failures of composites are becoming very, very complex. Not only that, nowadays people are also doing, uh, you know, additive manufacturing for composites too. I've seen some of the cases in Germany where they are, on Singapore too, uh, where they are doing this. You know, and uh, smart connectivity is one of the important factors. And then the additive manufacturing, as I was talking about, is transforming the manufacturing sector itself. Uh, as a lot of people spoke, it's not going to replace the traditional methods, but it's going to transform the uh, the, the processes, most of, uh, most of the processes present right now. And then we are talking about the Internet of Things for almost all, all the products uh, which are available in the market, right? So today's topic will be mainly concentrating on the additive manufacturing. And uh, since you see there are so many technologies coming into picture, new innovations coming to it, and to check all these things and to develop a product which can adhere to all these things, you know, simulations is a must, and simulations is the answer for most of the things, you know. Without simulations, I think your development cycles really go big, uh, and your, um, you know, there'll be a lot of wastage in prototyping, especially time and money. And if you're coming to additive manufacturing, you have to do a lot of trials to uh, come up with the, the process settings, um, then the, uh, the porosity check, the porosity, and also the material, material properties of it. And to check what kind of supports give you, um, you know, a good uh, results or what kind of heat treatment process I have to go with. You know, when I cut the 
uh, you know, plate, uh, you know, structures and how what the deformation is going to occur. So there are a lot of challenges with respect to additive, right? To address all those things, we need simulations to look into them and uh, we can basically address a lot of things there. Um, so as I said, simulations is not only used in um, just a design analysis phase. Nowadays, simulations can be used everywhere, starting with idolation, where the, you have an idea, you want to just check whether this idea is working well or not, uh, what we call it digital whiteboard, uh, you know, virtual whiteboard, where you can actually check your idea with respect to physics, whether it's going to work or it's not going to work. Okay. Then you can talk about the traditionally simulations are used in the design analysis phase. Once the idea is finalized and you get a develop a uh, you know design out of it and then you want to check the design is going to work for all your case studies whether it's structures uh cfd or it's electromagnetics or what optics or whatever it is then comes the manufacturing phase where the additive manufacturing comes so we are also into the simulations of this manufacturing process not only the additive manufacturing processes other processes like uh, sheet metal formings you know also, we uh, you know they are doing simulations in that trend. You know we are, we can do blow molding. That simulations also can be done. So we have simulation again simulations used in manufacturing process nowadays. But additive manufacturing is an exception, I guess, where people are using simulations right from the beginning to see the uh, you know uh, the product and how it's going to deform because of this additive manufacturing process and estimate the uh, deformations and everything out of it. Then in the operation phase, yes, we have some people are talking about digital twins um, where uh, you have a, uh, you know, predict the maintenance when I have to go for maintenance of my product, you know, because your regular, you know, predict, uh, if regular maintenance of your, your, uh, is becoming, is not cost effective because you may do a maintenance much before it's going to fail or it's, you'll do maintenance uh, much after it's already failed, you know. So you want to, instead of going for a uh, regular maintenance, you want to predict when I have to go for maintenance, right? So digital twins are the technology which helps you in this aspect. Then the, then the, uh, then the, we also have it in product phase where uh, we are talking about autonomous, autonomous vehicles where we have ADAS systems and all these things where the software is now installed onto the cars to respond based on what comes in front of your car, based on the sensor data it's collecting and everything. You see, simulations can be literally used in every phase of the development cycle. You know, so what we do as an is like we start with the platform tools like embedded system. So we're talking about um, optimizations and all these things. And we also have a material library for different materials, uh, starting with additive manufacturing to the generic mechanical materials and um, uh, aero materials, electromagnetic materials and all these things. But traditionally, we this is our bre uh, bread and butter way we do the traditional simulations of fluid structures, electromagnetic semiconductors, you know, embedded softwares and optical. You know, that's where we regularly do the simulations for. You know, so coming to the additive, uh, I think we all know the additive uh, why it is really very important and how, what's the advantage of additive because the wastage is less um, and you can actually combine a lot of product uh, products uh, parts into one part or few parts so that you can reduce uh, uh you know the usage of material you can actually build very complex uh, shapes uh, which you can't even build with the traditional manufacturing techniques uh, so this can actually innovate a lot of products nowadays uh, so that then the actually the certification process and uh, you know uh, itself is a uh, much shorter because you don't have so many uh, de uh, development process of like traditional techniques what you have a lot of processes goes into it and like that Additive manufacturing has very few processes, so your uh, certification process itself or qualification process it be, it itself becomes smaller compared to the traditional techniques, right? So we have many types of additive manufacturing techniques, you know, uh, but for metal, basically we are using a powder bed fusion or we are using a DED, which is the direct energy deposition, or we are nowadays people are also using binder jet methods for metals, right? So, uh, so what we are concentrating upon as of now is uh, these tre three techniques for simulation. Right now, we already have a solution for uh, powder bed fusion, uh, direct energy depositions, and in the next one, in the upcoming versions, we are also trying to build something on the binder jet. Uh, uh, you know, they are working on that, and that should soon come out. You know, to simulate the binder jet um, jetting process too. Okay. So, uh, why additive manufacturing A and D? I think. Uh, the things are the, the materials are very complex. 
the the lead times are uh, high in uh, aerospace sector especially um uh, the you want to optimize your product so that you know uh, you want to make them more efficient so that uh, the weight to uh, lift ratio can be maintained and you can get a better performance of your products then the main challenges i was talking about the supply chain and the dig uh, digitization itself is okay so the benefits what of aerospace manufacturing us i already told you the light weighting itself it so you can do a topology optimization you can come up with a very innovative shape and you can lightweight your structure you know remove a lot of material make it more efficient in terms of thermal uh, in terms of structural also in terms of uh, pressure drops and everything you know then you can kind of um, combine the parts uh, you know make the number of parts less in your structure so that you know your parts are less prone to failure and everything so also with respect to the materials you can also use um, uh, you know uh, uh you know avoid the material wastage you can reduce the material wastage and also you can print the parts on demand you don't need to you know store them in a you know print uh, manufacture them beforehand and store them and then uh, uh you know uh, spend a lot of money into that you know then the process and assembly assembly itself is um, compressed because i said that you don't have too many processes and assemblies in when you come with additive manufacturing so because of technology i think economic wise also you your cost is kind of reduced because you're saving material your uh, kind of uh, economic of scale also can come down your material wastage is reduced and a fewer process uh, process steps which also reduces your cost so this is one good example from ge uh i think it was done around uh, i think 2018 or 2019 so as you can see they have consolidated 20 parts into one reduced the weight by 25% uh, it is five times more durable and uh, uh, you know printing this or manufacturing this kind of component is no more you know uh, uh, impossible with additive manufacturing it becomes possible and even the complex shapes like this can be easily printed with uh, additive manufacturing you know so with all said and done you know the, there are also a lot of challenges coming with it the main challenges are in two kinds with first thing is the certification and the qualification part of it because when you want to go for certification of this uh, alt manufacturing parts the main problem is you have to know the microstructure the chemical composition the mechanical properties you know because you're dealing with the powder and then you are kind of sintering it or you are the uh, you know the heat treatment and all these processes uh, the chemical uh, the material properties itself are unknown you know uh, so you need to find out what is the final material properties of these structures you know that becomes very important also for qualification purpose you know you need to keep in mind what is not only just the um, uh, you know uh, all these mechanical properties and all but also the uh, you know the dimensional tolerances how far is it from your actual part you know that becomes very important not only that uh, you know you need to look at um, you know the who is the supplier you know what is the process you are following and what is the machine you are using because the repeatability and uh, you know the quality of the product has to be controlled right so that becomes very important for additive, additive manufacturing in the technology wise i think we have several challenges starting with the distortions we have the residual stresses which leads to the cracks you know we have uh, you know uh, build failures we have the blade crash problems you know the surface toughness itself is a problem the durability and the porosity you know and the microstructure itself what are the material properties of it so this all are the challenges technically and this is what we want to address to see how we can check all these things using simulation you know so what are we trying to aim is to avoid lot of trial and error methods so instead of you know lot of money wasted on them because the cost of material itself is very high for metals right so uh, you doing lot of trial and error method you know lot of failure in terms of uh, the build and um, you know wastage of all these things you need to avoid so that's what we want to do so we want to avoid this wastage and make sure that you know uh, with simulations you can get it right for the first time itself you know so we can all in simulation we can do lot of things we can check what should be the parameters of your machine you know starting with the laser power the time you know and all these things can be parameterized checked and you can also see the what's the melt pool or uh, when your laser is moving you can see how depth it is going how much of a metal is melting and all these things can be checked in simulation okay so coming to that um, the traditional techniques what we know is we know the mechanical properties you know uh, based on that we uh, you know we uh, we go select the geometry we do the processing and we we construct the 
you know jo- uh, part right but in additive it's other way around what we have is the um, you know uh, powder uh, we need to do the laser treatment on that we or you do the ma- additive manufacturing process based on that you want to check the microstructure and based on this microstructure you want to come up with the material properties of your material okay so it's a different thing so we need to keep all this in mind when we are kind of doing it okay so what we are dealing with we are have several kind of machines which has very different uh, scan patterns you know so they have unique scan patterns and based on this unique scan patterns that uh, the the hot spots are generated or the thermal uh, you know the graphs are, you can see on that this is going to affect your microstructure uh, uh, going to affect your residual stresses and all these things so you need to check all those things the strain magnitude the def- um, the defect distributions the microstructures the mechanical properties so based on this me- uh, based on this thermal history and the melt pool and the full scale composites we can actually predict what is the mechanical properties of your product you know that is where we are ending up so that's where ansys really comes into picture so what we can do uh, is uh, we can do everything it come uh, when it comes to that manufacturing you starting with the design of am so you need, you need to do first a design development for your aim which is suitable for your aim process then we need to come up with the build setup you know what kind of support structures you need to do or how how you want to uh, space this um, especially when you're talking about uh, you know powder bed fusion we need to know how many parts how they have to be arranged so that you can reduce the uh, uh, the time of build itself or we can uh, you know accommodate more parts into it then we do the process simulation to understand Uh, how much of deformation is going to happen uh, because of this uh, you know the heat which is uh, uh, you know used for sintering this powder and everything so this is going to cause some deformation so we need to take care of that then we, we do the material analysis then the, the main challenge is to you know capture all this data we have the powder materials we have the manufacturing process we have parameters of machine there are a lot of things which have to be managed captured in a uh, in a proper way so that when you go for certification and qualification it becomes much easier for you you know so we are going to look into all this one uh, detailly the first thing is uh, you know uh, as i said in each process what we do we talk about defam which we talk about the cad geometry we talk about the topology optimization lattice optimization to reduce the weight of the structure itself then we use uh, this geometry this uh, uh, the shape which you are coming from the optimization we convert into an stl file to build it you know and we uh, you know have the supporting structures orientations and everything then we do the process simulation to find out the distortions um, kind of to compensate the distortion so that you know you can achieve the final geometry what you are, uh, want to achieve you know we can predict the build failures you know all these things and then the material properties itself the grain morphology we can do the melt pool the porosity detection and everything can be predicted then the management and the part qualification okay so let's go uh, in ansys as i said we are dealing with these three the first one is the uh, in a powder bed fusion as you can clearly see so this we are building a layer by layer in simulation we can actually do this we can actually build layer by layer in you know, exactly what you're doing here and we can predict what are the uh, thermal deformations coming out of it the second thing is the direct deposition technique so you can see that we can deposit uh based on the arc line we can deposit you know the uh, material on it and see the what the thermal uh, temperatures coming on to it and what are the thermal strains coming because of that and you can see the comparison between that um, you know the the simulation and the uh, 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 data coming from the testing okay then we have the powder bed fusion this is um, we have several stages here uh, the main challenging stage is the sintering process where you know the uh, the material kind of undergoes high temperatures and it deforms just because of that gravity and other things you know so we need to capture this viscoelastic behavior of your materials and everything that can be also uh, predicted like the shrinkage of material itself and because in powder uh, binder jets basically the problem is the the parts shrink uh, you know by huge volumes so that has to be considered here and it also deforms so that can also be simulated so this is something which will be going to come in the next versions of ansys but we have this technology for this two methods as of now okay so this is the whole workflow so this is the actual design initial design first we do the topology optimization to come up with the innovative shape which can take the uh, the loads what or the application what we are looking at 
once we have come up with this loads, we can actually validate whether this can take the loads for all the nonlinearities considered and everything. Then we come up with the support structures and then we do the process simulation and then we do the, you know, uh, the microstructure simulations, you know, clearly we can see the laser moving and then we can see how the temperature is going up, coming down uh, and uh, how the, temp uh, the thermal strains are kind of cumulative effect. You can see that because of this laser movement on this, all these things can be captured, you know, the starting with the first thing is the design of um, uh, AM. So uh, the thing is you want to do a topology optimization. You want to see, let's say I have a plate. I want to fixing at one end on a hole and other end I'm just applying a displacement. I want to see which shape gives me the best result with the minimal mass and um, you know give a stiffness which can take this particular load uh, and uh, within the limits of stress and the displacements you know so you can do this kind of topology optimization this can be done for thermal studies structural studies you know and you can see there are two examples here the first one is the manifold uh, you know and the second one is the housing where you can see we are using a traditional topology techniques uh, to reduce the uh, you know weight so it removes the volumes wherever it is not necessary the second thing is the lattice optimization uh, it can actually uh, place lattice structures internally and reduce the weight of your component and you can also optimize this uh, what kind of lattice structures what should be the density of your uh, structure all this uh, the dimensions of the lattice structure everything can be actually optimized and you can run the simulations out of it once you are finalized your design, then comes as is an example where this is the original part from a customer called Whitman from Germany. Uh, you can see that this is the original part and this is the final part of the optimization. Uh, you can see that the mass and um, volume, there's only 5% reduction, but you can see that there's a huge improvement in the stiffness in both, uh, you know, X direction, Y direction, uh, Z direction. So that is what they want to achieve it and they could achieve it with less weight, uh, you know, almost all 5% less weight, but a huge improvement in terms of uh, displacements or what stiffness it can take. Okay. Uh, so next comes, once you finalize the geometry, the, the things what you are going to look at is the support structures. So what kind of support structures we are going to look at. So ANSYS really helps you here uh, because the support structures are actually, uh, uh, you know, you need to, Kind of design the support structures well because this is going to affect the amount of material is going to be wasted it also affects uh, the build time you know also affects a failure you know uh, it also reduces affects your deformation itself on the structure so all these things are uh, are to be kept in mind so these are the all engineering challenges when you go with a build setup so you can see uh, we have something called a heat plots which will help you, uh, you know, um, come up with the ideal support structure, which can suit the amount of support structures needed, the build speed and the uh, uh, distortion levels. So based on these three factors, it, you can design. We have different set of uh, support structures, just not this three method. We have different uh, support structures which can you use. And we also have the machine details like EOS, SLM and uh, uh, Renison uh, machine. So you can also have the laser patterns or you can also come up with the customized laser patterns on it, which will help you reduce the you know residual stresses out of the structure. OK, so once you have the build set up, you can uh, export it out and then import it into a simulation to see uh, what are the distortions coming into it. You know, so you can do this kind of distortion studies. You know, this is what we see because of the layer by layer built up. You can see where the distortion is coming up more. So this is a very good example. You can see that initially you see that there's a this is a shape I want to print because of the shape when I'm building it, it goes well and suddenly on the top it starts bulging out. So the shape, whatever the final shape I'm getting is not, you know, approved or it's, uh, it's not qualified, uh, certified, I would say. So uh, then what we do is we compensate for this distortion, you know, by making the sh uh, changing the shape which I have to print. And then when I print this shape, I can see that the shape, what I achieve is what I really want to have. So this is a distortion compensation. So all these things can be uh, kind of captured in a process simulation. So you can predict the distortion, avoid the blade crashes, because when it deforms more, the blade can crash in the structure. That can also happen. Uh, we can look into the stresses and strains, you know. Uh, we can look into the build uh, uh, post-processing, removal of build plate. So, uh, so when you do the uh, remove the build plate, what will happen to the structure, how much is going to, uh, you know, deform. 
So the support remorse can also be done. Heat treatment can also be done to see what are the final stresses and strains left out in the structure. So all these things can be done uh, using simulation. And I think you can um, predict, uh, you know, what would be the uh, deformation or what would be the deviation from your original geometry. And you can compensate for that and build the product, which would give you an actually uh, good result when you are printing it. Okay. So, uh, so this is also uh, is very important. You want to see how you want to place the um, uh, um, product, how many products to play, what would the uh, you know support structures. All these things can be done quite fast, you know. And this would give you a good understanding about how many parts I can print in uh, print in one go, you know. So you can also plan accordingly to do that. Okay. So this is one example of an um, uh, from an um, helicopter arm. So this is the original geometry. I am actually removing this part so that it becomes a solid. Then I'm kind of optimizing it, which gave me a design, something of this sort. Then I have to convert that into an STL file and smoothen it out and get a geometry out of it. And then I can use this to build, which angle gives me less supporting structures, less deformations. I can predict that and all, and then go for printing. And then I can print it is what the whole cycle what we can do. OK, once your product a part is uh, printed, then you can actually go for the microstructures. So you can actually uh, analyze the material so we can check ba based on one bead length. We can see what's the melt pool, how much width, how much height it is affecting it uh, because of, you know, uh, you know, this pattern, uh, the scan pattern, what will be the effect on porosity? Based on this melt pool prediction, we'll take these results into the uh, printing a cube, and we'll pr uh, for the cube we can see the what's the uh, you know porosity levels in the cube, uh, whether you have a keyhole effect, whether you have the bowling effect, lack of fusion, or we are in the right area where you're getting a, a good density, good porosity out of it. You know, so you can check all these things. So we can scan it for different power of your uh, laser, different speeds. You can see. And I can come up with the most optimum solution of my uh, machine properties, which can give me a good result for me. Not only that, based on this data, I can also, you know, have a heat map on the whole structure as it's printed here. You can see that uh, for each and every layer, I can see the heat map and uh, analyze if there are any hot spots where it can affect the microstructure and change the material properties altogether and try to avoid that uh, based on understanding, you know. Not only that, I can also do the you know microstructure analysis based on uh, cellular auto automata method and predict what would be the uh, uh, grain size, uh, you know what is the angle of the grain and everything. And based on this data, uh, you know based on the whole uh, fetch relationship, I can also identify what will be the yield strength and what will be the elongation of my material. You know, so I can end up finding out my material properties, uh, you know, from uh, these kind of simulations. OK, so next comes the data capturing. Uh, as I already told you, um, you know, you have a lot of information coming from your uh, additive manufacturing, starting with uh, the what kind of powder you're using, you know, what are the mechanical properties of the powder to the machine details? What are the processes you are following? Do you have heat treatment process after that? You know, all these things are there. So you have a lot of data generated out of it. So uh, we have a tool which helps you, uh, you know, manage all this data. And it also helps you see what processes you have followed after even after a few years, you know. So this really helps you to manage and make sure that, you know, you can print the same part, uh, you know, with all kind of settings and you can uh, uh, get the certification and, uh, you know, uh, you know, you can um, uh, uh, do all these things quite easily. This saves a lot of time uh, uh, and you can also have the traceability of your all the uh, features, what you have and everything. Okay. So this is one example uh, coming from GK and Endospace where they are trying to, uh, you know, uh, print the head section of the turbine exhaust uh, casing. So the major challenge is what they want to do. They want to do the pro uh, part consolidation, uh, reduce the post-processing uh, the processes on this and uh, reduce the, uh, you know, material waste use, uh, usage and wastage also. The major, uh, this is a very good example because this part is huge. There's, it's very complex because it has a long overhangs. Uh, and also it has varying thicknesses you know so uh, you know with additive manufacturing you could they could really achieve a part which is within one mm of surface deviation from the tolerance you know deviation 
and in some areas uh, they could really go down to 0.7 mm and uh, previously they had 2.5 mm uh, you know deviation which can also be reduced to 0.9 now you can see this is the part with the supporting structures and everything and once the final part is done they are comparing it with original geometry and they can see the deviations in every location you know so this could be achieved in very short time now the second thing is again with the uh, company called n topology who are into the you know uh, shell uh, shell tube heat exchangers so this is a, a heat exchanger they had and they want to make it more compact and reduce a you know make it more efficient too so they have come up with uh, uh, very innovative technologies and they have lot of uh, you know uh, triply periodic surfaces inside which actually in increase the surface area by 150 percent so they uh, it became more efficient so finally when they kind of manufacture the pro uh, product you can see that outcome is 40 parts are kind of you know merged into one single part 85 percent reduction in the uh, uh, volume 81 percent reduction in the total mass and you can clearly see that uh, you know uh, heat transfer is 1.8 times it increased but the pressure drop also is reduced by 9.1 percent you know so they could achieve all these things because they could use simulations to predict understand their designs how they are working so also uh, use opt uh, optimization techniques to uh, you know, optimize their geometries and then also to use additive manufacturing techniques to see what is the deviation uh, from the original geometries and all these things you know so I, I think because of short of time i had to really rush you know uh, so i hope uh, you know uh, what we believe is simulation is more than the software software is a secondary thing but i think you when you understand the whole physics when you understand how to carry out simulations can really help you with respect to uh, your product design itself so that's the reason why we call it a simulation driven product development which can really drive and shorten your development cycle of your products yeah uh, i think with that i'll end my session uh, if you have any questions please let me know um, hello yeah yes uh, uh, kartik thank you so much uh, for your inputs i'm sure uh, you know uh, uh, this uh, simulation software i mean simulation does help a lot and as you rightly mentioned it's beyond software uh, in terms of having a corrective measure before even you having the final part is so very important you know especially when uh, today the cost of the material and everything is so exorbitant i mean you need to see that you know there is no wastage and also uh, war uh, you know war warpage in terms of you know the the part while it gets printed so it's so important and so optimization and wastage these are again uh, it uh, it is also uh, a, a, you know a, a catalyst on both the ends in terms of su uh, supporting the need of the requirement when it comes to uh, proper simulation software and great it was a very uh, detailed uh, uh, you know uh, presentation that you shared uh, in each of the aspects where it is going to be of great importance uh, if there are any questions uh, you uh, you know respondents can please uh, uh, you can put that in the q and a section or uh, we can continue with the next presentation and you can mull over the you know the questions eventually once you have real, uh, you have got it you can post it we will definitely have karthik respond to it either with this presentation or otherwise so we we are in touch so uh, thank you so much karthik for your inputs and your presentation it was a pleasure connecting with you and now that we will go to the next uh, speaker uh, um, thanks uh, dr shiv thank you so much Dr. thank you <clears throat> so the next speaker is uh, rajesh uh, who is actually one of the uh, uh, key respondents whom i know personally for a lot so some some long years rajesh thank you so much for being here uh, also uh, just to introduce him he is uh, now the uh, the key channel head for 3D additive manufacturing for Monotech. Monotech uh, primarily is a company we started with inject printers and they've really evolved with time as an organization. And uh, uh, I'm sure his portfolio would uh, give you an insight of what all technologies that he's been able to, uh, you know, get in India to uh, substantiate and help in terms of benefit various sectors across industries, maybe dental, medical, uh, prosthetics, orthotics, all of that has been a part and uh, aerospace and defense and tooling. So currently, I think the presentation would be very specific to uh, aerospace and defense, uh, where there is a technology called DED. We, we also had 
the presenters uh, present in the morning uh, talking about the the prospects of dd uh, uh, so i think uh, 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 rajesh will be uh, you know sharing his insights on a technology uh, on this technology because we, this is more seemingly uh, seemingly this is actually benefiting the aerospace industry rajesh thank you so much rajesh for your presence now you can start your presentation i can see your screen it's all live yeah thank you so much thank you so much uh, thank you dr shibu and uh, thank you for having me on this uh, you know workshop along with the eminent guests which i have seen and since morning there has been a, a tremendous amount of information which i have been gathering regarding this uh, additive manufacturing many things which uh, you know we learn from the industry so the industry has told us what is required and what uh, could be the solution so uh, today you know the second session of course was about the solution for the issues or the requirements in the session 1 and i would like to close with uh, a specific technology which could transform the indian industry uh, to the very next level in meanwhile while we transform ourselves from traditional manufacturing to uh, the pure additive manufacturing so uh, my topic will be selected on this and since i am probably the end of the show i will not take much time i'll try to rush through so that we get into the you know the panel discussion quickly so i'll just uh, briefly talk about us what we are because the reason uh, i need to do that is because we need to tell you exactly how we reached here so it not be going to be a it's going to be short story but it will be a worthwhile one and our partnership and transformation which we have thought about to bring uh, am into this uh, industry in india and uh, the metal am technologies and you know the traditional versus pure am versus hybrid so this is a concept which we are all talking about today we are talking about hybrid because it's between traditional and the pure additive manufacturing systems uh, so just a brief about us we are established in 1999 with 400 plus employees 6000 plus happy customers government corporates and uh, service providers and various other industries uh, we started off with the 2d printing business and we forayed into 3d additive manufacturing 6 uh, years back uh, personally i have been in the additive manufacturing segment for more than 11 years now and uh, i have seen a lot of technologies around and uh, i being from the equipment uh, the capital equipment market and also specifically the manufacturing industry projects i have understood that am is the right way to go for us and i stuck on i mean i mean i've been sticking on for 11 years now in this industry and going strong of course with 15 plus locations we make sure that our you know our customers are all happy with us with the type of support and uh, everything we also have developed our own 10 brands out of 2d and 3d and 27 alliance brands <clears throat> so the partnership and transformation which we have tried to bring into india was with these sort of alliances which uh, they all complement each other they do not compete with each other every technology uh, suits to a certain application everyone knows about 3d systems the inventor of sla technology and now today they are the only machine com company with seven different technologies mark force the new kid on the block with uh, their composite technology and their mim based 3d printing which has taken the market by storm because uh, most of it it gets into the manufacturing industries and bigger up with the large uh, you know platform building and uh, admatech and xjet for the you know for the ceramic so we have the complete range and then i am going to talk more about meltio which is the the current requirement of the industry so just to give you a, a overview we will we work with polymers metal ceramics thermoplastics wax composite gypsum probably something more than that we will look at it that in the future um, what we look at today is that we are in the third revolution while we talk about being in the industry 4.0 to be frank india is still in the industry 3.0 we are still into the automation implementing electronics automation but by the time we be in the industry 4.0 because we are having a lot of manufacturing industries new technology development happening in india we would have already replaced 50% of the upgrade or upgrading the existing equipment now how is this possible because uh in the morning session people are talking about you know uh, pure am cannot cannot replace the traditional absolutely right but it is in the process so because uh, today we have uh, you know high volume requirements the future is going to be customized requirements so the customized requirements are going to be more than the high volume requirements in the future may it be any industry we talk about 
and then uh, that's when additive manufacturing takes over but how do we bridge the gap is the discussion what or the the point which i'm going to make here so uh, before that i would just like to touch upon these because polymers wax everyone knows we are not touching there we have been talking about metal since morning so these are the technologies which have been already explained in in detail so i don't go into the explanations but lmd and adam dmls wam ebm slm all these technologies have certain strengths and certain weaknesses and they do certain things they do not do certain things so uh, we have to talk about how do we select the technology with uh, with the requirement of ours so today morning i saw mr uh, anthony talking about you know uh, the more of ease of use more uh, more better finish etc the surface quality has to be good speed has to be high resolution has to be perfect so these are all things which are of the future but what do we do today is that we bridge the gap so we bring the traditional uh, technology towards the pure aim with the hybrid system so that's where we see that this technology hybrid technologies are going to be very much part of our industry in our journey from industry 3.0 to 4.0 and uh, as we see that additive process with the machining process is what we talk about as a hybrid manufacturing process and uh, if we say that we combine the strengths of both tech, both the uh, processes basically the additive and the cnc uh, there are certain uh, you know uh, weaknesses of additive weaknesses of cnc machining but we combine the strengths of them to get hybrid manufacturing and that's what we are doing today we see that the market is more of traditional manufacturing being heavier than the pure additive manufacturing industry but tomorrow is going to be that pure am could take over or it could be heavier than the traditional manufacturing but we have to find a balance somewhere today we were talking about you know there was a question that uh, we do not have too many resources or trained resources for our additive manufacturing yes because say we talk about powder bed fusion we need to have design for additive manufacturing it's very important that we understand design for additive manufacturing but how about the resources for that we still are in the very early stages for that sort of systems though we have few installations in india it's being used more for the conventional parts i was talking to some customers yesterday in a, in the show here nearby they were saying that the only thing they were using powder bed fusion was for creating parts to create a business case for the industry so that they could get more business but am has to be utilized beyond that so for that hybrid probably is the right solution today where we could actually take the traditional and the am together so when we talk about this we talked about ded a lot of uh, you know uh, presentations talked about the direct energy deposition systems and you know few of them already have it and uh, they have been utilizing it for so many years uh, but we have the different type of ded systems like lens we have ebm based we have plasma or electric arc based so and we can also classify it as powder based or wire based so when we uh, we clearly define that this is what is ded ded could be either laser based to be ded uh, electron plasma it could be either wire or powder now when we go beyond it we need to understand the ded what are the advantages of ded today the advantages are high build rates someone was telling that it it's very fast within few hours hours you can have kgs of you know parts being printed it's dense and strong yes it's dense and strong near net shape we get so that post processing is required and can be used for repairing excellent multi material range possibility is there but with some few companies where they offer powder and wire and larger parts are possible so size is not the limitation with this technology and the easy material change which is a big problem with ebm and the pbf in many other technologies but let's look at the disadvantages of ded because of which the investment or the the companies are not looking at it we are talking about large corporates or large government organizations investing into ded but ded should be part of the manufacturing process and that's the biggest success of our of india today if we have to be successful with our parts products which we need to export we need to be ahead of or at least at par to europe and probably china we need to have the technology implemented in smaller organizations in smaller manufacturing setup so 
the disadvantages really pull them back like the high capital cost the low build resolution and support structures are an issue because the dd you know you have you do not have powder so powder bed so you cannot support them hence we have brought about this technology to the industry today which is meltio uh, meltio really looks very very promising for all of us the reason being it's yet another dd technology but the beauty of it is that you can combine powder you can combine dual wire you can combine powder and wire two wires so it's very very uh, you know uh, flexible in terms of how it can be utilized it's very low cost which means that it can utilize the welding wires which is normally for the dd which we talk about you can use uh, different type of powders and it's high capability and high compactness so it's very compact it's uh, it's basically a laser head uh, which can be you know and and the, the stand alone machine is very very compact and very easy to use so you do not have to have very specialized resources uh, maybe probably you don't have to have an explosive proof suit uh, to wear and you know the meltios metal 3d print process is process is simple as simple as printing in polymer so the point here is that this technology with six lasers each of 200 watts totaling to 1.2 kilowatts can actually get you a range of part materials it can actually utilize range of materials and with whatever combinations which we think about so now the challenge is how do we do this so we need to understand that we the, the technology is there but it's up to us how to utilize it and up to us how to test it out for the utilization so there are stand alone machines which are available with this machine technology which uh, give you the uh, the flexibility of testing out different wires before going with the actual manufacturing systems so which means that you can test wires different type of wires open source um, powders if possible small amount of powders because if you have very thin uh, details you can use powder so there is a powder feeder possibility there are two fire feeder possibilities so a lot of testing can be done by the universities and and uh, organizations government organizations for different materials so as i told you that this is possible with powder deposition and wire deposition together at, uh, in a single build so when we compare this with respect to the other technologies dd binder jetting powder bed fusion meltio and which i'm talking about vam jewel it is somewhere in the center which means that with all the requirements of the density hardware cost available materials it somewhere comes in the between which means it's a, a very good mix and a very good uh, you know it can suit to a lot of requirements of the industry today and with the open source and different type of material capability like we have tested titanium we have tested inconel stainless steel we have done uh, mild steel carbon steel stainless steels so we have done a lot of tests on those and further tests are on for aluminum and copper which itself is a today is a, a small uh, challenge for these sort of uh, you know systems laser systems so the beauty of this is that it's 10x cheaper 10x faster and 99x scalable now why am telling uh, why am i saying it's 99x scalable is because this is the only technology which can integrate with cnc and robots now i'll come to that before that which heat source makes sense if you see this tabulation with respect to arc meltio lasers in general in e beam we see that uh, meltio stands in an advantage with respect to the industry requirements so we 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 do of course we don't do as good as you know the meltio does not do good as good as a 3d systems powder bed fusion technology or probably it may not be as you know fast as an arc but it stands in between in terms of the speed and the finish so just to you know uh, bind up others is the lowest acquisition cost large build envelope two wire feeds any number of power feeds powder feeds fully atmosphere controlled hot wire hot wire enabled so different type of materials which need preheating mm -hmm. and when you talk about the lmd technology with respect to Uh, the graph of precision and productivity we see that it's in a very favorable position so the beauty of this technology is very easy integration with the existing cnc machines and the robotic systems so i'll just run a short video quickly just to show you how it does uh, i will not spend more time so you see uh, just uh, yes in the market so how does the process work 
the engine is connected to a deployment mechanism installed next to the machine spindle. The deployment mechanism hybrid. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about the volume, but I can hybrid manufacturing is an advanced process which can. Hangs the laser Thanks. head, which is deployed for printing. So this is the laser head, which is mounted. It's a deployment system, which is next to the CNC. The software uh, generates the toolpath, which controls where and how the metal printing a, and machining you know, operations uh, occur, vertical and fixed in order to create uh, the final parts. It's a VLC, Hybrid manufacturing starts with the CAD model of your part. Next. The CAD model is sliced it. to generate the G-code, which is used to print it and machine the parts. So can take the G-code is executed on the CNC uh, machine, which communicates size. continuously it that it is with the Meltio really engine scalable. during the printing and process. This is how it prints. The entire process can be set so with can, printing uh, and machining and, and fully the automated. Is flowing around, the result so it acts as a is a rapidly produced, low-cost, so final the whole system is integrated. ready for your application. You don't have to print and then take it for integration or for finish. The other thing, beauty of this is that you can do it in tandem, which means you can uh, program it in such a way that you do some uh, printing and then you do the machining. So for conformal cooling channels and few other internal uh, you know, re requirements uh, for light weighting, a lot of things can be done uh, you know, in tandem. Uh, So the next uh, most uh, very exciting thing is the integration with the robots. So already with ABB, KUKA, this technology has been already integrated. We are also trying to integrate it with other systems. Uh, I guess just show you a spherical tank building quickly. You can see how the finish of this part and probably it, it takes around say, you know, uh, 81 hours to do this, but you can see how it can build the whole surface without much difficulty after the integration with the is a complete spherical tank which you're talking about. Another is a turbo impeller. So this probably could be in say 10 hours or 12 hours. So the beauty is that you could start from inner, go from outer. If you have a tilting base plate, you have all the access requirements without any support structures to be printed. And this is a tallest part created. It's a, uh, you know, it's a structural beam which is being printed in hollow. So this took around 19 hours to print. So it's not as far as arc, but not as slow as powder bit. So you can see that these are the advantages and then it can get into a lot of industries, including casting, rapid manufacturing. So this is the win-win for the industry with this technology. And I would like to show that how this has been used with mild steel and stainless steel together in the same, in the same build, which means multi-material capability is quite possible. And all of you, if you are wondering, this is so rough. How can you get a good part? This is a finish which you can achieve after post processing. And uh, you can see that a lot of components, near net shape parts, this is how they look. If you reduce a layer thickness, you could get better finish. And uh, we talk about a range of wires or you know, materials with uh, stainless steel, titanium, inconel, carbon, carbon steels, copper and aluminum in under testing. So I would not try to go into the ceramic printing because we are talking about Meltio, but we do have certain ceramic uh, applications also. We have some technologies for various other requirements in aerospace, defense, and and you know few other automotive and other manufacturing requirements. And uh, with the Exjet and Atmatic, so I just run through this, and uh, so you know we could uh, if anything anyone wants to know. So the conclusion is that the way things are being made is changing from the left, which is a complex system. We are moving towards the right. Uh, which is going to be design print uh, prototype and we are at design print and tools but we are going to be there at the design print and product thank you very much for your time and patience and uh,
Thank you, Dr. Shibu, for the opportunity. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, I think it was a very de de detailed presentation covering a very large portfolio that you have with, uh, with the various different technologies that you are in the offering. Uh, 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 Wing Commander uh, uh, Raman Surpiji, if you have any questions and uh, about the technology, since you are a key respondent in terms of seeing, you know, how these technologies can be, uh, uh, you know, um, closely monitored and see, you know, how it can benefit. Uh, the larger interest for the the A&D industry. Uh, thank you, sir, for such a nice presentation. I am actually uh, doing two roles in today's thing. I am uh, flooded with the uh, inquiries from the private equity partners. Tell us which technology, which companies we should invest. Since morning, I am taking notes. Each company, whether small, medium, large is actually having so much of, uh, you know, appetite for growth. And uh, based on the presentation which uh, Monotech has produced, I am sure you will never run short of funding. Should you have any requirement of funds, please reach out to us through Dr. Shibu John or directly with us. Uh, about a month and a half back, we were approached by a orthodontist from Ahmedabad who is also setting up a factory for 3D printing to dental plants. He said, I want to be a different doctor. I would print the dental implants using 3D printing. And he is actually now being arranged for funds. Funding is not a problem. Uh, we have a challenge of connecting the dots. Today in India, we do not know who's doing what. There are uh, excellent silos working, both in defense, aerospace, space, uh, jewelry, we need to put all the stakeholders together along with the regulatory mechanism. Uh, we are trying our best to see some state governments pushing the industrial partnership. Uh, well, government of Telangana is in touch with us. Government of Karnataka is in touch with us. The two industrial corridors in uh, North and South are also having thing. I can tell you that uh, the US Asia Business Forum is launching a very big event in Los Angeles on uh, 14th, 15th, 16th in uh, 2022, where the large, very big investors are ready to fund. Should any of the companies here or who are not listening, please pass on a word. Fund will not be a problem. This is the time for India to grow. And I want some of you people to start thinking of how to be part of the global export. The lot of companies who are um, coming out of China are looking for shifting to India also. As we saw in some presentations, there is a collaboration and the market is very large. And uh, with that, I would like to close because we are running against time for the other sessions also. Thank you, Mr. Rajesh. We'll reach out to you and we'll reach out to you very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rajesh. And uh, thank you, everybody. Now, uh, we missed out with uh, Mr. Chandan's uh, presentation in, uh, in the earlier uh, you know, time slot. Uh, so he is uh, finally back and he will uh, quickly take us through his uh, presentation and uh, Chandan, we can start your presentation, please. Yeah. So again, a formal introduction. Chandan is the director with Nordstar, uh, which is also dealing into different materials and machines. Uh, they are also into uh, uh, EBM technology uh, while they are also the uh, uh, distributor for uh, GE Additive. And uh, they also ha have been dealing into other materials like Peak. Peak also gaining a lot of traction uh, for uh, in the, the services. So Ch Chandan, yeah, you can start, please. Thank you so much. Once again, I'm sorry for the earlier trouble with my network and I'll try to quickly do. I think we have a excellent day today covering a lot of applications, uh, developmental work, uh, innovations that's being brought into India. I'll try focus my presentation on adaptation of polymer engineering grade a polymer, which is specific to aerospace and aviations. That's a subject I think we never discussed. So I felt perhaps would be a good time to discuss this. During this presentation, uh, we will have few insights of some of the case studies which uh, companies like Airbus and others have done, some developmental work that has been happening in 
bringing in high engineering polymer into aerospace and aviation through additive manufacturing process. So a quick uh, review on the requirements on the polymer. If you see high performance uh, semi-crystalline to crystalline materials like PIC, Altem and PPSU, which are uh, uh, UL and F FFA grades material required for polymer components used in aviation and aerospace. You have the industrial grade uh, material, which are typically polycarbonate, uh, polyamide, carbon fiber based composite materials, and your traditional amorphous consumer grade uh, thermoplastic materials like ABS and PLA. So that's the classification. So if you see the tip, which has the PIC and Altem and PP issues, which is of interest to aviation and aerospace industry and which is traditionally uh, being done by the large OEMs in both Europe and US, but now has been adopted uh, in every aspect of developmental, even functional parts, even batch productions across globe. So I will spend time in understanding how these uh, materials could be brought into both in prototyping to batch production. Uh, uh, for the aviation and aerospace industry applications. A quick review on the material side. So you have some of the world's le uh, leading chemical companies uh, who have been developing uh, 3D printing filament based materials for these uh, applications. You have the SABIC, which is the uh, inventor of Alte material. Beside uh, you have the Vixrex, which is uh, a new form of PEK material recently being approved by FAA. So you have a host of companies today globally who are manufacturing these materials, thereby making it much more available to users, companies and service provider across the world, including in India. So just about a few of the applications, I think we saw some of these images during the presentations from other esteemed panelists. Engineering thermoplastics, which are typically polycarbonate, a PC ABS kind of material, nylon, polyamide carbon fiber reinforced materials, which are engineering grade thermoplastics being built with applications like enclosures, uh, brackets, and uh, in some cases, even in drone applications. Uh, whereas the key aspect uh, for the aviation and aerospace is the high performance thermoplastics, which includes peak, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, apart from the Altem Niger 85 and 1010 are the gold standard or the most required material apart from PPSU for the aerospace as well as aviation industry. Now, if we look at the materials and the new materials which are currently being introduced in the market, keeping in the demand is uh, a material which is high heat and mechanical strength beside having the chemical resistance suitable for the applications meant for aerospace as well as in aviation. ESD grade peak, which is uh, currently is one of the most sought after requirement uh, coming from the electronics product and manufacturing company. Uh, glass field uh, material uh, for their mechanical properties have been one of the uh, required materials and therefore the new materials that's been recently introduced are mostly being on peak and the reinforced filaments. Now, uh, just in a quick overview of how is the top industry player sees that. This is one of the presentations which Curtis Carson made uh, during uh, one of the 3D printing conclave about a few years back, where he made a, a statement where he said that he had, the Airbus has saved millions of euros by having the optimization process, including 3D printing for their component designing that goes to prove that how much of uh, 3D printing, both metal and polymer, has been playing a key role in improving prototyping to bringing, uh, reducing the lead time 
uh, bringing in more flexibility into designing being played uh, uh, across the industry spectrum. Now the benefits are we have, I think everyone has spoken and in aerospace aviation is uh, lightweight and uh, flyby ratio factors. Uh, the certifications, both in material performance and uh, quality aspect related to the production to the finesse. Uh, also to bring in the ability to support the supplies of the components, which are typically a long um, period of supports needed on this kind of components. So a uh, supply chain requirements also has played a key role in having the 3D printing uh, used uh, over the years extensively by the aviation industry. Now, a potential game changer uh, core of the uh, Airbus is uh, they looked at prototyping, tooling, actual flying parts to spare parts are the four major application area. And at the same time, they looked at their core competence in building for the on-demand productions, for tooling, for skills, and the R&D. So these four applications, prototyping to the spare parts, uh, especially for the polymer components, and there we developing the core competence to meet these four major applications area is what has been uh, Airbus point of view when they bring in the 3D printing to their four and have been utilizing it extensively in due course we'll see some of their components now a typical applications we talked about many of the panelists have spoken about prototyping very verifications your uh, engineering at polymers play a critical role, especially when we have wind tunnel test models, when we have functional scale down versions for uh, you know iteration cycle handling in the product development full time, uh, bringing in ability to check and uh, verify the designs, uh, keeping in time, uh, keeping in mind the timeline for the delivery of the products is a, a standard typical application in aviations and apart from which you have other assemblies uh, manufacturing related applications where you require fixtures calibration fixtures workbook fixtures typically used in uh, uh, assembly and manufacturing stage at the inspection you have zigs and tools you have uh, testing uh, devices, coordinate measuring devices, tools, which is where they have typically required ut utility of 3D printing and polymer components. Apart from which you have the uh, stock tools where they have component holders, spare part tools holder. Uh, you have uh, uh, factory efficiency device tools. That's the image that you see. These are typically where they have utilized 3D printing and engineering at polymer in the applications in aviation. Now, I think we were, uh, I heard about a query today about graphene uh, material development. This is one of uh, uh, a combination of peak and graphene, which has been utilized in developing a composite material uh, for a turbine model. Uh, which is uh, being printed on a machine which is supplied from Intamsis and uh, we are one of their partner in India in promoting that technology. Uh, we have the other material, if you would have seen, 1% graphene with peak combinations, which is also a component which is being developed um, by utilizing a format HD uh, printer. Uh, 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 material, this particular material was developed with a research institute combining the peak granules and graphene to build this combined uh, filament. In other direct production applications, uh, I think uh, Airbus has been uh, the forefront of uh, directly utilizing 3D printed uh, parts for their <coughs> A350 aircrafts and uh, they have qualified 
more than 1,000 parts today, which are also uh, manufactured today through 3D printing process. Altem 9085, which is being the material uh, traditionally approved with FAA uh, and other uh, European grade uh, uh, certifications for material is being what uh, traditionally used for manufacturing of most of these parts which have their qualified for 3D printing process. If, if we have to look at uh, uh, what kind of uh, uh, applications where the direct production parts are currently being used. Um, you could uh, see some of them, uh, like the seat end caps, armrest caps, uh, some of the uh, wall panel sections, some of the insulation sections used for the electrical panels. Mm, uh, this is where these, com these components are currently being approved and utilized and produced with 3D printing process. Uh, one of these uh, important and even as we speak, I think today was the news where they have attempted to print on a component in space, um, utilizing a 3D printing process, which is the most widely used process we call it uh, filament deposition modeling or fdm which is fff process so a lot of uh, work is currently being done in uh, finding ways to have components being made in space uh, as i know there are few 3d printers which are currently placed in iss and work is being done there in terms of manufacturing smaller components to see if they could produce something in space. Uh, one of uh, classic applications uh, with NASA, they have uh, used over 70 different uh, component sections on their Mars rover um, project. Uh, most of them uh, polymer components were made with the FDM process utilizing uh, uh, both peak as well as altem material and flame flame retrident sprouts housing camera mounts large quad doors these are the type of components which uh, typically uh, were considered to be produced with 3d printing process uh, with both uh, peak as well as altem material uh, another uh, case applications uh, of a material development. Uh, here, the client is a high-tech enterprise uh, looking for manufacturing of electromagnetic radiation control panels. Uh, they use um, uh, a sections which primarily help to absorb the microwaves, and therefore, they tried uh, finding the suitability of uh, printing contour matching um, uh, such uh, microwave absorbing material. Uh, therefore, they adopted a process utilizing a FFA process with an intensis on that machine to print, uh, which improves both the uh, uh, both the absorbility of the material, uh, ability to reduce the thickness of the inner parts, which enables them to reduce the overall weight and also help them the flexibility of the system by having multiple material verification uh, uh, with the new utilization of the process with 3D print. Uh, another new applications, which is uh, what currently being done with uh, uh, one of our uh, institutional customer is uh, where they have been uh, evolving a material development by having carbon fiber uh, small sections being mixed with peak to extrude a filament which is a composite with both peak and carbon. Uh, this particular material is currently under development and is being tested extensively by utilizing an intensis machine, which is a very which is a very reliable open platform systems, enabling 
research institutes to utilize their developmental uh, projects in evolving this material. With this, uh, I would end my presentations. This is a quick overview of how polymer and polymer components from prototype to batch productions have been utilized, even with large companies like Airbus. And I think this opens up an, a, a great deal of uh, opportunities, even in India, for localization of components uh, of uh, traditional legacy products, as well as the products which are under development, for being uh, adopted with 3D printing process as both the materials, PIC as well as Altem, are now easily accessible. Uh, the, the cost of the material also have been on, uh, uh, you know, uh, which I believe is coming down uh, and hopefully we'll see uh, manufacturers in India able to produce these components, these filaments uh, for meeting the local demands. With that, I would like to end my presentations and uh, uh, once again, thanks, Sibu, and I'm sorry for the trouble uh, earlier and hopefully these presentations bring a little more clarity into the polymer adaptation both in aerospace. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chandan. And uh, with that particular presentation, I think the uh, the entire day's uh, uh, you know inputs coming summing up with various different technologies and materials that are actually taken care of. We will be starting the, the panel discussion in some time just to sum up our, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, you know, and conclude in terms of what uh, the aerospace industry is, is gearing for and what are the solutions that has been offered and where we can set a pathway going forward. Uh, we will actually move on to the, the panel discussion. Uh, that's the, the next session, uh, gentlemen, uh, so that we can start. Thank you so much. I would like to announce that we will be present at the Aero, this Defense Expo in Ahmedabad in the month of March. So I request all the speakers to uh, book their tickets for Ahmedabad. We would like to have one uh, small technical session dedicated to 3D printing industry itself. So if you haven't booked your tickets to uh, Ahmedabad, uh, please coordinate with uh, Dr. Shibu John. We may like to have a small uh, display space also to all the members of 3D Graphy and ADCAI. Uh, so please reach out to us. We would like to issue the directory and uh, send it to the 85 countries with whom we are in touch with. We are being approached by various embassies uh, from uh, USA, Canada, France and other places also. What is uh, the initiative by India and Indian companies? So we would like to connect the dots. And while some of you are doing great work, small MSME are not able to reach that space. We would like to encourage you to please uh, share two or three slides of each of the companies. Reach out to us. We are compiling a huge database of around 10,000 companies in India. Out of that, very soon you will find the top 500 and top 100 Indian companies being listed there. So please uh, submit your in inputs uh, through Dr. Shibu John directly to me. So we would like all of you to get listed in the directory and the first copy of that will be going to the Prime Minister's office. Thank you so much. Dr. Shibu, over to you. I think Shibu is uh, preparing for the next session. Any thoughts, uh, Dr. Sarup Chand? or anybody else, do you think there is a need for listing the Indian companies who are missing the bus? Uh, very much, sir. I think it's a good initiative and uh, it would help and uh, uh, it would list down some of the manufacturers of 3D printers in India. So you may like to do some classification of the manufacturers and their technology. Yes. Yes. And their experience in materials. And uh, there may be some other people who are service provider and the type of services which they have been providing in the additive manufacturing. Absolutely. We also want to list out the people involved in the 3D printing training per se. Absolutely. I am uh, of the view that uh, government of West Bengal has got a company, state government undertaking called Webol, West Bengal Electronics. Yes. Who are doing training in uh, 3D printing. 
I am not sure there's anybody else doing, but of course, Bangalore has got a lot of startups. Yeah. Where we'll request Group Captain Rajapan to. I am just uh, answering question. Yeah, so we would like to connect the dots, and sure, uh, uh, nobody should miss the bus. It is India's uh, turn now to reach out to the world, and then uh, friends from RR Cat and anybody else, space, nuclear, anybody else would like to compile a directory. And uh, see, there'll be some uh, people will miss the bus, but like the Economic Times brings out the top 500 companies, or the Defence News got top 100 companies. We want a India directory of 3D printing. We are working on a similar uh, project for the aerospace defence industry also, because ultimately individually it's very difficult for a company to reach out to the regulatory people. Also, we are in touch with at least seven state governments who are looking forward to. Uh, you know, creating uh, investment forum also. So we would like to say, what are you doing for promoting the 3D printing? So Uttar Pradesh government has got. So we would like to have it done. So with that, hand over to Dr. Shibu John again. Yeah, sir. We we will need to go to the panel discussion because people are waiting yeah, there. Yeah. Sure. So we'll have to come out of this session and then uh, go to the uh, the panel discussion uh, session. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes, Thanks, sir. everybody. Thank you so much.